Preface Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution A Chapter in the History of Botany This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Josh Leach Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution A Chapter in the History of Botany by Agnes Arbor To My Father H. R. Robertson Wherefore it may please your gentleness to take these my labors in good worth, not according to their unworthiness, but according unto my good mind and will, offering and giving them unto you. William Turner's Herbal, 1568 Preface to add a volume such as the present to the existing multitude of books about books calls for some apology. My excuse must be that many of the best herbals, especially the earlier ones, are not easily accessible, and after experiencing keen delight from them myself, I have felt that some account of these works, in connection with reproductions of typical illustrations, might be of interest to others. In the words of Henry Light, the translator of Dodo Ends, quote, I think it sufficient for any whom reason may satisfy, by way of answer, to allege this action and sententious position, bonum quo communius eo melius et prostantius. A good thing the more common it is, the better it is, end quote. The main object of the present book is to trace in outline the evolution of the printed herbal in Europe between the years 1470 and 1670, primarily from a botanical and secondarily from an artistic standpoint. The medical aspect, which could only be dealt with satisfactorily by a specialist in that science, I have practically left untouched as also the gardening literature of the period. Bibliographical information is not given in detail, except in so far as it subserves the main objects of the book. Even within these limitations, the present account is far from being an exhaustive monograph. It aims merely at presenting a general sketch of the history of the herbal during a period of 200 years. The titles of the principal botanical works, which were published between 1470 and 1670, are given in Appendix 1. The book is founded mainly upon a study of the herbals themselves. My attention was first directed to these works by reading a copy of Light's translation of Dodoen's Herbal, which happened to come into my hands in 1894 and at once aroused my interest in the subject. I have also drawn freely upon the historical and critical literature dealing with the period under consideration, to which full references will be found in Appendix 2. The materials for this work have chiefly been obtained in the printed books department of the British Museum, but I have also made use of a number of other libraries. I owe many thanks to Professor Seward, FRS, who suggested that I should undertake this book, and gave me special facilities for the study of the fine collection of old botanical works in the Botany School, Cambridge. In addition, I must record my gratitude to the university librarian, Mr. F. J. H. Jenkinson, M.A., and Mr. C. E. Sale, M.A., of the Cambridge University Library, and also to Dr. Stapf, keeper of the Kew Herbarium and Library, by the kindness of Dr. Norman Moore, Harvian Librarian to the Royal College of Physicians, I have had access to that splendid library, and my best thanks are due to him, and to the Assistant Librarian, Mr. Barlow. To the latter I am especially indebted for information on bibliographical points. I have also to thank Mr. Knapman of the Pharmaceutical Society, Dr. Mulhuisen, Keeper of the Manuscripts, University Library, Leiden, 
and the librarian of the Tyler Institute, Harlem, for giving me opportunities for examining the books under their charge. The great majority of the illustrations are reproduced from photographs taken directly from the originals by Mr. W. Tams of Cambridge, to whom I am greatly indebted for the skill and care with which he has overcome the difficulties incidental to photographing from old books, the pages of which are so often wrinkled, discolored, or worm-eaten. For the use of plate 18, which appeared in Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, I am under obligations to the author, Mr. Edward McCurdy, M.A., and to Messrs. Duckworth and Company, text figures 7, 18, 77, 78, and 112, are reproduced by the courtesy of the Council of the Bibliographical Society from papers by the late Dr. Payne, to which the references will be found in Appendix 2, while for the use of text figure 108, I am indebted to the Royal Numismatic Society for permission to utilize the modern facsimile of the famous Dioscorides manuscript of Juliana Anicia, from which plates 1, 2, and 15 are derived, I have to thank Professor Dr. Josef Ritter von Karabasik of the K.K. Hoff Bibliothek in Vienna. In connection with the portraits of herbalists here reproduced, I wish to acknowledge the generous assistance which I have received from Sir Sidney Colvin, formerly Keeper of Prints and Drawings, British Museum. I would also record my thanks to Mr. A. W. Pollard, Secretary of the Bibliographical Society, Professor Killerman of Regensburg, Signora Adelaide Marchi of Florence, Mr. C. D. Sherborne of the British Museum of Natural History, and Dr. B. Dayton Jackson, General Secretary of the Linnaean Society, all of whom have kindly given me information of great value. For help in the translation of certain German and Latin texts, I am indebted to Mr. E. G. Tucker, B.A., Mr. F. A. Schofield, M.A., and to my brother, Mr. D. S. Robertson, M.A., Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. I wish further to express my gratitude to my father for advice and suggestions. Without his help, I should scarcely have felt myself competent to discuss the subject from the artistic standpoint. To my husband also, I owe many thanks for assistance in various directions, more particularly in criticizing the manuscript and in seeing the volume through the press. I am indebted to my sister, Miss Janet Robertson, for the cover, the design of which is based upon a woodcut in the Ortus Sanitatus of 1491. A book of this kind, in the preparation of which many previous works have been laid under contribution, is doubtless open to a certain criticism, which William Turner, the father of British botany, anticipated in the case of his own writings. I think I cannot do better then proffer my excuse in the very words of this 16th century herbalist. Quote, For some of them will say, saying that I grant that I have gathered this book of so many writers, that I offer unto you a heap of other men's labors, and nothing of mine own. To whom I answer, that if the honey that the bees gather out of so many flower of herbs, shrubs, and trees that are growing in other men's meadows, fields, and closes, may justly be called the bees, honey, so may I call it that I have learned and gathered of many good authors my book. Balfour Laboratory, Cambridge, 26th of July, 1912. End of Preface Chapter 1. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution. A chapter in the history of botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read 
by Josh Leach. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the history of botany, by Agnes Arbor. Chapter 1, The Early History of Botany. Introductory. In the present book, the special subject treated is the evolution of the printed herbal between the years 1470 and 1670. But it is impossible to arrive at clear ideas on this subject without some knowledge of the earlier stages in the history of botany. The first chapter will therefore be devoted to the briefest possible sketch of the progress of botany before the invention of printing, in order that the position occupied by the herbal in the history of the science may be realized in its true perspective. From the very beginning of its existence, the study of plants has been approached from two widely separated standpoints, the philosophical and the utilitarian. Regarded from the first point of view, botany stands on its own merits as an integral branch of natural philosophy, whereas from the second, it is merely a byproduct of medicine or agriculture. This distinction, however, is a somewhat arbitrary one. The more philosophical of botanists have not disdained at times to consider the uses of herbs, and those who entered upon the subject with a purely medical intention have often become students of plant life for its own sake. At different periods in the evolution of the science, one or other aspect has predominated, but from classical times onwards, it is possible to trace the development of these two distinct lines of inquiry, which have sometimes converged, but more often pursued parallel and unconnected paths. Botany as a branch of philosophy may be said to have owed its inception to the wonderful mental activity of the finest period of Greek culture. It is at this time that the nature and life of plants first came definitely within the scope of inquiry and speculation. 2. Aristotelian Botany Aristotle, Plato's pupil, concerned himself with the whole field of science, and his influence, especially during the Middle Ages, had a most profound effect on European thought. The greater part of his botanical writings, which belong to the 4th century before Christ, are unfortunately lost, but from such fragments as remain, it is clear that his interest in plants was of an abstract nature. He held that all living bodies, those of plants as well as of animals, are organs of the soul through which they exist. It was broad, general speculations such as these which chiefly attracted him. He asks why a grain of corn gives rise in its turn to a grain of corn and not to an olive, thus raising a plexus of problems which, despite the progress of modern science, still baffle the acutest thinkers of the present day. Aristotle bequeathed his library to his pupil, Theophrastus, whom he named as his successor. Theophrastus was well fitted to carry on the traditions of the school, since he had, in earlier years, studied under Plato himself. He produced a history of plants, in which botany is treated in a somewhat more concrete and definite fashion than is the case in Aristotle's writings. Theophrastus mentions about 450 plants, whereas the number of species in Greece known at the present day is at least 3,000. His descriptions, with few exceptions, are meager, and the identification of the plants to which they refer is a matter of extreme difficulty. In various points of observation, Theophrastus was in advance of his time. He noticed, for instance, the distinction between centripetal and centrifugal inflorescences, a distinction which does not seem to have again attracted the attention of botanists until the 16th century. He was interested in the germination of seeds, and was aware, though somewhat dimly, of the essential differences 
between the seedling of the bean and that of the wheat. In the Middle Ages, knowledge of Aristotelian botany was brought into Western Europe at two different periods, the 9th and the 13th centuries. In the 9th century of the Christian era, Rabinus Magnesius Maurus, a German writer, compiled an encyclopedia which contained information about plants, indirectly derived from the writings of Theophrastus. Rabinus actually based his work upon the writings of Isidore of Seville, who lived in the 6th and 7th centuries, Isidore having obtained his botanical data from Pliny, whose knowledge of plants was in turn borrowed from Theophrastus. The renewal of Aristotelian learning in the 13th century was derived less directly from classical writings than was the case with the earlier revival. From the time of Alexander onwards, various Greek schools had been founded in Syria. These schools were largely concerned with the teachings of Aristotle, which were thence handed on into Persia, Arabia, and other countries. The Arabs translated the Syriac versions of Greek writers into their own language, and their physicians and philosophers kept alive the knowledge of science during the Dark Ages when Greece and Rome had ceased to be the homes of learning, and while culture was still in its infancy in Germany, France, and England. The Arabic translations of classical writings were eventually rendered into Latin, or even sometimes into Greek again, and in this guise found their way to Western Europe. Amongst other books which suffered these successive metamorphoses was the pseudo-Aristotelian botany of Nicolaus of Damascus, which has acquired importance in the annals of Western science because it formed the basis of the botanical work of Albertus Magnus. Albert of Bolstadt, 1193-1280, Bishop of Ratisbon, was a famous scholastic philosopher. He was esteemed one of the most learned men of his age and was called Albertus Magnus during his lifetime, the title being conferred on him by the unanimous consent of the schools. The angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas, became one of his pupils. According to legendary lore, the name of Albertus would have been unknown in science but for divine intervention which miraculously affected his career. As a boy, tradition says that he was singularly lacking in intelligence, so much so that it was feared that he would be compelled to abandon the hope of entering monastic life, since he seemed incapable even of the limited acquirements necessary. However, one night, the Blessed Virgin, touched by his fervor and piety, appeared before him in glory and asked whether he would rather excel in philosophy, or in theology. Albertus, without hesitation, chose philosophy. The virgin granted his desire, but, being inwardly wounded at his choice, she added that, because he had preferred profane to divine knowledge, he should sink back, before the end of his life, into his pristine state of stupidity. According to the legend, this came to pass. Three years before his death, he was suddenly struck down in the presence of his students and never regained his mental powers. The botanical work of Albertus forms only a small fraction of his writings, but it is with that part alone that we are here concerned. As already mentioned, his knowledge of botany was based upon a medieval Latin work, which he reverenced as Aristotle's, but which is now attributed to Nicolaus Damascenus, who was, however, a follower of Aristotle and Theophrastus. Although Albertus undoubtedly drew his botanical inspiration from this book, a large proportion of his writings on the subject were original. The ideas of Albertus were in many ways curiously advanced, especially in the suggestions which he gives as to the classification of plants, and in his observations of detailed structure in certain flowers. We shall return to his writings in future chapters dealing with these subjects. It will suffice now to mention his remarkable instinct for morphology, 
in which he was probably unsurpassed during the next 400 years. He points out, for instance, that in the vine, a tendril sometimes occurs in place of a bunch of grapes, and from this he concludes that the tendril is to be interpreted as a bunch of grapes incompletely developed. He distinguishes also between thorns and prickles, and realizes that the former are stem structures, and the latter merely surface organs. Albertus seems to have had a fine scorn for that branch of the science now known as systematic botany. He considered that to catalog all the species was too vast and detailed a task, and one altogether unsuited to the philosopher. However, in his sixth book, he so far unbends as to give descriptions of a number of plants. As regards abstract problems, the views of Albertus on plant life may be summed up as follows. The plant is a living being, and its life principle is the vegetable soul, whose function is limited to nourishment, growth, and reproduction. Feeling, desire, sleep, and sexuality, properly so called, being unknown in the plant world. Albertus was troubled by many subtle problems connected with the souls of plants. Such questions, for instance, as whether in the case of the material union of two individuals, such as the ivy and its supporting tree, their souls also united. Like Theophrastus and other early writers, Albertus held the theory that species were mutable and illustrated this view by pointing out that cultivated plants might run wild and become degenerate, while wild plants might be domesticated. Some of his ideas, however, on the possibility of changes from one species to another were quite baseless. He stated, for instance, that if a wood of oak or a beech were raised to the ground, an actual transformation took place. Aspens and poplars springing up in place of the previously existing trees. The temperate tone of the remarks made by Albertus on the medical virtues of plants contrasts favorably with the puerilities of many later writers. Much of the criticism from which he has suffered at various times has been, in reality, directed against a book called De Virtutibus Herberum, the authorship of which was quite erroneously attributed to him. We shall refer to this work again in chapter 8. After the time of Albertus, no great student of Aristotelian botany arose before Andrea Cesalpino, whose writings, which belong to the end of the 16th century, will be considered in a later chapter. The work of Cesalpino had great qualities, but, curiously enough, it had little influence on the science of his time. He may be regarded as perhaps the last important representative of Aristotelian botany. 3. Medicinal Botany With the revival of learning, the speculative botany of the ancients began to lose its hold upon thinking men. This may be attributed to the curious lack of vitality and the absence of the power of active development manifested in this aspect of the subject since its initiation at the hands of Aristotle. It has proved comparatively barren because, though the minds which engaged it were among the finest that have ever been concerned with the science, the basis of observed fact was inadequate in quality and quantity to sustain the philosophical superstructure built upon it. It might have been supposed a priori that accurate observation of natural phenomena needed a less highly evolved type of mind than that required to cope with metaphysical considerations, and hence that, in the development of any science, the epoch of observation would have preceded the epoch of speculation. In actual fact, however, the reverse appears to have been the case. The power of scientific observation seems to have lagged many centuries behind the power of reasoning, and to have reached its maturity at least 2,000 years later.
Aristotle and Theophrastus arrived by the subtlest mental processes at a certain attitude towards the universe and at certain ideas concerning the nature of things. They attempted a direct advance in scientific thought by extending these conceptions to include the plant world. It was an heroic effort, but one which could not ultimately form a basis for continued progress because in its inception, preconceived ideas had come first and the facts of nature second. It seems to be almost a law of thought that it is the indirect advances which in the end prove to be the most fertile. The progress of a science, like that of a sailing boat, more often proceeds by means of tacking than by following a direct course. In the case of botany, the path which was destined to lead furthest in the end was the apparently unpromising one of medicine. Various plants from very early times had been used as healing agents, and it became necessary to study them in detail, simply in order to discriminate the kinds employed for different purposes. It was from this purely utilitarian beginning that systematic botany, for the most part, originated. As we shall show in later chapters, nearly all the herbalists whose work is discussed in the present volume were medical men. The necessity for some means of recognizing accurately the individual species of medicinal plants led in time to a sounder and more exact knowledge of their morphology than had ever been acquired under the influence of thinkers such as Albertus Magnus, who regarded with some contempt the idea of becoming acquainted in detail with the countless forms of plant life. The mass of observations relating to herbs and flowers accumulated during a period of many centuries, largely for medicinal purposes, is today serving as the basis for far-reaching biological theories, which could never have arisen without such a foundation. It is not systematic botany alone that we owe in the first instance to medicine. Nehemiah Grew, 1641 to 1712, one of the founders of the science of plant anatomy, was led to embark upon this subject because his anatomical studies as a physician suggested to him that plants, like animals, probably possessed an internal structure worthy of investigation since they were the work of the same creator. In ancient Greece, there was considerable traffic in medicinal plants. The herbalists and druggists who made a regular business of collecting, preparing, and selling them do not appear, however, to have been held in good repute. Lucian makes Hercules address Asclepius as, quote, a root digger and a wandering quack, end quote. The herbalists seem to have attempted to keep their business select by fencing it about with all manner of superstitions, most of which have for their moral that herb collecting is too dangerous an occupation for the uninitiated. Theophrastus draws attention to the absurdity of some of the root diggers' directions for gathering medicinal plants. For instance, he quotes with ridicule the idea that the peony should be gathered at night, since... If the fruit is collected in the daytime, and a woodpecker happens to witness the act, the eyes of the herbalist are endangered. He also points out that it is folly to suppose that an offering of a honey cake must be made when iris fetidissima is rooted up, or to believe that if an eagle comes near when hellebore is being collected, anyone who is engaged in the work is fated to die within the year. The herbalist's knowledge of plants must have been, in the first place, transmitted from generation to generation entirely by word of mouth, but as time went on, written records began to replace the oral tradition. The earliest extant European work dealing with medicinal plants is the famous Materia Medica of Dioscorides, which was accepted as an almost infallible authority as late as the Renaissance period. Dioscorides Anazerbius was a medical man who probably flourished in the first century of the Christian era, 
in the time of Nero and Vespasian. Tradition has, however, sometimes assigned to him the post of physician to Antony and Cleopatra. His native land was Asia Minor, but he appears to have traveled widely. In his Materia Medica, he described about 500 plants, with some attempt at an orderly scheme, though naturally the result is seldom successful when judged by our modern standards of classification. The actual descriptions of the plants are very slight, and it is only those with particularly salient characteristics which can be recognized with any ease. Careful research on the part of later writers has, however, led to the identification of a number of the plants to which he refers. There is a famous manuscript of Dioscorides at Vienna, which is said to have been copied at the expense of Juliana Anicia, the daughter of the emperor Flavius Anicius, about the end of the 5th or the beginning of the 6th century. The character of the script settles the age within narrow limits. Juliana lived in the reign of Justinian and was renowned for her ardent Christian faith and for the churches which she built. The manuscript which bears her name is illustrated by a number of drawings, which are in some cases remarkably beautiful and very naturalistic. A facsimile reproduction of this manuscript was published in 1906, and it is thus rendered accessible to students. Examples of the figures are shown on a reduced scale in plates 1, 2, and 15. The botanists of the Renaissance devoted a great deal of time and energy to the consideration of the writings of Dioscorides. The chief of the many commentators who dealt with the subject were Matthiolus, Ruelius, and Amatus Lusitanus, and a discussion of the botany of Dioscorides formed an integral part of almost every 16th century herbal. One of the contemporaries of Dioscorides, Gaius Plinius Secundus, commonly called the Elder Pliny, should perhaps be mentioned at this point, although he was not a physician, nor does he deserve the name of a philosopher. In the course of his natural history, which is an encyclopedic account of the knowledge of his time, he treats of the vegetable world. He refers to a far larger number of plants than Dioscorides, probably because the latter confined himself to those which were of importance from a medicinal point of view, whereas Pliny mentioned indiscriminately any plant to which he found a reference in any previous book. Pliny's work was chiefly of the nature of a compilation, and indeed, it would scarcely be reasonable to expect much original observation of nature from a man who was so devoted to books that it was recorded of him that he considered even a walk to be a waste of time. The writings of the classical authors, especially Theophrastus and Dioscorides, dominated European botany completely until, in the 16th century, other influences began to make themselves felt. As we shall see in the following chapter, the earliest printed herbals adhered closely to the classical tradition. End of chapter 1section 2 of herbals their origin and evolution a chapter in the history of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org herbals their origin and evolution a chapter in the history of botany by agnes arbor chapter 2 the earliest printed herbals 15th century Part 1. The Encyclopedia of Bartholomeus Anglicus and the Book of Nature After the invention of printing, a very active period of book production followed, during which many works, which had previously passed the more or less lengthy existence in manuscript, were put into circulation in print, contemporaneously with books actually written at the time. The result is that a number of the incunabula, as printed books of the 15th century are technically called, are far more ancient as regards the matter which they contain, than the date of their publication would seem to suggest. This characteristic is illustrated in the Encyclopedia of Bartholomeus Anglicus, 
Anton Conrad von Megenberg's Das Buch der Natur, which were perhaps the earliest printed books containing strictly botanical information. The former work, which was first printed about 1470, was compiled by a monk, sometimes called Bartholomew de Glanville, who flourished in the 13th century. The title by which it is generally known is Liber de Propriatibus Rerum. One of the sections of which it is composed is concerned with an account of a large number of trees and herbs, arranged in alphabetical order, and is chiefly occupied with their medicinal properties. It also includes some theoretical considerations about plants on Aristotelian lines. An English translation, which was printed by Vincent of Order before the end of the 15th century, is interesting as containing the very primitive botanical woodcut reproduced in text figure 19. Das Buch der Natur is slightly later as regards the date of publication, having been printed by Hans Bemmler at Augsburg in 1475. It seems to have been very popular, for it passed through six or seven editions before the end of the 15th century. A very large number of manuscripts of The Book of Nature exist, as many as 18 being preserved in the Vienna Library and 17 at Munich. The text is a compilation from all Latin writings, and is said to have been translated into German as early as 1349, the portion dealing with plants consists of an account of the virtues of 89 herbs with the Latin and German names. The chief interest of the work, from our present point of view, lies in the fact that it contains the earliest known botanical wood engraving, plate 3. We shall return to this subject in chapter 7. Part 2. The Herbarium of Apuleius Platonicus Another very early book based on classical writings, especially those of Dioscorides and Pliny, was the Herbarium of Apuleius Platonicus. This little Latin work is among the earliest to which the term herbal is generally applied. A herbal has been defined as a book containing the names and description of herbs, or of plants in general, with their properties and virtues. The word is believed to have been derived from a medieval Latin adjective, herbalis, the substantive liber being understood. It is thus exactly comparable in origin with the word manual in the sense of a handbook. Four early printed editions of the Herbal of Apuleius Platonicus are known, all of which appear to have been based on different manuscripts. The earliest was published in Rome late in the 15th century, from a manuscript discovered by Johann Philippus de Lecnaming, physician to Pope Sixtus IV. Nothing is definitely known concerning the author, but it is conjectured that he was a native of Africa, and that his book may date from the 5th century, or possibly even the 4th, the work undoubtedly had a career of many centuries in manuscript before it was printed. Various extant manuscripts of the Herbarium are illustrated with coloured drawings of the crudest description, which are found in comparison to be identical in many different examples, and to have been reproduced in a degraded form when the book was printed. The original figures, from which the drawings in the different manuscripts were copied, must date back to very early times. They probably represent, as Dr. Payne has pointed out, a skill of botanical draughtsmanship derived from late Roman art. These illustrations, some of which are reproduced in plates 4, 5 and 16, and text figures 1 and 2, will be discussed in greater detail in chapter 7. One of their peculiarities is that, if a herb has the power of healing, the bite or sting of any animal, that animal is drawn with the plant on the same block. Soon after the appearance in Italy of the earliest printed editions of the Herbarium of Apuleius Platonicus, Three works of great importance were published at Mainz in Germany. These were the Latin Habarius, 1484, the German Habarius, 1485, and, derived from the latter, the Hortus Sanitatis, 1491. The Latin and the German Habarius, together with the Herbarium of Apuleius Platonicus, may be regarded as the doyen among printed herbals. All three seem to have been largely based upon pre-existing manuscripts, representing a tradition of great antiquity. The various forms of the Latin and German Habarius and of the Hortus Sanitatis are described under many titles, and the unravelling of the various editions is a matter of great difficulty. In the 15th century, before copyright existed, as soon as a popular work was published, pirated editions and translation sprang into existence. In the case of the German Habarius, a new edition was printed at Augsburg only a few months after the appearance of the original at Mainz. Some such editions were dated and some undated, and the sources from which they were derived were seldom acknowledged. The passage of the earliest printed books through the press was naturally extremely slow, as compared with the rapid production of the present day. 
and the result was that the printer had leisure to make occasional alterations, so that different copies belonging actually to the same edition sometimes show slight variations. The bibliographer has thus to deal with an additional element of confusion. As far as the works now under consideration are concerned, however, much of the obscurity has been removed by the late Dr. Payne, to whom we owe a very lucid memoir on the various editions of the Latin and German Herbarius and the Hortus Sanitatis, based in part upon the researches of Dr. Ludwig Cholong. Free use has been made of his account in the present chapter. Part 3. The Latin Herbarius the work to which we may refer for convenience as the Latin Herbarius is also known under many other titles Aggregator de Simplicibus, Herbarius Mongontinus, Herbarius Patavinus, etc. It was originally printed at Mainz by Peter Schaeffer in 1484 in the form of a small quarto. It is interesting to recall that the earliest specimen of printing from movable type known to exist was produced in the same town 30 years before. Other early editions and translations of the Herbarius appeared in Bavaria, the Low Countries, Italy, and probably also in France. The work, like most of the early herbals, was anonymous and was a compilation from medieval writers, and from certain classical and Arabian authors. It seems to have no connection with the Herbarium of Apuleius, which is nowhere cited. The majority of the authorities quoted wrote before 1300 AD, and no authors mentioned who might not have been known to a writer about the middle of the 14th century that is to say, at least a hundred years before the Herbarius was published. It is quite possible that the work was not written at the time it was printed, but may have had a previous career in manuscript. The woodblocks of the first German edition are bold and decorative, but as a rule show little attempt at realism. See text figures 3, 4, 5 and 73. A different and better set of figures were used in Italy to illustrate the text, text figures 6, 57, 65, 74, 75, 76. The authorship of this version of the Herbarius is sometimes erroneously attributed to Arnold de Neuverville, a physician of the 13th century, a mistake which arose through the conspicuous citation of his name in the preface of the Venetian editions. The descriptions and figures of the herbs are arranged alphabetically. All the plants discussed were natives of Germany or in cultivation there, and the object of the work seems to have been to help the reader to the use of cheap and easily obtained remedies in case of illnesses or accident. Part 4. The German Herbarius and Related Works Of even greater importance than the Latin Herbarius is the German Herbarius, or Herbarius zu Teutsch, sometimes also called the German Autos Sanitatis, or the smaller Autos. This folio, which was the foundation of the later works called Hortus, or Autos Sanitatis, appeared at Mainz, also from the printing press of Peter Schaeffer in 1485, the year following the publication of the Latin Herbarius. It has been mistakenly regarded by some authors as a mere translation of the latter. However, the two books are neither the same in the text nor in the illustrations. The German Herbarius appears to be an independent work, except as regards the third part of the book, the index of drugs according to the uses, which may owe something to the Latin Herbarius. It seems from the preface that the originator of the book was a rich man, who had travelled in the East, and that a medical portion was compiled under his direction by a physician. The latter was probably Dr. Johann von Kuber, who was town physician of Frankfurt at the end of the 15th century. The preface to the Herbarius zu Teutsch begins with the words Oft und viel habe ich bei mir selbst betracht, die wundersam Werk des Schöpfers der Natur. Similar words are found in all the different German editions, and in the later Hortus Sanitatis they are translated into Latin. The preface revealed so clearly and so delightfully the spirit in which the work was undertaken, that it seems worthwhile to translate it almost in extenso. It is impossible, however, to grasp the medical ideas characteristic of the earlier herbals, such as those presented in the preface which follows, unless one understands the special terminology in which the four elements and the four principles or natures play a great part. The ideas expressed by these terms had begun to dominate medical and physiological notions five or six hundred years before the birth of Christ, and they held their own for a period of more than 2,000 years. As an instance of their constant occurrence in literature, we may recall Sir Toby's remark in Twelfth Night. Do not our lives consist of the four elements? In Aristotle's time, these conceptions must have been already quite familiar to his pupils. Like his predecessors, he distinguished four elements, fire, water, earth and air, and to these he added a fifth, the ether. <laughs> 
In the four elements, the four principles are combined in pairs. Fire being characterised by heat and dryness, air by heat and moisture, water by cold and moisture, and earth by cold and dryness. According to Aristotle, heat and cold are active, while dryness and moisture are passive in their nature. By the temperament of a man is understood the balance or proportion maintained between these conflicting tendencies. The particular virtues of each plant, in other words, the power of restoring lost health or temperament, are determined by the principles which it contains, and the proportions in which these occur. With this introduction we may pass on to the preface of the Herbarius zu Deutsch. Many a time and oft have I contemplated inwardly the wondrous works of the Creator of the universe, how in the beginning he formed the heavens and adorned them with goodly, shining stars, to which he gave power and might to influence everything under heaven. Also how he afterwards formed the four elements, fire, hot and dry, air, hot and moist, water, cold and moist, earth, dry and cold, and gave to each a creature of its own, and how after this the same great master of nature made and formed herbs of many sorts, and animals of all kinds, and last of all man, the noblest of all created things. Thereupon I thought on the wondrous order which the Creator gave these same creatures of his, so that everything which has its being under heaven receives it from the stars, and keeps it by their help. I considered further how that in everything which arises, grows, lives, or soars in the four elements named, be it metal, stone, herb, or animal, the four natures of the elements, heat, cold, moistness, and dryness, are mingled. It is also to be noted that the four natures in question are also mixed and blended in the human body, in a measure and temperament suitable to the life and nature of man. While man keeps within his measure proportion or temperament, he is strong and healthy. But as soon as he steps or falls beyond the temperament or measure of the four natures, which happens when heat takes to the upper hand and strives to stifle cold, or, on the contrary, when cold begins to suppress heat, or man becomes full of cold moisture, or again is deprived of the due measure of moisture, he falls of necessity into sickness and draws nigh unto death. There are many causes of disturbances, such as I have mentioned in the measure of the four elements which is essential to man's health and life. In some cases it is the poisonous and hidden influence of the heavens, acting against man's nature, for from this arise impurity and poisoning of the air. In other cases, the food and drink are unsuitable, or suitable but not taken in the right quantities, or at the right time. Of a truth, I would as soon count thee the leaves on the trees, or the grains of sand in the sea, as the things which are the causes of a relapse from the temperament of the four natures, and the beginning of man's sickness. It is for this reason that so many thousands and thousands of perils and dangers beset man, he is not fully sure of his health or his life for one moment. While considering these matters, I also remembered how the creative nature, who has placed us amid such dangers, has mercifully provided us with a remedy, that is with all kinds of herbs, animals and other created things to which he has given power and might to restore, produce, give and temper the four natures mentioned above. One herb is heating, another is cooling, each after the degree of its nature and complexion. In the same manner, many other created things on the earth and in the water preserve man's life, through the creative nature. By virtue of these herbs and created things, the sick man may recover the temperament of the four elements and the health of his body, since, then, man can have no greater nor nobler treasure on earth than bodily health. I came to the conclusion that I could not perform any more honourable, useful or holy work or labour than to compile a book in which should be contained the virtue and nature of many herbs and other created things, together with their true colours and form, for the help of all the world and the common good. Thereupon I caused this praiseworthy work to be begun by a master learned in physic, who, at my request, gathered into a book the virtue and nature of many herbs out of the acknowledged masters of physic, Galen, Avicenna, Serapio, Dioscorides, Panectarius, Platearius, and others. But when, in the process of the work, I turned to the drawing and depicting of the herbs, I marked that there are many precious herbs which do not grow here in these German lands, so that I could not draw them with the true colours and form, except from hearsay. Therefore I left unfinished the work which I had begun, and laid aside my pen, until such time as I had received grace and dispensation to visit the Holy Sepulchre, and also Mount Sinai, with the body of the Blessed Virgin, St. Catherine, rests in peace. Then, in order that the noble work I had begun and left incomplete should not come to naught, and also that my journey should benefit not my soul alone, but the whole world,
I took with me a painter ready of wit and cunning and subtle of hand, and so we journeyed from Germany through Italy, Istria, and then by way of Slavonia, or the Windish land, Croatia, Albania, Dalmatia, Greece, Corfu, Morea, Candia, Rhodes, and Cyprus, to the promised land and the holy city, Jerusalem, and thence through Arabia Minor to Mount Sinai, from Mount Sinai towards the Red Sea, in the direction of Cairo, Babylonia, and also Alexandria and Egypt, whence I have returned to Candia. In wandering through these kingdoms and lands, I diligently thought after the herbs there, and had them depicted and drawn, with their true colour and form. And after I had, by God's grace, returned to Germany and home, the great love which I bore this work impelled me to finish it. And now, with the help of God, it is accomplished. And this book is called in Latin, Auto Sanitatis, and in German, Gard de Gesundheit. In this garden are to be found the power and virtues of 435 plants and other created things, which serve for the health of man, and are commonly used in apothecaries' shops for medicine. Of these, about 350 appear here as they are, with their true colours and form. And, so that it might be useful to all the world, learned and unlearned, I had compiled it in the German tongue. Now fare forth into all lands, thou noble and beautiful garden, thou delight of the healthy, thou comfort and life of the sick. There is no man living who can fully declare thy use and thy fruit. I thank thee, O Creator of heaven and earth, who has given power to the plants and other created things contained in this book, that thou hast granted me the grace to reveal this treasure, which until now has lain buried and hid from the sight of common men. To thee be glory and honour, now and for ever. Amen. Passing from the preface to the botanical part of the German Herbarius, we find that it is divided into chapters, each of which deals with a herb, except in a comparatively small number of cases, in which an animal or a substance useful to man, such as butter or lime, forms the subject. The chapters are arranged in alphabetical order. The Herbarius zu Teutsch represents a notable advance upon the Latin Herbarius in the matter of the figures. Its publication, according to Dr. Payne, forms an important landmark in the history of botanical illustration, and marks perhaps the greatest single step ever made in that art. This estimate seems to the present writer to be somewhat exaggerated, but it must at least be conceded that the figures in question are, on the whole, drawn with greater freedom and realism than those of the Latin Herbarius, and are often remarkably beautiful. Text figures 7, 77, 78. The most attractive is perhaps that of the dodder climbing on a plant with flowers and pots, text figure 77, which is drawn in a masterly fashion. These woodcuts form the basis of nearly all botanical illustrations for the next half century, being copied and recopied from book to book. No work which excelled or even equalled them was produced until a new period of botanical illustration began with the Herbal of Brunfels, published in 1530. The German herbarium was much copied and translated into other languages, the original set of figures being, as a rule, reproduced on a smaller scale. According to Dr. Payne, the earliest French edition called Arbolaire, derived from the Latin herbolarium, is now an exceedingly rare book. It is said to differ little from the original except in the fact that the French translator declined to believe the myth that the mandrake root has human form. Another early French herbal, very similar to the Arbolaire, was published under the name of Le Grand Arbier. The origin of the text of this book has been the subject of some discussion. Chulon regarded it as derived from the Yortus Sanitatis, but an Italian authority, Signor Giulio Camus, has discovered two 15th century manuscripts in the Bibliotheca Estensa Modena, which have thrown a different light on the subject. One of these is the work commonly called Circa Instans, while the other is a version of the Grand Orbier. On comparing the two, Signor Camus concluded that the French manuscript was obviously derived from Circa Instans. A version of the latter, differing somewhat from the Medina manuscript, was printed at Ferrara in 1488, and other editions appeared later. The figures, which illustrate the Grand Harbier, seem to have been derived from those of the Autus Sanitatis, rather than those of the Herbarius. The work is of special interest to British botanists, since it was translated into English and published in 1526 as the Greta Herbal, a book which will be discussed at length in the following chapter. Another work, which appeared with reduced copies of the familiar illustrations from the German Herbarius, was the Liber de Arte Distillandi de Simplicipus, 
of Hieronymus Braunschweig, 1500. In this book, the method of distilling herbs in order to make use of their virtues was described in considerable detail, with drawings of the apparatus employed. Part 5. The Hortus Sanitatis A third of the fundamental botanical works produced at Mainz towards the close of the 15th century was the Hortus, or as it is more commonly called, Hortus Sanitatis, printed by Jakob Maidenbach in 1491. It is in part a modified Latin translation of the German Herbarius, but it is not merely this, for it contains treatises on animals, birds, fishes and stones, which are almost unrepresented in the Herbarius. Nearly one-third of the figures of herbs are new. The rest are copied on a reduced scale from the German Herbarius, and the drawing, which is by no means improved, often shows that the copyist did not fully understand the nature of the object he was attempting to portray. As an example of a woodcut which has lost much of its character in copying, we may take the dotter. Compare text figures 80 and 77. The Auto Sanitatis is very rich in pictures. The first edition opens with a full-page woodcut, modified from that at the beginning of the German Herbarius, and representing a group of figures, who appear to be engaged in discussing some medical or botanical problem. Before the treatise on animals, there is another large engraving of three figures, with a number of beasts at their feet. And before that on birds, there is a lively picture with an architectural background, showing a scene which swarms with innumerable birds of all kinds, whose peculiarities are apparently being discussed by two savants in the foreground. The treatise on fishes begins with a landscape with water, and livened by shipping. There are two figures in the foreground, and in the water fishes, crabs and mythical monsters, such as mermen, are seen disporting themselves. Before the treatise on stones, there is a very spirited scene, representing a number of figures in a jeweller's shop, and two large woodcuts of doctors and their patients, illustrates the medical portion, with which the book concludes. The treatise on plants is considerably modified from the German Herbarius, and the virtues of the herbs described are dealt with at greater length. The Herbarium of Apuleius Platonicus is more than once quoted, though not by name. A number of new illustrations are added, some of which are highly imaginative. The Tree of Life, text figure 12, and the Tree of Knowledge are dealt with amongst other botanical objects, a woman-headed serpent being introduced in the first case, and Adam and Eve in the second. There is a beautiful description of the virtues of the Tree of Life, in which we read that he who should eat the fruit should be clothed with blessed immortality, and should not be fatigued with infirmity or anxiety or lassitude or weariness of trouble. The engraving, which is named Narcissus, text figure 13, has diminutive figures emerging from the flowers, like a transformation scene at a pantomime. It is probably, however, intended to represent the conversion of the beautiful youth, Narcissus, into a flower. Apart from these mythological subjects, there are a number of very curious engravings. A tree called Bausor, for instance, which was believed to exhale a narcotic poison, like the fabulous Upas tree, has two men lying beneath its shade, apparently in the sleep of death. Text figure 14. Among the herbs, substances such as starch, vinegar, cheese, soap, etc. are included, and as these do not lend themselves to direct representation, they become the excuse for a delightful set of genre pictures. Wine is illustrated by a man gazing at a glass, bread by a housewife with loaves on the table before her, text figure 15, water by a fountain, honey by a boy who seems to be extracting it from the comb, and milk by a woman milking a cow. The picture which appears under the heading of Amber shows great ingenuity, text figure 16. The writer points out that this substance, according to some authors, is the fruit or gum of a tree growing by the sea, while according to others it is produced by a fish or by sea foam. In order to represent all these possibilities, the figure shows the sea, indicated in a conventional fashion with a tree growing out of it and a fish swimming in it. The writer of the Auto Sanitatis, on the other hand, holds the opinion that amber is generated under the sea, after the manner of the fungi which arise on land. The treatises on animals and fishes are full of pictures of mythical creatures, such as a unicorn being caressed by a lady as though it were a little dog, text figure 17, recalling the lady and unicorn tapestry in the Musée Cluny, a fight between a man and hydras, the phoenix and the flames, and a harpy with its claws in a man's body. Other monsters which are figured include a dragon, the basilisk, Pegasus, and a bird with a long neck which is tied in an ornamental knot.
Later Latin editions of the Auto Sanitatis were printed in Germany and Italy, and translations were also popular. The part of the book dealing with animals and stones was produced in German under the name of Gard der Gesundheit, zu Latin Auto Sanitatis, so as to form a supplement to the German herbarius, which dealt, as we have seen, almost exclusively with herbs. No really complete translation of the Hortus was ever published, except that printed by Antoine Verra in Paris about the year 1500, under the title Auto Sanitatis Translate de Latin en Francois. Henry VII was one of Verra's patrons, and in the account books of John Herrin, treasurer of the chamber, which are preserved at the record office, there's an entry, 1501-2, which runs, Item to Anthony Verra for two books called The Guardian of Health, six pounds. This refers to a copy in two parts of a last translation of the Autosanitatis, which is still preserved in the British Museum. The complete Autosanitatis made its appearance for the last time as Le Jardin de Sante, printed by Philippe Lenoir about 1539 and sold in Paris à l'Ancien de la Rose Blanche Couronnée. Text figure 18 taken from this book shows how the artists of the period represented a garden of health. The title pages of the early herbals were often decorated with such pictures. A more ambitious example is reproduced in text figure 113. In this case, the upper category storeroom is also depicted, and her housewife is portrayed, laying fragrant herbs among linen. The small garden scene on the title page of the Greta Herbal, 1526, is of special interest, since it includes representations of the male and female mandrake, text figure 112. End of chapter 2. Recording by Mocha. Section 3 of Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution. A chapter in the history of botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, A Chapter in the History of Botany, by Agnes Arbor. The Early History of the Herbal in England. Part 1. The Herbarium of Apuleius Plutonicus. Concerning the Herbarium of Apuleius Plutonicus, a few remarks have been already made. This herbal was perhaps the first through which any kind of systematic knowledge of medicinal plants was brought into Britain. For this reason it may be mentioned here, although manuscript herbals do not strictly come within our province. In the Bodleian Library there is an Anglo-Saxon translation of the work, which is said to have been made for King Alfred. Another Anglo-Saxon manuscript of later date, probably transcribed between A.D. 1000, and the Norman Conquest, has been rendered into modern English by Dr. Cockaine. The classical and Anglo-Saxon plant names are given in the herbal, and although there is scarcely any attempt at description, the localities where the plants may be found are sometimes mentioned. The greater part of the manuscript is concerned with the virtue of herbs. The plants were regarded in this as in most early works, merely as simples, that is, the simple constituents of compound medicines. Hieronymus Bach, in 1551, described his herbal as being an account of die Einfach et Geschwa, simplicia genant. The term simple, now almost obsolete, was a household word in earlier times when most remedies were manufactured at homes in the still room. The expression of Jacques in, as you like it, a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many simples, extracted from many objects, would not have seemed in the least far-fetched to an audience of that day. It is interesting that, although the word simple, used in this sense, has vanished from our common speech, its antithesis, compound, has held its place in the language of pharmacy. The southern source of the herbal of Apuleius is suggested by the fact that the origin of the healing art is attributed to Esculapius and Chiron. We are told also that the worm words were discovered by Diana, 
who delivered their powers and leached them to chiron the centaur who first from these warts set forth the leechdom the lily of the valley on the other hand is said to have been found by apollo and given by him to Esculapius, the leech many of the accounts of the virtues of the plants are of the nature of spells or charms rather than of medical recipes for instance it is recommended that if any propose a journey then let him take to him in hand this ward artemisius then he will not feel much toil in his journey as is usually the case in the older herbals the proper mode of uprooting the mandrake is described with much gusto this wart is micolen illustrious of aspect and is also beneficial thou shalt in this manner take it when thou comest to it then thou understandest it by this that it shineth at night altogether like a lamp when first thou seest its head then inscribe thou it instantly with iron lest it fly from thee its virtue is so mickle and so famous that it will immediately flee from an unclean man whence he cometh to it hence as we said before do thou inscribe it with iron and so thou dwell about it as though thou touch it not with the iron but thou shalt earnestly with an ivory staff dwell the earth and when thou seest its hands and its feet then tie thou it up then take the other end and tie it to a dog's neck so that the hound be hungry next cast meat before him so that he may not reach it except he jerk up the wart with him of this wart it is said that it hath so mickle might that what thing soever tucketh it up that it shall soon in the same manner be deceived therefore as soon as thou see that it be jerked up and hath possession of it take it immediately in hand and twist it and wring the ooze out of its leaves into a glass ampulla the writer of the herbal evidently fully accepted the mythical notion that the mandrake was furnished with human limbs plate five shows how this plant was depicted in an early printed edition of the herbarium of apuleius but much more spirited and sensational treatments of the same subject are to be found in some of the manuscripts dealing with herbs the earliest english printed book containing information of a definitely botanical character is probably the translation of the liber de proprietatibus rerum of bartholomaeus anglicus which was printed by winken de word before the end of the fifteenth century this has been briefly mentioned in the last chapter and a woodcut from it is shown in text figure nineteen section two banks herbal the first book printed in england which can really be called a herbal is an anonymous quarto volume without illustrations published in fifteen twenty five the title page runs here beginneth a new matter the which showeth and treateth of ye virtues and properties of herbs the which is poultry i have not been able to satisfy myself that this work is directly derived from any pre-existing book and it seems possible that it may really have some claim to originality dr payne suggests that it is probably an abridgment of some medieval english manuscript on herbs it is certainly quite a different work from the much more famous great herbal printed in the seceding year and although there are no figures it is in some ways a better book distinctly less space in proportion is devoted to the virtues of the plants and on the whole more botanical information is given for instance under the heading capillus veneris we find the following description this herb is called maiden here or waterwort this herb hath leaves like to fern but the leaves be smaller and it groweth on walls and stones and in ye mittels of ye leaf is as if it were black here the great herbal on the other hand vouchsafe is only the meagre information capillus veneris is an herb so named in cases where the virtues of the herbs are not strictly medicinal they are described in banks herbal with more than a touch of poetry 
rosemary has perhaps the most charming list of attributes some of which are worth quoting the reader is directed to take the flowers and make powder thereof and bind it to the right arm in a linen cloth and it shall make the light and merry also take the flowers and put them in a chest among your clothes and among books and moths shall not hurt them also boil the leaves in white wine and wash the face therewith thou shalt have a fair face also put the leaves under thy bed and thou shalt be delivered of all evil dreams also take the leaves and put them into a vessel of wine if thou sell that wine thou shalt have good luck and speed in the sale also make thee a box of the wood and smell to it and it shall preserve thy youth also put thereof in thy doors or in thy house and thou shalt be without danger of adders and other venomous serpents also make thee a barrel thereof and drinketh thou of the drink that standeth therein and thou needest to fear no poison that shall hurt ye and if thou set it in the garden keep it honestly for it is much profitable the popularity of banks herbal is attested by the fact that a large number of editions appeared from different presses although their identity has been obscured by the various names under which they were published to consider these editions in detail is a task for the bibliographer rather than the botanist and will not be attempted here we may however mention a few typical examples in fifteen fifty a book was printed by john king with the title a little herbal of the properties of herbs newly amended and corrected with certain additions at the end of the book declaring what herbs hath hath influence of certain stars and constellations whereby may be chosen the best and most lucky times and days of their ministration according to the moon being in the signs of heaven the which is daily appointed in the almanac made and gathered in the year of our lord god one thousand five hundred and fifty the twelfth day of february by anthony ascombe physician this work which is generally called ascombe's herbal is directly derived from banks herbal with the addition of some astrological lore the book known as carey's or copeland's herbal which was probably first published about the same time as ascombe's herbal is simply a later edition of the herbal of richard banks and another closely similar edition with an almost identical title was published by king another version of the same work undated and printed by robert wire appeared under an even more deceptive title a new herbal of macer translated out of latin into english there was as a matter of fact a certain Amelius Macer, a contemporary of Virgil and Ovid, who wrote about plants in Latin verse, and there is also a herbal which was first printed in the fifteenth century, and which is known by the name of Macer Floridas de Viribus Herbarum. Macer Floridas, or Amelius Macer, is supposed to have been the pseudonym of a physician whose real name was Odo de viribus urarum deals with seventy-seven plants in alphabetical order and describes their virtues in medieval latin verse which is believed to date back to the tenth century it is illustrated with woodcuts which are apparently copied from those of the herbarius zu tush there seems to be no justification whatever for the use of macer's name on the title page of a new herbal of macer except for some slight verbal differences it is identical with banks herbal of fifteen twenty five another closely similar edition also undated was published under the name of mace's herbal practiced by dr linacro mace's name was probably merely borrowed in each case in order to give the books a well-sounding title and thus to increase the chances of sale section three the great herbal among the earlier english herbals the greater reputation belongs not to banks herbal in any of its forms but to the great herbal printed by peter traveris in 1526 and again in 1529 this was admittedly a translation from the french namely from the work known as les grandes herbières 
whose origin we have discussed on page twenty four in the preface and supplement however it also shows some indebtedness to the ortus sanitatus the figures in the great herbal are degraded copies of the series which first appeared in the herbarius zutuch the introduction to the great herbal though it is less naive and charming than the corresponding part of the german herbarius may yet be quoted in part as having a very lucid idea of the utilitarian point of view of the herbalist of the period and also as bringing home to the reader the immense influence of the theory of the four elements considering the great goodness of almighty god creator of heaven and earth and all thine therein and all thing therein comprehended to whom be eternal laud and praise etc considering the course and nature of the four elements and qualities where the nature of man is inclined out of the which elements issueth divers qualities infirmities and diseases in the corporate body of man but god of his goodness that is creator of all things hath ordained for mankind which he hath created to his own likeness for the great and tender love which he hath unto him to whom all things earthly he hath ordained to be obeisant for the sustentation and health of his loving creatures mankind which is one made equally of the four elements and qualities of the same and when any of these four abound or hath more domination the one than the other it constraineth the body of man to great infirmities or diseases for the which the eternal god hath given of his abundant grace virtues in all manners of herbs to cure and heal all manner of sickness or infirmities to him be fallen through the influent course of the four elements before said and of the corruptions and the venomous airs contrary the health of man also of unwholesome meats or drinks diseases been of name and impossible to be rehearsed and fortune as well in villages whereas neither surgeons nor physicians be dwelling nigh by many a mile as it doth in good towns where they be ready at hand wherefore brotherly love compelleth me to write through the gifts of the holy ghost showing and informing how man may be helped with green herbs of the garden and weeds of the fields as well as by costly receipts of the apothecary prepared the conclusion of the whole matter which is set forth immediately before the index is in these words o ye worthy readers or practitioners to whom this noble volume is present i beseech thou take intelligence and behold the works and operations of almighty god which hath endowed his simple creature mankind with the graces of the holy ghost to have perfect knowledge and understanding of the virtue of all manner of herbs and trees in this book comprehended from a twentieth century point of view the great herbal contains much that is curious especially in relation to medical matters bathing was evidently regarded as a strange fad we learn on the authority of gallon that many folk that have bathed them in cold water have died or they come home water drinking seems to have been thought almost equally pernicious for we are told master isaac saith that it is impossible for them that drinketh over much water in their youth to come to the age that god ordained them a period when men were more prone than they are to-day to settle their differences by the use of their strong right arms is reflected in the various remedies proposed for such afflictions as blackness or bruising coming of stripes especially if they be in the face turning to less concrete ailments it is rather striking to find what a large number of prescriptions against melancholy are considered necessary for instance to make folk merry at the table one is recommended to take four leaves and four roats of vervain in wine then sprinkle the wine all about the house where the eating is and they shall all be merry the smoke of aristolochia maketh the patient merry marvellously and also driveth all devilishness and all trouble out of the house 
buglos and mugwort are also recommended to produce merriment and it is suggested that the lesser mugwort should be laid under the door of the house for if this is done man nor woman can annoy in that house the number of specifics proposed as a cure for baldness is somewhat surprising when one remembers that this condition is often attributed to the nervous stress and strain of modern life hair dyes and stains for the nails also receive their share of attention very remarkable powers were ascribed to products of the ocean such as coral and pearls the former is described as being a manner of stony substance that is found in parties of the sea and specially in hollow and cavy hills that bend in the sea and groweth as a matter of gluey humour and cleaveth to the stones the writer mentions that some say that the reed coral keepeth the house that it is in from lightning thunder and tempest pearls were regarded as of great value in medicine and for weakness of the heart the patient is recommended to take the powder of pearls with sugar of roses which suggests a remedy worthy of a poet many travellers tales are incorporated into the herbal we find for instance a most thrilling description of the lodestone lapis magnetis is the adamant stone that draweth them it is found in the brimes of the ocean sea and there be hills of it and these hills draw the ships that have nails of iron to them and break the ships up drawing of the nails out this description is illustrated by a picture of a rocky pinnacle and a ship going to pieces one man is already in the water and two others are on the point of losing their lives many of the remedies for different ailments strike the modern reader as being violent in a terrifying degree and adapted to a more robust age than the present they incline one to echo the words there were giants in the earth in those days but apparently the sixteenth century held an exactly corresponding view of its predecessors for under the heading of white ellebore we read in old time it was commonly used in medicines as we use squamony for the body of man was stronger than it is now and might better endure the violence of ellebore for man is weaker at this time of nature it is somewhat remarkable that both christianity and greek mythology find a place in the great herbal the discovery of artemisia and its virtues is attributed to diana and the centaurs but in the event of being bitten by a mad dog the sufferer is recommended to appeal to the virgin mary before employing any remedy as some of ye be bitten go to the church and make the offering to our lady and pray here to help and heal thee then rub ye sore with a new cloth etc quite a number of medicines enumerated in the great herbal still hold their own in modern practice licorice is recommended for coughs laudanum henbane opium and lettuces as narcotics olive oil and slaked lime for scalds cuttlefish bone for whitening the teeth and borax and rose water for the complexion this book throws an interesting light on the early names of british plants the primrose is called primarose and st peterwort the devil's bite is said to be so called by cause the road is black and seemeth that it is jagged with brightening and some say the devil hath envy at the virtue thereof and beat the road so for to have destroyed it duckweed is called lentils of a water or frog's foot while cuckoo pine is known by the picturesque name of Presty's hood and wood sorrel is called alleluia or cuckoo's meat one of the most noticeable features of the herbal is the exposure of methods of faking drugs for the protection of the public to eschew the fraud of them that selleth this is a great step in advance from the days of the old greek herbalist when secrecy was part of the stock and trade of a druggist and as we have pointed out in a previous chapter the credulous public was warned off by threats of the miraculous and fearful ills which would follow any unskilled meddling with the subject another work which was illustrated with the same figures as those of the great herbal 
was the virtuous book of distillation of the waters of all manner of herbs which appeared in fifteen twenty seven this was a translation of lawrence andrew from the liber de arte distillande of hieronymus Braunschweig, to which we have already referred it is almost entirely occupied with an account of methods of distillation but occasionally there is a picturesque touch of description for example in speaking of the mistletoe the author says this herb hath a long slender leaf neither full green nor full yellow and beareth a small white berry the book was printed in the fleet street by me lawrence andrew in the sign of the golden cross End of section three. Section four of Herbold's Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the history of botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Herbold's Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the history of botany by Yakni Zaba. Chapter 4. The Botanical Renaissance of the 16th and 17th Centuries. Part 1. The Herbal in Germany. In his history of botany, Kurt Sprengel first used the honour title The German Fathers of Botany to describe a group of herbalists, Brinfeldts, Bock, Fuchs and Kohlers, whose work belongs principally to the first half of the 16th century. The earliest of these was Otto Brinfeldts, Otho Brinfeldius, who is said to have been born in 1464. His short name is derived from the fact that his father, who was a cooper, came from Schloss Brunfels near Mainz. When Otto grew up, he became a Carthusian monk. We do not know how long his monastic career lasted, but eventually his health appears to have broken down, and, at the same time, his faith in the Roman Catholic Church was undermined by the acquaintance which he began to make with Protestant doctrines. He fled from the monastery and took up his abode in Strasbourg, where he was for nine years headmaster of the grammar school. He wrote various theological works, but ultimately turned his attention to medicine, and before his death in 1534 he had become town physician at Bern. As evidence of his medical studies we have his fine herbal, which is still full of interest, whereas his other works, which he probably regarded as much more serious contributions, have fallen into oblivion. A new era in the history of the herbal may be set to date from the year 1530, when the first part of Brunfelder's work, the Herbarium Vive Iconis, was published by Schott of Strasbourg. In this book, with its beautiful and naturalistic illustrations, there is, as the title indicates, a real return to nature. The plants are represented as they are, and not in the conventionalized aspect which had become traditional in the earlier herbals, through successive copying by one artist from another, without reference to the plants themselves. The blocks for the Herbarium Vive Iconis were executed by Hans Weiditz, who was probably also the draughtsman. Examples are shown in text figures 22, 23, 24, 25, 82, 83 and 84. The illustrations of Brinfeld's herbal are incomparably better than the text, which is very poor, and largely borrowed from previous writers. Brunfeld's knowledge of botany was chiefly derived from the study of certain Italian authors, Monardus and others, who spent their time in trying to identify the plants they saw growing around them with those described by Dioscorides. This was by no means unreasonable in their case, since it was the plants of the Mediterranean region that Dioscorides had enumerated. When, however, Brunfeld attempted to employ the same methods in its examination of the flora of the Strasbourg district and the left bank of the Rhine, many difficulties and discrepancies arose. He had no understanding of the geographical distribution of plants, and did not realise that different regions have dissimilar floras. It is curious that this should have been so, when we remember that Theophrastus, more than 1800 years earlier, had clearly pointed out that the provinces of Asia have each their own characteristic plants, and that some which occur in one region are absent from another. Hieronymus Bock, who in his Latin writings called himself Tragus, text figure 26, was a contemporary of Brunfeld's, though his botanical work was somewhat later in date. He was born in 1498, and destined by his parents for the cloister. 
but he proved to have no vocation for the monastic life, and having passed through a university course, he obtained, by favour of the Count Palatin Ludwig, the post of school teacher at Zweibrücken, and overseer of the Count's garden. After his patron's death, he removed to Hornbach, where he preached the gospel, and also had an extensive medical practice, devoting his spare time to botany. But he got into some trouble, apparently owing to his Protestantism, and was obliged to leave Hornbach. He was in serious straits until Count Philip of Nassau, whom he had previously cured of a severe illness, gave him shelter and support in his own castle. He was eventually able to return to Hornbach, where he filled the office of preacher until his death in 1554. Bach's great work is the New Kräuterbuch, a herbal which first appeared in 1539, printed at Strasbourg by Wendel Riehel. In subsequent editions, the title was abbreviated to Kräuterbuch. The first edition was without illustrations, but a second, containing many woodcuts, followed in 1546. The majority of the figures are said to have been copied on a reduced scale from those in Fuchs's magnificent herbal, which appeared in 1542, between the first and second editions of Bach's work. Fuchs's figures must have been used with great discretion, for the plagiarism is often not obvious. See text figures 27, 90, 91. A considerable number of the figures are new, being drawn and engraved by David Kandel, whose initials appear on the portrait of Bock, reproduced in text figure 26. The woodcuts of trees in the third part of the book are particularly noticeable, see text figures 28 and 92, and are often made more interesting by the introduction of figures of man and animals. Bock's chief claim to remembrance, however, does not lie in his figures, but in his descriptions, which were a great advance on those previously published. He was careful, also, to note the mode of occurrence and localities of the plans mentioned, and in this feature his work showed some approach to a flora in the modern sense of the word. Bach seems to have been a keen collector, although hampered by ill health, and a great point in his favour is that he described only those plants which had come under his own personal observation. The royal fern, Osmunda, was traditionally supposed to bear seed upon St. John's Eve, though ferns were generally believed at that time to have no organs of fruitification. To test this statement, Bach four times spent the night in the forest. He found small black seed-like poppy seed. In spite of the fact that he used no charm, incantation or magic character, but went upon his search without superstition. Bach's freedom from the credulity which permeated the work of so many of the early botanists is one of his most remarkable characteristics. His chapters on Verbena and Artemisia reflect clearly the independence of his thought. He points out that the former plant is collected rather for purposes of magic than for medicine, and he can hardly contain his scorn at the monkey tricks and ceremonies connected with the use of the latter. Leonard Fuchs, or Fuchsius, the third of the fathers of German botany, see frontispiece, belonged to the same generation as Hieronymus Bock, although he was a little younger and produced the chief work three years later. He was born in 1501 at Memdingen in Bavaria, and at an early age he became a student of the University of Fairford, where he is said to have taken a bachelor's degree in his thirteenth year. After a period of school teaching, he resumed his studies, this time at the University of Ingolstadt, where he devoted himself chiefly to classics and became a master of arts. After this, he turned his attention to medicine and took a doctor's degree. At Ingolstadt, he came under the influence of Luther's writing, which won him over to the Reformed faith. Fuchs began to practice as a physician at Munich, but in 1526 he returned to Ingolstadt as professor of medicine. He seems to have been of a restless temperament, which was probably accentuated by the persecution to which his Protestant opinions exposed him. His career for more than forty years consisted of periods of active practice, alternating with periods of university teaching. In 1535, he was appointed to a professorship at Tübingen, and, while he held this post, he declined a call to the University of Pisa, and also an invitation to become physician to the King of Denmark. It is clear that, both as a physician and a teacher, he was in great demand. He acquired a widespread reputation by a successful treatment of a terrible epidemic disease which swept over Germany in 1529. 
a little book of medical instructions and prayers against the plague, which was published in London in the latter half of the 16th century, shows that his fame had extended to England. It is entitled, A Worthy Practice of the Most Learned Physician, Meister Leonard Fuchsius, Doctor in Physic, Most Necessary in This Needful Time of Our Visitation, For the Comfort of All Good and Faithful People, Both Old and Young, Both for the Sick and for Them That Would Avoid the Danger of Contagion. In spite of his professional activity, Fuchs found time to produce a botanical masterpiece, which appeared in 1542 from the press of Isengrin of Bale, under the title De Historia Stipium. This was a Latin herbal, dealing with about 400 native German and 100 foreign plants, and was followed in the succeeding year by a German edition called the New Kräuterbuch. Of all the botanists of the Renaissance, Fuchs is perhaps the one who deserves most to be held in honour. He is notably superior to his two predecessors in matters calling for scholarship, such as the critical study of the plant nomenclature of classical authors. His herbal rivals, or even surpasses, that of Brunfeld's in its illustrations, and that of Bock in its German text. The latter press of the Latin edition is, on the whole, inferior to the German, the brief descriptions being often taken word for word from previous writers. The Latin edition opens, however, with a long and most interesting preface, in singularly pure and fine Latin. Fox is keenly indignant at the ignorance of herbs displayed even by medical men. His outburst on this subject may be literally translated as follows. But, by immortal God, is it to be wondered at that kings and princes do not at all regard the pursuit of the investigation of plants, when even the physicians of our time so shrink from it, that it is scarcely possible to find one among a hundred who has an accurate knowledge of even so many as a few plants. That Fuchs's work was indeed a labour of love is a conviction that must force itself upon everyone who studies his herbal, and it is further borne out by his own words in the preface, words which bear the stamp of a lively enthusiasm. But there is no reason why I should dilate at greater length upon the pleasantness and delight of acquiring knowledge of plants since there is no one who does not know that there is nothing in this life pleasanter and more delightful than to wander over woods, mountains, plains, garlanded and adorned with flowerlets and plants of various sorts, and most elegant to boot and to gaze intently upon them. But it increases that pleasure and delight not a little, if there be added acquaintance with the virtues and powers of these same plants. The woodcuts which illustrate Fuchs's herbal are of extraordinary beauty. Text figures 30, 31, 32, 58, 70, 86, 87, 88. Some of them gain a special interest as being the first European figures of certain American plants, for example, Indian corn, Zermais L, and the great pumpkin, Cucubita maxima doch. Text figure 32. These woodcuts became familiar in England in the second half of the 16th century being used on a reduced scale, borrowed from the Octavo edition, in both William Turner's Herbal and Light's Dodoans, two books which we shall consider a little later. In Fuchs's great work, we are fortunate in possessing, in addition to the botanical drawings, a full-length portrait of the author himself, holding a spray of Veronica, on the verso of the title page, see frontispiece, and at the end of the work, named Portraits, which are generally supposed to represent the artist who drew the plants from nature, the draughtsman whose business it was to copy the outline onto the wood, and the engraver who actually cut the block. Text figure 89. It has also been suggested that the first of these is perhaps engaged in colouring a printed sheet. These portraits are powerfully drawn, and remarkably convincing. It is pleasant to think that we know not nearly the names, but the very features of the man who collaborated to give us what is perhaps the most beautiful herbal ever produced. The influence of Fuchs's illustrations is more strongly felt in later work than that of his text. The majority of the wood engravings in Bock's Kräuterbuch, 1546, Dodoen's Kräuterbock, 1554, Turner's New Herbal, 1551 to 1568, Light's Neuer Herbal, 1578, and Jean Bohan's Historia Plantarum Universalis, 1651, are copied from Fuchs, or even printed from his actual woodplucks, 
while a number of his figures reappear in the herbals of Egonolf, de Alichams, Tabemai Montanus, etc., and the commentaries of Vuelius and Amatus Lusitanus on Dioscorides. Fox arranged his work alphabetically, making no attempt at a natural grouping of the plants, and his herbal is therefore without importance in the history of plant classification. His influence on methods of plant description was, however, considerable, as is shown by the fact that de Doens, in his Kreuderbach, took Fuchs's herbal as a model for the order of description of each plant. Fuchs's text, as well as his figures, may thus be said to have had an effect, even if an indirect one, on British botany, since the herbals of Light and of Gerard are based on the work of de Doens, in which, as we just have shown, the influence of Fuchs is clearly felt. The publisher Christian Egenolf of Frankfurt, though not himself a botanical writer, must be mentioned at this stage. Bercy brought out, in 1533, a set of planned illustrations which became particularly well known, for example text figures 33 and 85. They do not reflect any great credit on Egenolf, since they were mostly pirated from Brunfels. They were not even used to illustrate a new herbal, but merely a new edition of the old German Herbarius, enlarged and improved by Dr. Eucharius Rodion, and issued under the name of Kräuterbuch von allen Erdgewächs. Egenolf was evidently a keen man of business, for he made his figures to duty over and over again. He used them not only as illustrations to the herbal, but as a separate publication, without any letterpress, and also in conjunction with an entirely unrelated text, such, for example, as a Latin version of Dias Corridus. Many later editions of the Kreuterbuch appeared, and to these a number of figures were added, chiefly copies on a reduced scale from those of Bock, who had himself made considerable use of drawings on the Octava edition of Fuchs's Herbal. The editions produced under the auspices of Adam Loniser, the publisher's son-in-law, are particularly well known. No other botanical work of the period had a success comparable to that of his long series of books, of which Rodian's Kotterbuch was the prototype. This success was, however, achieved in the teeth of much adverse contemporary criticism. Fuchs, in the preface of his Historia Stipium, 1542, referred with unsparing touch to Egonov's botanical mistakes. His transient indictment may be rendered into English as follows. Among all the herbals which exist today, there are none which have more of the crassest errors than those which Egonolf, the printer, has already published again and again. This statement Fuchs supports by means of actual examples. It must nevertheless be admitted that, even if their quality was poor, the herbals published by Egonolf and his successors did good service in disseminating some knowledge of the plant world among a very wide public. There is, in the British Museum, a beautiful copy of the 1536 edition, with a binding stamped in gold and bearing the arms of Mary, Duchess of Suffolk, daughter of Henry the Seventh. The Duchess may perhaps have inherited a taste for herbals from her father, for the British Museum also possesses a copy of Verard's translation of the author's Sanitatis, which is known to have been purchased by him. Among the German fathers of botany, Sprengel includes a comparatively little-known name, that of Valerius Cordus, 1515-1544, a man whose actual achievement was small, but who, if he had not died so young, would probably have become one of the most famous of the earlier herbalists. His father, Iresius Cordus, was a physician, botanist and man of letters, so Valerius was brought up in a fortunate environment. At sixteen, he graduated at the University of Marburg, and, after studying in various towns, he passed from the position of pupil to that of teacher, and expanded his Corridus at the University of Wittenberg. He travelled widely in search of plants, and visited many of the savants of the periods. He is known to have made a stay at Tübingen, and it is highly probable that he became personally acquainted with Leonard Fuchs. Cordus had always longed to see, under their native skies, the plants about which the ancients had written, and, in fulfilment of this dream, he undertook a long excursion into Italy. He visited many of the towns, amongst others Padua, Bologna, Florence and Siena, travelling partly on foot and partly on horseback, and generally accompanied by his friend Hieronymus Schreiber. 
the journey was a very trying one to men accustomed to a more northerly climate. Wild and difficult country had it been traversed in the height of summer, and the exposure and fatigue led to a tragic conclusion. Cordus was injured by a kick from a horse, which brought on a fever, and his companions had great difficulty in getting him as far as Rome. He rallied, however, and his friends were deceived into the belief that he was on the road to recovery. They even thought it safe to leave him, while they made an excursion to Naples, but he did not survive until their return. His fate, like that of Keats, was to see Rome and die. None of the botanical works of Valerius Cordus were published during his lifetime, but his commentaries on Dioscorides and his Historia Stipium were edited by Gessner after his death. The great merit of the Historia lies in the vividness of the descriptions. The author seems to have examined the plants for their own sake, not merely in the interest of the arts of healing. Cordus did noteworthy service to medicine, however, for when he passed through Nuremberg on his travels, he was able to lay before the physicians of that town a collection of medical recipes, chiefly selected from earlier writings. This work, which had for some time been in use in Saxony in manuscript form, was considered so valuable that, after it had been examined and tested under the auspices of the town council, it was published officially as the Nuremberg Dispensatorium, probably in 1546. This is said to be the first work of the nature of a pharmacopoeia ever published under government authority. A passing reference may be made at this point to Jacob Theodore of Bergzaben, 1520-1590, a herbalist whose work was perhaps of no very great importance, but who was closely connected with the German fathers of botany, having been the pupil both of Otto Bonfels and of Hieronymus Bock. In his books he called himself Tabernae Montanos. Like the majority of the herbalists, Theodore was a medical man, and his study of botany was a hobby which extended over many years. He projected a herbal, but was unable for a long time to carry the idea into effect, being deterred by the cost of the illustrations. This difficulty was eventually overcome, chiefly through the generosity of Count Palatine Frederick III and of the Frankfurt publisher Nicolas Baseos. The herbal first appeared in 1588 under the title Neu Kräuterbuch, and in 1590 the illustrations were published without any text as the Iconis Plantarum. The herbal is a large and very finely illustrated work. The figures, however, are for the most part not original, but are reproduced from Bock, Fuchs, Dodoens, Mattioli, De La Cluse, and De Lobel. This collection of woodblocks became familiar in England a few years later, when they were acquired by the printer John Norton and used to illustrate Durant's Herbal, which appeared in 1597. There is still another German herbalist of the 16th century whose work must not be overlooked. This is Joachim Camararius the Younger, Plate VI. His father was a celebrated philologist and a friend of Melanchthon. The son, who was born in 1534, was attracted to botany in his early youth. He studied at Wittenberg and other universities, and travelled in Hungary and Italy. He spent some time in the latter country, and took a doctor's degree in medicine at Bologna. At Pisa, he became acquainted with Andrea Cesalpino. Finally, he returned to Germany, and settled down at Nuremberg. Here he cultivated a garden which was kept supplied with rare plants by his friends and the Nuremberg merchants. Camerarius brought out an edition of Mattioli, De Plantis Epitoma, but his chief work was the Hortus Medicus at Philosophicus, which appeared in 1588. The illustrations to this book consist partly of drawings by Gessner, which the author had bought a few years previously, and partly of original figures. It is impossible to discriminate with any exactness between the work of the two men. These woodcuts, of which text figures 34, 35, 71 and 100 are examples, will be discussed more fully in chapter 7. From the botanical point of view, they represent a considerable advance, since the details of floral structure are often shown on an enlarged scale. Camerarius was a good observer, and his travels furnished him with much information regarding the calices for the plans which he described. End of chapter 4, part 1. Recording by Mocha. Section 5 of Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution.
A chapter in the history of botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shushang Jakmola. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, A Chapter in the History of Botany by Agnes Arbor. Fourth, The Botanical Renaissance of the 16th and 17th Centuries, Part 2 the herbal in the low countries in the 16th century the herbal flourished exceedingly in the low countries this was due in part to the zeal and activity of the botanists of the netherlands but perhaps even more to the munificence and love of learning for its own sake which distinguished that prince of publishers christoph plantin of antwerp in these qualities he forms a notable contrast to ignolf of frankfurt to whose shortcoming we have already drawn attention plantin's life extended from about fifteen fourteen to fifteen eighty nine and thus included the central years of that wonderful century he was a native of touraine and studied the art of printing at caen and other french towns towards fifteen fifty he and his wife jeanne Rivry, settled in antwerp where he worked at bookbinding and his wife sold linen in a little shop later he returned to the profession of printing and his business in this direction gradually developed and was eventually transferred to the famous meissen planton christophe's reputation grew to such an extent that great efforts were made in various quarters to tempt him from antwerp the duke of savoy and Piedmont, for instance did all he could to persuade him to come to turin promising him extensive printing works and all necessary funds but he remained faithful to the city of his adoption perhaps the most potent factor in his success was his keen judgment of men which enabled him to choose his subordinates that he gathered around him an unrivalled staff one of Plantin's daughters married Jean Mortius, her father's chief assistant and successor, and from him the business descended through a generations of printers to Edouard Jean Hyacinthe Moretus, the last of his race, from whom, in 1876, the citizens of Antwerp purchased the Meissen Plantin and its contents. The house had remained practically unchanged since the days when Christophe Plantin lived and worked there, and it is now preserved as the Musée Plantin Moritus. It is built round a rectangular courtyard, and its beauty, both in proportion and in detail, in such that one feels at once that Plantin achieved the ambition he expressed in his charming sonnet, Le Bonheur de ce monde, Ova une maison commande, propre et belle the pictures furnitures and hangings and not only the very presses fonts and furnaces for casting the type but even the old account books and corrected proof sheets are still to be seen all in their appropriate places the wage books are preserved showing the weekly earnings of compositors engravers and bookbinders throughout a period of three centuries in short, the mice and plant in beggars, description, and a visit there is an infallible recipe for transporting the imagination back to the time of Renaissance, when printing was in its first youth, and was treated with reverence due to one of the fine arts. The first Belgian botanist of worldwide renounce was Rembert Dodiens, or Dodinius. He was a contemporary of Plantin, having been born at Malinus in 1517. He studied at Leuven and visited the universities and medical schools of France, Italy and Germany, eventually qualifying as a doctor. He was successful in his profession, being physician to the emperors Maximilian II and Rudolf II, and finally becoming professor of medicine at Leiden, where he died in 1585. His interest in the medical aspect of botany led him to write a herbal, and in order to illustrate it, he obtained the use of the wood blocks which had been employed in the octavo edition of Fute's work. To these, a number of new engravings were added. The book was published in Dutch in the year 1554 by Vanderlo, under the title Crudebuch. The text is not a translation of Fute's, as is sometimes supposed, 
although Durians took futures as his model for the order of description of each plant. The method of arrangement in his own, and he indicates localities and times of flowering in the Low Countries, information which clearly could not have been derived from the earlier writer. Almost simultaneously with the first Dutch edition, a French issue appeared under the title of Histoire des Plantes. The translation was carried out by Charles de Ecluse, with whose own work we shall shortly deal. Dodian supervised the production of the book and took the opportunity to make some additions. It became known in England through Light's translation, which will be discussed in a later section of this chapter. The last Dutch edition of The Herbal, for which the author himself was responsible, was printed by Van der Lohe in 1563. The publisher then parted with the Fisher's blocks, which were probably acquired by the printer of Light's Dodians in England. This circumstance put great difficulties in the way of Dodians' wish to reproduce his herbal in Latin. However, it proved a blessing in disguise, for he had the good fortune to meet in Christophe Plantin's on homme que ne reclare devant arcune de pense pour donner ouvra qui sortien de se presse toute la perfection et le merite dont il est intérêt susceptibles. Plantin undertook to produce a much modified Latin translation of the herbal and to have new plots engraved for it, while students on his side engaged to supply the artists with the fresh plants and to superintend their labors. The work proceeded slowly and was published in parts. It was finally completed in 1583 and was produced in one volume under the name of Stirpium Historiae Pompede Sex Save Libri Triginta. In this work, by far the largest number of the figures are original. Some, however, were borrowed from De Cluse and De Obel. This arose from the fact that Plantin was also the publisher for both these writers, and as he bore the expense of their blocks, he had an arrangement with the three authors that their illustration should be treated as common property. A few of Dodian's figures were based upon those in the famous manuscript of Dioscorides, now at Vienna. In the Pemtades, the botanist in Dodian's was more to the fore, and the physician less in evidence than in his earlier work. It is particularly difficult to appraise with any exactness the services which Dodians rendered to botany. Between him and his two younger countrymen, de Ocluse and de Obel, there was so intimate a friendship that they freely imparted their observations to one another and permitted the use of them, and also of their figures, in one another's book. To attempt to ascertain exactly what degree of merit should be attributed to each of the three would be a task equally difficult and thankless. Charles de Cluse, or Clusius, was born at Arras in the French Netherlands in 1526. Like Dodians, he passed the closing years of his life at Leiden. He studied at Leuven and other universities, including Montpellier, where he came under the influence of the botanist Guillaume Rondelet, who also numbered de Alicamps, de Obel, Pierre Pena, and Jean Bohin among his pupils. De Cluse was an enthusiastic adherent of the Reformed faith to which he was converted by the influence of Melanchthon, and he suffered religious persecution which brought even actual martyrdom to some of his relatives. Though he himself did not lose his life, he was deprived of his property, and between poverty and ill health, his career seemed to have been a melancholy one. He passed a nomad existence, attached at one time as tutor to some great family, while, at others, he was occupied in writing or translating for Rondelet, Dodians, or Plantin, or undertaking precarious employment at the court of Vienna. The University of Leiden finally appointed him to a professorship. It is interesting to note that he paid more than one visit to England and that he was intimate with Sir Francis Drake, who gave him plans from the New World. Del Clouse had a reputation for versatility scarcely exceeded by that of his contemporary, the admirable Christian. He is said to have had a wide knowledge of Latin, Greek, French, German, Flemish, Spanish, law, philosophy, history, geography, zoology, mineralogy, and numismatics, besides his chosen subject of botany.
since his botanical debut was made as the translator of Dodin's, we may with reason look upon him as a disciple of the latter. The first original work Del Clos produced was an account of the plants which he had observed while on an adventurous expedition to Spain and Portugal with two pupils. This was so successful botanically that he brought back 200 new species. The description of his finds was published by Plantin in 1576 under the title of Rariorum Eliquat Stirpium per Hispanias Observatorum Historia. Woodblocks were engraved purposefully for this book, but for the confusion of the bibliographer, some of them were also used to illustrate Dodin's work in the interval while the Spanish flora of Del Clos awaited a publication. In 1583 appeared our author's second work, which did the same service for the botany of Austria and Hungary as the previous volume had done for the botany of Spain. These two works, together with some additional matter, were republished in 1601 as the Reorum Plantarum Historia. In this book, the species belonging to the same genus are often brought together, but beyond this, there is little attempt at systematic arrangement. De Clues was weak in the synthetic faculty, his strength lying rather in his powers of observation. Cuvier reckons that he added more than 600 to the number of known plants. It is characteristic of his versatile mind that his botanical interests were not confined, like those of most of the early workers, to flowering plants. A manuscript is preserved in the Leyden Library, containing more than 80 beautiful watercolour drawings of fungi, executed under the direction of Del Clos, by artists employed by his great friend and patron, Baron Boldisar de Bethiani. This gentleman is said to have been so enthusiastic a botanist that he set a Turkish prisoner at liberty on the condition that he should obtain plants for him from Turkey. De La Clues seemed to have been a man of wide friendships, and his botanical correspondence was very large. He did much for horticulture, and is called by his friend Marie de Bremen, Princess de Chimay, Le Pere de Thos Le Bux, Jardin de Saipes. He deserves special gratitude for one benefit of a very practical nature, namely the introduction of the potato into Germany and Austria. It is worth of note that Der Clues, unlike the majority of the herbalists, was not a physician, and although he laid considerable stress on the properties of plants, he was not preoccupied with the medical side of the subject. He studied plants for their own sake and abandoned the futile effort to identify them with those mentioned by the ancients. The third of the tri of botanists whom we are now considering is Matthias de Lobel, who was born in Flanders in 1538 and died in England at Highgate in 1616. He studied at Montpellier under Guillaume Rondelet, who finally bequeathed to him his botanical manuscripts. Here also he became acquainted with a young provincial, Pierre Pena, with whom he afterwards collaborated in botanical work. De Lobel took up medicine as his profession and eventually became physician to William the Silent, a post which he held until the assassination of the Stadtholder. Later on, he and Pena came to England, probably to seek a peaceful life under the prosperous sway of Queen Elizabeth, which was so favourable to the arts and sciences. The principal work was dedicated to her in terms of hyperbolic praise. De Lobel seems to have been well received in this country, for he was invited to superintend the medicinal garden at Hackney, belonging to Lord Zouche, and he eventually obtained the title of botanist to James I. De Lobel's chief botanical work was the Stirpium Adversaria Nova, published in 1570, with Pena as joint author. Pena does not appear to have been a botanist of much importance, and he eventually quite forsook the subject in favour of medicine. It has been suggested, however, that De Lobel was inclined to minimise the value of his colleague's work. The system of classification, upon which De Lobel's reputation really rests, is set forth in this book. The main feature of this scheme is that he distinguishes different groups by the peculiarities of their leaves. He is thus led to make a rough separation between the classes which we now call dicotyledons and monocotyledons. The details of his system will be considered in a later chapter.
In 1576, the work was enlarged and published as the Plantarum Seu Stirpium Historia. It was also translated into Flemish and appeared under the title of Kreuteburg in 1581, dedicated to William of Orange and the burgomasters and other functionaries of Antwerp. The blocks used to illustrate this work were taken from previous books, especially those of De Lecluse. Immediately after the publication of Creuty book, Plantin brought out an album of the engravings it had contained, which, although they had also been used to illustrate the herbals of Dodians and De La Cluse, were now grouped according to De Lobel's arrangement, which was recognized as the best. End of chapter 4, part 2「Section 6 of Herbals – Their Origin and Evolution – A Chapter in the History of Botany – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shashang Jakmola. Herbals – Their Origin and Evolution – A Chapter in the History of Botany by Agnes Arbor Fourth. The Botanical Renaissance of the 16th and 17th Centuries, Part 3, The Herbal in Italy The Italian botanists of the Renaissance devoted themselves chiefly to interpreting the works of the classical writers of natural history and to the identification of the plants to which they referred. This came about quite naturally from the fact that the Mediterranean flora, which they saw around them, was actually that with which the writers in question had been, in their day, familiar. The botanists of southern Europe were not compelled, as were those whose homes lay north of Alps, to distort facts before they could make the plants of their native country fit into the Procrustean bed of classical descriptions. One of the chief of the commentators and herbalists of this period was Pierandria Mattioli or Matthiolus, who was born at Siena in 1501 and died of the plague in 1577. We realized something of the frightful extent of this scourge when we remembered that it claimed as victims no less than three of the small company of Renaissance botanists, Gessner, Mattioli and Zalusian. Leonard Fuchs was brought into fame by his successful treatment of one of these epidemics. It should also be recalled that, while Gaspard Bohin, one of the best known of the later herbalists, was practicing as a physician at Basel, no less than three of these terrible outbreaks occurred in the town. Mattioli was the son of a doctor, and his early life was passed in Venice, where his father was in practice. He was destined for the law, but his inherited tastes led him away from the jurisprudence to medicine. He practiced in several different towns and became physician successively to the Archduke Ferdinand and to the Emperor Maximilian II. Mattioli's Commentari in Sex Libro Spedaci Discordidis, his Chef d'Ouvre, the gradual production and improvement of which occupied his leisure hours throughout his life, was first published in 1544. It was translated into many languages and appeared in countless editions. The success of the work was phenomenal, and it is said that 32,000 copies of the earlier editions were sold. The title does not do the book justice, for it contains, besides an exposition of Dioscorates, a natural history dealing with all the plants known to Mattioli. The early editions had small illustrations, but later on, editions with large and very beautiful figures were published, such as that which appeared at Venice, in 1565. Mattioli's descriptions of the plants with which he deals are not so good as those of some of his contemporaries. He found and recorded a certain number of new plants, especially from the Tyrol, but most of the species which he described for the first time were not his own discoveries but were communicated to him by others. Luca Ghini, for instance, had projected a similar work by handed over all his material to Mattioli, who also placed on record the discoveries made by the physician Wilhelm Quackelbein, who had accompanied the celebrated diplomist Augur Gislein Busbeck on a mission to Turkey.
Bees Beck brought from Constantinople a wonderful collection of Greek manuscripts, including Juliana Anicia's copy of the Materia Medissa of Dioscordides, now in the Vienna Library, see pages 8 and 154. He discovered this great manuscript in the hands of a Jew who required a hundred ducats for it. The price was almost prohibitive, but Bisbeck was an enthusiast, and he successfully urged the emperor, whose representative he was, to redeem so illustrious an author from that servitude. His purpose in buying the manuscript seems to have been largely in order to communicate it to Mattioli, who would thus be able to make use of it in preparing his commentaries on Dioscorites. The personal character of Mattioli does not appear to have been a pleasant one. He engaged in numerous controversies with his fellow botanists and hurled the most abusive language at those who ventured to criticize him. Another Italian herbalist, Castor Durante, slightly later in date than Mattioli, should perhaps be mentioned here, not because of his intrinsic value of his work, but because of its widespread popularity. At least two of his books appeared in many editions and translations. Durante was a physician who issued a series of botanical compilations bedizened with Latin verse. The best known of his work is Herbario Nuovo, published at Rome in 1585. A second book, the original version of which is seldom met with, has survived in the form of a German translation by Peter Uffenbach. The German version was named Hortulus Sanitatis. As an illustration of Durante's charmingly unscientific manner, we may take the legend of the Arbor Tristis, which occurs in both these works. The figure which accompanies it shows beneath the moon and stars a drawing of a tree whose trunk has a human form. The description, as it occurs in the Hortulus Sanitatis, may be translated as follows. Of this tree the Indians say, there was once a very beautiful maiden, daughter of a mighty lord called Parisatako, this maiden loved the sun, but the sun forsook her because he loved another. So, being scorned by the sun, she slew herself, and when her body had been burned, according to the custom of that land, this tree sprang from her ashes, and this is the reason why the flower of this tree shrank so intensely from the sun, and never opened in its presence. And thus it is a special delight to see this tree in the night time, adorned on all sides with its lovely flowers, since they give forth a delicious perfume, the like of which is not to be met within any other plant, but no sooner does one touch the plant with one's hand than its sweet scent vanishes away. And however beautiful the tree has appeared, and however sweetly it has bloomed at night, directly the sun rises in the morning, it not only fades, but all its branches look as though they were withered and dead. Much more famous than Durante was Fabio Colonna, or as he is more generally called Fabius Columna, who was born at Naples in 1567. His father was a well-known literateur. Fabio Colonna's profession was that of law, but he was also well acquainted with languages, music, mathematics and optics. He tells us in the preface of his principal work that his interest in plants was aroused by his difficulty in obtaining a remedy for epilepsy, a disease from which he suffered. Having tried all sorts of prescriptions without result, he examined the literature on the subject and discovered that most of the writers of his time merely served up the results obtained by the ancients, often in a very incorrect form. So he went to the fountain head, Dioscorides, and after much research identified valerian as being the herb which that writer had recommended against epilepsy and succeeded in curing himself by its use. The experience convinced Colonna that the knowledge of the identity of the plants described by the ancients was in a most unsatisfactory condition and he set himself to produce a work which should remedy the state of things. This book was published in 1592 under the name of Phyto Bassanos which embodies a quaint conceit after the fashion of the time. The title is a compound Greek word meaning plant torture and was apparently employed by Colonna to explain that he had subjected the plants to ordeal by torture in order to wrest from them the secret of their identity. But it must be confessed that Colonna himself is by no means free from error as regards the names which he assigns to them. 
The great feature of the fighter Bassanos, however, is the excellence of the descriptions and figures. The latter are famous as being the first etchings on copper used to illustrate a botanical work. They were an advance on all previous plant drawing except the work of Kessner and Camerarius in giving, in many cases, detailed analysis of the flowers and fruits as well as habit drawings. We owe to Colonna also the technical use of the word petal, which he suggested as a descriptive term for the coloured floral leaves. By means of his wine scientific correspondence, Colonna kept in touch with many of the naturalists of his time, notably with Delil Clues and Gaspard Bohin. A passing reference may be made here to a book which is rather of the nature of a local flora than a herbal, entitled Prosperi Alpini de Plantes Egypti, which was published at Venice in 1592. It contains a number of woodcuts, which appears to be original. The one reproduced represents Salicornia, the glass fort. The author was a doctor who went to Egypt with the Venetian consul, Giorgio Imo, and had opportunities of collecting plants there. He is said to have been the first European writer to mention the coffee plant, which he saw growing at Cairo. Prospero Alpino eventually became professor of botany at Padua, and enriched the botanical garden of that town with Egyptian plants. End of chapter 4, part 3「Section number 7 of Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the History of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shashank Jakmola. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the History of Botany by Agnes Arbor, 4th. The Botanical Renaissance of the 16th and 17th Centuries, Part 4. The Herbal in Switzerland Among the many scientific men whose names are associated with Switzerland, one of the most renowned is Conrad Gessner, who was born at Zurich in 1516, the son of a poor furrier. His taste for botany was due, in the first instance, to the influence of his uncle, a Protestant preacher. Conrad went to France to study medicine, but in Paris the richness of the libraries and the delight of associating with learned men tempted him away from his special subject into a course of omnivorous reading. After an interval of school teaching at Zurich, he betook himself to Basel, where he entered more methodically upon the study of medicine at the same time attempting to support himself by working at a Latin dictionary. However, after a short period of student life, he found the expense too great and was obliged to abandon it and to take a post as teacher of classics in Lausanne. He had received assistance at different times from his native town, which again came to his help at this juncture and generously allotted to him a Rice Stipendium for the continuous of his medical studies. He indeed owed much to Zurich, for, after taking his doctorate, he was appointed first to the professorship of philosophy there, and then to that of natural history, which he held until he died of the plague in his forty-ninth year. Gessner's most remarkable characteristic was his versatility and encyclopedic knowledge. He has been called the Pliny of his time, his work on bibliographical and linguistic subjects was of importance, and he also wrote on medicine, mineralogy, zoology, and botany. The botanical works published during his life were not of great importance, but at the time of his death, he had already prepared a large part of the material for a general history of plants, which was intended as a companion work for his famous Historia Animalium. In order to illustrate it, he had collected 1,500 drawings of plants, the majority original, though some were founded on previous footcuts, especially those of Fioxes. The undertaking was so far advanced that some of the figures had been drawn upon the wood, and certain blocks had even been engraved. The whole collection and the manuscripts he bequeathed for publication to his friend Caspar Wolf. Wolf seems to have made an honest effort to carry out Gessner's wishes, and he succeeded in publishing a few of the woodcuts, 
as an appendix to Simler's Vita Conradi Gesneri. Unfortunately, he was hampered by weak health and the task as a whole proved beyond his powers. He sold everything to Joachim Camerarius the Younger, with the proviso that the purchaser should make himself responsible for the publication. Camerarius failed to fulfill the spirit of this obligation. It is true that he brought a large number of Gessner's figures before the public, but he did this only by the indirect method of using them among his own drawings to illustrate an edition of Mattioli and a book of his own. Finally, about a hundred and fifty years after the death of Camerarius, Gessner's drawings and blocks came into the possession of the 18th century botanist and bibliographer Christoph Jacob True, who published them, thus giving Gessner his due so far as was possible at that late date. Such blocks as were in good conditions were printed directly, and from the drawing a number of copper engravings were made, coloured like the originals. The drawings were of unequal merit, some of them being on a very small scale and lacking in clearness. In one point, however, Gessner shows a marked advance on the methods of his contemporaries, namely in giving detailed analyst studies of flower and fruit structure, as well as a drawing showing the habit of the plant. It must not be forgotten that, even in True's edition, it is impossible to discriminate with certainty between the work of Gessner and that of Camerarius. Unfortunately, we have no knowledge of the text of Gessner's manuscript, but his letters make it clear that his interest in botany was thoroughly scientific. If his work were extant, he would probably shine as a discoverer of new species, especially among alpines, for his figures indicate that he was acquainted with a number of plants which Del Clues, Caspar Bohin and others were the first to describe. Among Gessner's numerous scientific correspondents was Jean Bohin, a brilliant young man, 25 years his junior. Their acquaintance began when Bohin was only 18, but, in spite of his friend's youth, Gessner consulted him in botanical difficulties, describing him as Irutitissimus et Ornatissimus juvenis. Jean Bohin was the son of a French doctor, a native of Amiens, who had been converted to Protestantism by reading the Latin translation of the New Testament prepared by Erasmus. In consequence of his change of faith, he was subjected to religious persecution, which he avoided by retreating to Switzerland, where his sons Jean and Gaspard were born. The medical tradition seems to have been remarkably strong in the family. Both Jean and Gaspard became doctors. Gaspard, whose son also entered the profession, being, in fact, the second of six generations of physicians. For two hundred years, an unbroken succession of members of the family were medical men. After Jean Bohen had studied for a time at the University of Basel, he went to Tübingen, where he learned botany from Leonhard Fuchs. From Tübingen, he proceeded to Zurich and accompanied Gessner on some journeys in the Alps. After further travel on his own account, and a period at the University of Montpellier, he reached Lyons, where he came in contact with Théale Champs, who engaged him to assist with the Histoire de Plante. Bohin began to occupy himself with his work, but his Protestantism proved a stumbling block to his life there, and he was obliged to quit France. Jean Bohin's chief botanical work, the Histoire Universale des Plantes, was a most ambitious undertaking, which he did not live to see published. However, his son-in-law, Scherler, a physician of Basel, who had helped him in preparing it, brought out a preliminary sketch of it in 1619, and in 1650 and 1651, the magnum opus itself was published under the name of Historia Plantarum Universalis. This book is a compilation from all sources and includes descriptions of 5,000 plants. The figures, of which there are more than 3,500, are small and badly executed. A large proportion of them are ultimately derived from those of Fuchs. Jean Bohin's more famous brother, Gaspard, was born in 1560 and was thus the younger by 19 years. Gaspard studied at Basel, Padua, Montpellier, 
Paris, and Tübingen. He also travelled in Italy, making observations about the flora and becoming acquainted with scientific men. Unfortunately, he missed being a pupil of Leonhard Fuchs, since his sojourn at Tübingen took place some years after the death of the famous herbalist, who had been his brother's teacher. The illness and death of his father in 1582 made it necessary for him to settle in Basel, where he became professor of botany and anatomy, and eventually of medicine. Inspired by the example of his brother, he conceived the plan of collecting, in a single work, all that had been previously written upon plants, and especially of drawing up a concordance of all the names given by different authors to the same species. His extensive early travels served as a good preparation for this task, since he had not only observed and collected widely, but had established relations with the best botanists in Europe. He formed a herbarium of about 4,000 plants, including specimens from correspondents in many countries, even Egypt and the East Indies. Besides, steady bearing directly on his great project, he accomplished a considerable amount of critical and editorial work, which also had its value in relation to his main plan. There is a marked parallelism between the careers of the Bohin brothers, for Gaspard's great work underwent much the same vicissitudes as that of Gion. The main part of Gaspard's chief work never saw the light at all, although his son brought out one instalment of it many years after his father's death. Gaspard was, however, more fortunate than Jean, in that he lived to see the publication of three important preliminary volumes as the result of his researches, and it is on these that his reputation rests. The Prodromos Theatri Botanici of 1620 consisted of descriptions of 600 species, which the author regarded as new, although several had, as a matter of fact, been already described by Del Clues. Figures of about 140 species are given, two of which are here reproduced. One of these, the potato, still retains the name of Solanum tuberosum, which Bohin gave to it. He had previously published a description of this plant in an earlier work, the Phytopinax of 1596. In 1623, Gaspard Bohin brought out his most important botanical work, the Pinax Theatri Botanici. By this date, owing to the number of different names bestowed upon the same plant by different authors and the varying identifications of those described by the ancients, the subject of plant nomenclature had been reduced to a condition of woeful confusion. Bohin's Pinax converted chaos into order since it contained the first complete and methodical concordance of the names of plants, and was so authoritative as to earn for the author the title of Legislature in Botanique. The work, which dealt with about 6,000 plants, was recognized as preeminent for many years. Morrison criticized the scheme of arrangement on which it was based, but adopted its nomenclature, as also did Ray. Tournefort also retained, as far as possible, the names of the genera and species used in the Painax. As Sackers long ago pointed out, this work is the first and, for that time, a completely exhaustive book of synonyms and is still indispensable for the history of individual species. No small praise to be given to a work that is more than 250 years old. Gaspard Bohin deserves great honour as the first to introduce some degree of order into the chaotic muddle of nomenclature and synonymy. The special merits of his work, more especially his power of concise and lucid description, and his faculty for systematic arrangement, may perhaps be attributed to his French blood, since such qualities are markedly characteristic of French scientific writing. It is much to be regretted that the two brothers Bohin should have carried on their work independently and separately, considering that they had in view practically identical objects, objects in which each only achieved a partial success. It seems as if a work of much greater value might have resulted if they had joined forces. End of chapter number 4, part 4
A Chapter in the History of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution. A Chapter in the History of Botany by Agnes Arbor. Section 4, The Botanical Renaissance of the 16th and 17th Centuries, Part 5, The Herbal in France. France, excluding the French Netherlands, does not seem at first sight to have contributed a great deal towards the development of the herbal in the 16th and 17th centuries, but it must be remembered that Jean and Gaspard Bohin and the publisher Christophe Plantin were French by extraction, though Switzerland and Holland were their countries by adoption. Most of the important herbals published in other languages were translated into French quite early in their history, sometimes in a modified form, so that France in the 16th century was probably by no means backward in botanical knowledge. One such adaptation was L'Histoire des Plantes by Geoffroy Linossier, which was founded in part on the works of Fuchs and Mattioli. A well-known name among the earlier French writers is that of Jean Ruel, or Jonas Rulius, as he is commonly called, 1474 to 1537. He was a physician and a professor in the University of Paris, and chiefly devoted himself to the emending and explaining of Dioscorides. He also wrote a general botanical treatise, De Natura Stirpium, which first appeared in Paris in 1536, this work, which is without illustrations, is intended mainly to elucidate the ancient writers. The most famous of the French herbalists was Jacques de la Champs, whose magnum opus, which appeared in 1586, formed a compendium of much of the material which had been contributed by the different nations. He was born at Cannes in 1513, and after studying medicine at Montpellier, entered upon the practice of it at Lyons, where he remained until his death in 1588. De Lachamp's great work is generally called the Historia Plantarum Lugdunensis. Curiously enough, the author's name is not mentioned on the title page. From the preface, one would gather that Johannes Molineus, or de Molins, was the chief author. However, judging by the way in which the book was quoted by contemporary writers, there appears to be little doubt that de la Champs was really responsible for it, though assisted at different times by Jean Bohin and de Molins. The Historia Plantarum had numerous faults, but it was at the time the most complete universal flora that existed. It contained about 2,700 figures, but both in drawing and woodcutting, they show marked inferiority to much of the earlier work. End of chapter 4, part 5section nine of herbalts their origin and evolution a chapter in the history of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org herbalts their origin and evolution a chapter in the history of botany by yakni saba chapter four the botanical renaissance of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries part six the herbal in England. The greatest name among British herbalists of the Renaissance period is that of William Turner, physician and divine, the father of British botany. He was a North Countryman, a native of Morpeth in Northumberland, where he was born probably between 1510 and 1515. He received his education at what is now Pembroke College in Cambridge. Pembroke deserves to be especially held in honour by botanists, for a hundred years later, Nehemiah Grew, who was as preeminent among British botanists of the 17th century as Turner was among those of the 16th, also became a student at this college. Like so many of the early botanists, William Turner was closely associated with the Reformation. He embraced the views of his friends and instructors at Cambridge, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, and fought for the Reformed faith throughout his life, both with pen and by word of mouth. His caustic wit was also used with almost equal vehemence, to attack the abuses which crept into his own party. 
A ban was put upon his writings in the reign of Henry the Eighth, and for a time he suffered imprisonment. But when Edward the Sixth came to the throne, his fortunes improved, and after a long and tedious period of waiting for preferment, he obtained the deanery of Wells. Difficulty in ejecting the previous dean caused much delay in obtaining possession of the house, and Turner lamented bitterly that, in the small and crowded temporary lodging, I cannot go to my book, for ye crying of children and noise it is made in my chamber. A clergyman's life must have been full of unwelcome vicissitudes in those days, if Turner's career was at all typical. During Mary's reign he was a fugitive, and the former dean of Wells was reinstated. However, when Elizabeth ascended the throne, the position was reversed, and Turner came back to Wells, the usurper, as he calls his rival, being ejected. But his triumph was short-lived, for in 1564 he was suspended for non-conformity. His controversial methods were violent in the extreme, and he seems to have been a thorn in the flesh of his superiors. The Bishop of Bath and Wells wrote on one occasion that he was much encumbered with Mr. Dr. Turner, Dean of Wells, for his undiscreet behaviour in the pulpit, where he met with, with all matters, and unseemly speaketh of all estates, more than is standing with discretion. Christian doctrine was by no means the only subject that occupied Turner's attention. He had taken a medical degree, either at Ferrara or Bologna, and in the reign of Edward VI he was a physician to the Duke of Somerset, the protector. He had travelled much in Italy, Switzerland, Holland and Germany, at the periods when his religious opinions excluded him from England. One of the great advantages which he reaped from his wanderings was the opportunity of studying botany at Bologna under Luca Gini, who was also the teacher of Cesalpino. Another savant with whom he became acquainted on the continent was Conrad Gessner, whom he visited at Zurich, and with whom he maintained a warm friendship. He also corresponded with Leonard Fuchs. Turner's earliest botanical work was the Libellus de Re Habaria Novus, 1538, which is the first book in which localities for many of our native British plants are placed on record. In 1548, this was followed by another little work. The names of herbs in Greek, Latin, English, Dutch and French, with the common names that herbaries and apothecaries use. In the preface to this book, Turner tells us that he had projected a Latin herbal, and had indeed written it, but refrained from publishing it because when he asked the advice of physicians in this matter, their advice was that I should cease from setting out of this book in Latin till I had seen those places of England, wherein is most plenty of herbs, that I might in my herbal declare to the great honour of our country what number of sovereign and strange herbs were in England that were not in other nations, whose counsel I have followed deferring to set up my herbal in Latin, till that I have seen the West Country, which I never saw yet in all my life, which country of all places of England, as I here say, is most richly replenished with all kinds of strange and wonderful works and gifts of nature, as are stones, herbs, fishes and metals. He explains that while waiting to complete his herbal, he has been advised to publish his little book, in which he has set forth the names of plants. He adds, And because men should not think that I write of that I never saw, and that apothecaries should be excuseless when as the right herbs are required of them, I have showed in what places of England, Germany and Italy the herbs grow, and may be had for labour and money. Turner's Chef de Ouvre was his Herbel, published in three instalments, the first in London in 1551, the first and second together at Cologne in 1562, during his exile in the reign of Mary, and the third part, together with the preceding, in 1568. The title of the first part runs as follows. A new herbal, wherein are contained the names of herbs, with the properties, degrees and natural places of the same, gathered and made by William Turner, physician unto Duke of Somerset's grace. The figures illustrating the herbal are, for the most part, the same as those in the octavo edition of Fuchs's work, published in 1545. The dedication of the herbal, in its completed form, to Queen Elizabeth, throws some light on Turner's life, and, incidentally, on that illustrious lady herself. The doctor recalls, with pardonable pride and perhaps a touch of blarney, an occasion on which the Princess Elizabeth, as she then was, had conversed with him in Latin. 
As for your knowledge in the Latin tongue, he writes, eighteen years ago or more, I had in the Duke of Somerset's house, being his physician at that time, a good trial thereof, when as it pleased your grace to speak Latin unto me, for although I have both in England, Low and High Germany, and other places of my long travel and pilgrimage, never spoke with any noble or gentlewoman that spoke so well and so much congru, fine and pure Latin, as your grace did unto me so long ago. Turner defends himself against the insinuation that a book in treating only of trees, herbs and wheats and shrubs is not a met present for a prince. And certainly, if we accept his account of the state of knowledge at the time, the need for such a book must have been most urgent. He explains that, while he was still at Pembroke Hall, Cambridge, he endeavoured to learn the names of plants, but such was the ignorance and symbols at that time, that he could get no information on the subject, even from physicians. He claims that his herbal has considerable originality, a claim which seems well founded. In his own words, They that have read the first part of my herbal, and have compared my writings of plants with those things that Martiolus, Fuxius, Tragus, and Dodoneus wrote in their first editions of the herbals, may easily perceive that I taught the truth of certain plants, which these above-named writers either knew not at all, or else erred in them greatly. So it, as I learned something of them, so they either might or did learn something of me again, as the second editions may testify. And because I would not be like unto a crier, it crieth a lost horse in the market, and telleth all the marks and tokens that he hath, and yet never saw the horse, neither could know the horse if we saw him, I went into Italy and into diverse parts of Germany to know and see the herbs myself. This herbal contains many evidences of Turner's independence of thought. He fought against what he regarded as superstition and science, with the same ardour with which he entered upon religious polemics. The legend of the human form of the mandrake receives scant mercy at his hands. As he points out, the roots which are counterfeited and made like little puppets and mammoths which come to be sold in England in boxes with air and such form as man hath are nothing else but foolish faint trifles and not natural. For they are so trimmed of crafty thieves to mock the poor people with all and to rob them of both their wit and their money. I have in my time at diverse times taken up the roots of mandrake out of the ground, but I never saw any such thing upon or in them, as are in and upon the petless roots that are commonly to be sold in boxes. Turner was, however, by no means the first to dispute the mandrake superstition. In the Greta Habal of 1526, it is definitely refuted, and it is ignored in some works that are of even earlier date. The hoax was long lived, for we find Gerard also exposing it in 1597. Turner had a fine scorn for any superstitious notions he detected in the writings of his contemporaries, and seems to have been particularly pleased if he could show that, in any disputed matter, they were wrong, while the ancients, for whom he had great reverence, were right. For instance, he has a great deal to say about a theory, held by Mattioli, in opposition to the opinions of Theophrastus and Dioscorides, that the broom rape, or Obanche, could kill other plants merely by its baneful presence, without any physical contact. He declares that this view is against reason, authority and experience, and points out that the figure which Mattioli gives is faulty in omitting to show the roots, which are the real instruments of destruction. He triumphantly concludes, And as touching experience, I know that the fresh and young Orobanche hath coming out of the great root many little strings, wherewith it taketh hold of the roots of the herbs that grow next unto it, Wherefore Martiolis ought not so lightly to have defaced the authority of Theophrast, so ancient and substantial order. Turner's work is largely occupied with the opinions of early writers, especially Dioscorides, and his respect for their authority is a somewhat curious trait in a character which seems, in other directions, to have been so unorthodox. He did not, however, treat the books as the last word on the subject, and the third part of his herbal is occupied with plans where offers no mention made neither of the old Grecians nor Latins. Turner's herbal is arranged alphabetically, and does not show evidence of any interest in the relationships of the plants. It is as individuals, and essentially as simples, that he regarded them. His descriptions of them were often vividly expressed, though not markedly original. <laughs>
it must be remembered that botany was not the only science which he studied. He wrote about birds, and also contributed information about English fishes to Gessner's Historia Animalium. Before discussing the next herbal which appeared in this country, we may refer in passing to a botanical book which hardly comes under this heading, but which is of interest in relation to the history of the time. Nicholas Monardis, a Spanish physician, had published, in 1569 and 1571, some account of the plants which had lately been brought to Europe from the recently discovered West Indies, and this work was translated into English by John Frampton in 1577, under the title of Joyful News Out of the New Found World. This book contains a good figure of the tobacco plant, text figure 52, perhaps the first ever published, and also a long account on its virtues. The reader is told that the Negroes and Indians, after inhaling tobacco smoke, do remain lightened without any weariness, for to labour again, and they do this with so great pleasure that although they be not weary, yet they are very desirous for to do it, and the thing is come to so much effect that their maesters doth chasten them for it, and do burn the tobacco, because they should not use it. Twenty-seven years after the appearance of the first part of Turner's Herbal, a translation of Dadoan's work, made by Henry Light, appeared in England. Light was born about 1529, and towards the end of the reign of Henry the Eighth, he became a student at Oxford. He was a man of means, addicted to travel, and his temperament seems to have been much milder and less revolutionary than that of his predecessor Turner. He did not perhaps add very greatly to the knowledge of English botany, but he did a valuable service in introducing the Doan's herbal into this country. His book, which was published in 1578, was professedly a translation of the French version of the Doan's Kreuderbock of 1554, which had been made by de Lecluse in 1557. Light's copy of this work, with copious manuscript notes, and on the title page, the quaint endorsement, Henry Light taught me to speak English, is preserved in the British Museum. This copy proves that Light was no mere mechanical translator, for the work is annotated and corrected with great care, references to Della Bell and Turner being introduced. The title of Light's book is as follows. A new herbal or history of plants, wherein is contained the whole discourse and perfect description of all sorts of herbs and plants, their diverse and sundry kinds, their strange figures, fashions and shapes, their names, natures, operations and virtues, and that not only of those which are here growing in this our country of England, but of all others also of foreign realms, commonly used in physic. First set forth in the Dutch or Almain tongue by that learned D. Rambert Dodoens, physician to the emperor, and now first translated out of French into English by Henry Light Esquire. The illustrations used in the book were the same as those which had appeared in the translation by de Lecluse, and were, for the most part, copies of those in the Octavo edition of Fox's Herbal, with some additional blocks, which had been cut specially for the Doans. The result is that many of the same figures occur both in Turner and in Light. There are said to be 870 figures in Light's Herbal, of which about 30 are new. Of the latter, Centauria Raponticum is an example, text figure 53. Light occasionally adds a criticism of his own in a different type from that used in the main body of the text. At the beginning of the book, there is a long set of doggerel verses, in commendation of this work, which imply that Rambert de Doens himself made additions to the English translation. The most important stanza is the following. Great was his toil, which first this work did frame, and so was his, which went it to translate it. For when he had full finished all the same, he minded not to add, nor to abate it, but what he found he meant whole to relate it, till Rambert he did send additions store, for to augment light's travel past before. We now come to John Gerard, Plate Twelve, the best known of all the English herbalists, but who, it must be confessed, scarcely deserves the fame which has fallen to his share. Gerard, a native of Cheshire, was a master in chirurgery, but was better known as a remarkably successful gardener. For twenty years he supervised the gardens belonging to Lord Burley in the Strand, and at Theobald's in Hertfordshire, besides having himself a famous garden in Holborn, then the most fashionable district of London. In 1596 
he published a list of plants which he cultivated in Holborn, which is interesting as being the first complete catalogue ever published of the contents of a single garden. Gerard's reputation rests, however, on a much larger work, the Herbal or General History of Plants, printed by John Norton in 1597. But the manner in which this book originated does the author little credit. It seems that Norton, the publisher, had commissioned a certain Dr. Priest to translate de Doen's final work, the Pemtardis, of 1583, into English, but Priest died before the work was finished. Gerard simply adopted Priest's translation, completed it, and published it as his own, merely altering the arrangement from that of de Doen's to that of de la Belle. He adds insult to injury by gratuitously remarking, in an address to the reader at the beginning of the herbal, that Dr. Priest, one of our London college, hath, as I heard, translated the last edition of Dodonius, which meant to publish the same, but being prevented by death, his translation likewise perished. After the manner of the period, the herbal is embellished with a number of prefatory letters, in one of which, written by Stephen Bradwell, the statement occurs which is so inconsistent with Gerard's own remarks that he certainly committed an oversight in allowing it to stand. In Bradwell's words, D. Priest, for this translation of so much of Dodoneus, hath hereby left at home for this honourable sepulture. Master Gerard, coming last, but not the least, hath in many ways accommodated the whole work onto our English nation. The Herbal is a massive volume, in clear Roman type, contrasting markedly with a black letter used in the works of Turner and Light, and giving the book a much more modern appearance. It contains about 1,800 woodcuts, nearly all from blocks used by Tabernay Montanus in his Iconus of 1590, which Norton obtained from Frankfurt, less than 1% are original. There is an illustration representing the Virginian potato, which appears to be new, and is perhaps the first figure of this plant ever published, text figure 60. Gerard did not know enough about botany to couple the wood blocks of Tabernay Montanos with their appropriate descriptions, and Delabelle was requested by the printer to correct the author's blunders. This he did, according to his own account, in very many places, but yet not so many as he wished, since Gerard became impatient and summarily stopped the process of emendation on the ground that Delabelle had forgotten his English. After this episode, the relations between the two botanists seem not unnaturally, to have become somewhat strained. Gerard evidently aimed at conveying information in simple language, for in one place, where he speaks of a preparation being skirted into the ice, he apologises for the colloquialism, explaining that he does not wish to be over-eloquent among gentlewomen, unto whom especially my works are most necessary. The value of Gerard's work must inevitably be at a discount, when we realise that it is impossible, from internal evidence, to accept him as a credible witness. His oft-quoted account of the goose tree, barnacle tree or the tree bearing geese, removes what little respect one may have felt for him as a scientist, not so much because he held an absurd belief, which was widely accepted at the time, but rather because he went out of his way to state that it was confirmed by his own observations. He gives a figure to illustrate the origin of the geese, text figure 54, which is not, however, original. Gerard relates how trees, actually bearing shells which open and hatch out barnacle geese, occur in the orchids, but he states that on this point he has no first knowledge. He proceeds, however, to remark, But what our eyes have seen, and hands have touched, we shall declare. There is a small island in Lancashire, called the Pile of Fowlers, wherein are found the broken pieces of old and bruised ships, somewhere off have been cast thither by shipwreck, and also the trunks or bodies, with the branches of old and rotten trees, cast up there likewise, whereon is found a certain spume, or froth, that in time breedeth unto certain shells, in shape like those of the muscle, but sharper pointed, and of a whitish colour, wherein is contained a thing in form like a lace of silk finely woven, as it were together, of a whitish colour, one end whereof is fastened unto the inside of the shell, even as the fish of oysters and mussels are, the other end is made fast unto the belly of a root mass or lump, which in time cometh to the shape and form of a bird. When it is perfectly formed, the shell gapeth open, and the first thing that appeareth is the forset lace or string. Next come the legs of the bird hanging out, and as it groweth greater, 
it openeth the shell by degrees, till at length it is all come forth, and hangeth only by the bill. In short space after it cometh to full maturity, and falleth into the sea, where it gathereth feathers, and groweth to a fowl, bigger than a mallet, and lesser than a goose. The fable of the goose tree was rejected in the later editions of Gerard's Herbal, published after the author's death. It reappears, however, later in the 17th century, in the Historia Naturalis of John Johnson. The legend is of respectable antiquity, being found in various early chronicles. Sebastian Minster, for example, in his Cosmographia, printed at Basel in 1545, refers to it as recorded by previous writers, and figures a tree with pendant fruits, out of which geese are dropping into a lake or stream. Hector Boethius, Boeke, in his Scottish chronicle, gives a quaint account of the origin of the geese from driftwood in the sea. In the small bodies in Hollis, of which grow small worms. First they shaw their head and fate, and last of all they shaw their plum and wings. Finally, when they are coming to the just measure and quantity of geese, they fly into the air as other fowls do. It is rather surprising to find that William Turner was a believer in the same myth, although, unlike Gerard, he took great pains to satisfy himself of the truth of the story, which he seems to have approached with quite an open mind. His account is as follows. When after a certain time the firwood masts or planks of yard arms of a ship have rotted on the sea, then fungi, as it were, break out upon them first, in which in course of time one may discern evident forms of birds, which afterwards are clothed in feathers, and at last become alive and fly. Now lest this should seem fabulous to anyone, besides the common evidence of all the long shoremen of England, Ireland and Scotland, that renowned historian Geraldus bears witness that the generation of the Bernicles is none other than this. But inasmuch as it seemed heartfully safe to trust the vulgar, and by reason of the rarity of the thing, I did not quite credit Geraldus. I took counsel of a certain man, whose upright conduct, often proved by me, had justified my trust, a theologian by profession and an Irishman by birth, Octavian by name, whether he thought Geraldus worthy of belief in this affair, who, taking oath upon the very gospel which he taught, answered that what Geraldus had reported of the generation of this bird was absolutely true, and that with his own eyes he had beholden young, as yet but rudely formed, and also handled them, and if I were to stay in London for a month or two, that he would take care that some growing chicks should be brought in to me. The goose tree is also figured by De La Belle and De Alichams, but it is refreshing to find that Colonna, in his Futo 1592, flatly denies the truth of the legend. The importance of Gerard's herbal in the history of botany is chiefly due to an improved edition, brought out by Thomas Johnson in 1633, 36 years after the work was originally published. Johnson was an apothecary in London, and cultivated a physic garden on Snow Hill. His first botanical work was a short account of the plants collected by members of the apothecary's company on an excursion in Kent. This is of interest as being the earliest memoir of the kind published in England. Later on, descriptions of botanical tours in the west of England and in Wales appeared from his pen. But it is as the editor of Gerard that he is chiefly remembered. He greatly enlarged the herbal and illustrated it with Plantin's woodcuts. His edition contained an account of no less than 2,850 plants. Johnson also corrected numerous errors, and the whole work, transformed by him, rose to a much higher grade of value. It was reprinted without alteration in 1636. When the civil wars broke out, Johnson, who is said to have been a man of great personal courage, joined the Royalists. He took an active part in the defence of Basinghouse, and received a shot wound during the siege, from which he died. John Parkinson, 1567 to 1650, may be regarded as the last British herbalist of the period we are considering, whose work was of any great interest from the botanical point of view. His portrait is shown in plate 13. Like Gerard and Johnson, he cultivated a famous garden in London. In these days of bricks and mortar, it is hard to realise that gardens of such importance flourished in Holborn, Snow Hill and Long Acre respectively. Another important London garden of the period was that of Lambeth, belonging to John Tredescent, gardener to Charles I. 
Parkinson became apothecary to James I and botanist to Charles I. The early of the two books, by which he is remembered, was rather of the nature of a gardening work than of a herbal. It appeared in 1629 under the title Paradisi in Sola Paradisus Terrestris, a garden of all sorts of pleasant flowers which our English eye will permit to be nursed up, together with the right ordering planting and preserving of them and their uses and virtues. It has lately become accessible in the form of a facsimile reprint. The words Paradisi and Sole form a pun upon the author's name, and may be translated of Park in Sun. The book was dedicated to Queen Henrietta Maria, with the prayer that she will accept this speaking garden. The preface to this work is entirely at variance, with the idea that scientific knowledge has only been gradually acquired by the human race. In Parkinson's words, God, the creator of heaven and earth, at the beginning when he created Adam, inspired him with the knowledge of all natural things, which successively descended to Noah afterwards, and to his posterity. For as he was able to give names to all the living creatures, according to their several natures, so no doubt but he had also the knowledge, both what herbs and fruits were fit, either for meat or medicine, for use or for delight. Elaborate directions for the planting and treatment of a garden precede an account of a large number of plants cultivated at that time, with some mention of their uses. The book is illustrated with full-page wood engravings, of no great merit, in each of which a number of different plants are represented. Text figure 55 is taken from part of one illustration. The figures are partly original and partly copied from the books of Delacluse, Delabelle and others. In 1640, Parkinson followed up this work with a much larger volume, dealing with plants in general, and called the Theatrum Botanicum, the Theatre of Plants, or an herbal of a large extent. He complains that the publication of the work has been delayed, partly through the disastrous times, but chiefly through the machinations of wretched and perverse men. According to the preface to the Paradisus Terrestris, the author's original idea was merely to supplement his description of the flower garden by an account of a garden of simples. This scheme grew into one of a more extensive and general nature, but without losing the predominant medical interest which would have characterised the work as originally planned. In accordance with his intention, the virtues of the herbs are dealt with in great detail. Parkinson's herbal is in some ways an improvement on that of Johnson and Gerard. Almost the whole of Bohin's Peanuts is incorporated, with the result that the account of the nomenclature of each plant becomes very full and detailed. Many of Delabelle's manuscript notes are also inserted. The scheme of classification adopted is, however, markedly inferior to that of Delabelle. Occasionally, in spite of his comparatively late date, Parkinson displays an imagination that is truly medieval. He is eloquent on the subject of that rare and precious commodity, the horn of the unicorn, which is a cure for many bodily ills. He describes the animal as living far remote from these parts and in huge vast wildernesses, among other most fierce and wild beasts. He discusses also the use of the powder of mummies as a medicine, and his description is enlivened with a picture of an embalmed corpse. The illustrations to the Theatrum Botanicum are of no importance, being chiefly copied from those of Gerard. The great British botanists who follow next upon Parkinson in point of time are Robert Morrison, born 1620, and John Ray, born 1627 but as their chief works appeared after the close of the period selected for special study in this book, 1470 to 1670, and as they were botanists in the modern sense rather than herbalists, we will not attempt any discussion of their writings. While Morrison and Ray were advancing the subject of systematic botany, Nehemiah Grew and the Italian Marcello Malpighi, born respectively in 1641 and 1628, were laying the foundations of the science of plant anatomy. Their work, also, is outside the scope of the present book, and it is only mentioned at this point in order to show that the latter part of the 17th century witnessed a considerable revolution in the science. From this period onwards, with the opening up of new lines of inquiry, the importance of the herbal steadily declined, and though books which come under this heading were produced even in the 19th century, the day of their preeminence was over. End of chapter 4, part 6
Recording by Mocha. Section 10 of Herbalt's Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the history of botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Herbalt's The Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the history of botany, by Yakni Zaba. Chapter 4. Of the Botanical Renaissance of the 16th and 17th Centuries. Part 7. The Revival of Aristotelian Botany. The subject of Aristotelian Botany scarcely comes within the scope of a book on herbals, but at the same time it cannot be sharply separated from the botany of the herbalists. It therefore seems desirable to make a brief reference at this point to its chiefly 16th century exponent, the Italian savant Andrea Cesalpino, 1519-1603, and to one or two other writers whose point of view was similar. We have already shown that, in the Middle Ages, Albertus Magnus carried on the tradition of Aristotle and Theophrastus. At the time of the Renaissance, there was again a revival of this aspect of the study, as well as of a branch with which we are here more immediately concerned, that, namely, which deals with plants from the standpoint of medicine and natural history. Chesalpino, plate 14, it is true was largely concerned, like the herbalists, with the mere description of plants, but the fame of his great work, De Plantis Libri 16, 1583, rests upon the first book, which contains an account of the theory of botany on Aristotelian lines. Chesalpino's strength lay in the fact that he took a remarkably broad view of the subject, and approached it as a trained thinker. He had learned the best lesson Greek thought had to offer to the scientific worker, the knowledge of how to think. He had, however, the defects of his qualities, and his reverence for the classics led him into an inelastic and over-literal acceptance of Aristotelian conceptions. The chief tangible contribution which Cesalpino made to botanical science was his insistence on the prime importance of the organs of fructification. This was the idea on which he chiefly laid stress in his system of classification, to which we shall return in a later chapter. A botanist who had something in common with Chesalpino was the bohemian author Adam Saluzianski von Saluzian, 1558-1613. His most important work was the Methodi Herbarie Libris Tres, published at Prague in 1592. As a herbal, it does not rank high, since Saluzianski neither recorded any new plans, nor gave the bohemian localities for those already known. But it opens with a survey of botany in general, which is of interest as showing an approach to the modern scientific standpoint, and so far as the author pleads for the treatment of botany as a separate subject, and not as a mere branch of medicine. His remarks on this point may be translated as follows. It is customary to connect medicine with botany, yet scientific treatment demands that we should consider each separately. For the fact is that in every art, Theory must be disconnected and separated from practice, and the two must be dealt with singly and individually in their proper order before they are united. And for that reason, an order that botany, which is, as it were, a special branch of physics, may form a unit by itself before it can be brought into connection with other sciences, it must be divided and unyoked from medicine. Guy de la Brosse, a French writer of the 17th century, discusses the sorts of plans and related topics, quite in the manner of the Aristotelian school. In his book, De la Nature, Vertu et Utilité des Plantes, dedicated to Monsignor le Très Illustre, et le Très Reverend Cardinal Monsieur le Cardinal de Richelieu, he treats a variation within single species, the sensitiveness of plants, the chemistry and properties, and many other topics. His work is full of interest, but a discussion of it would lead us beyond the bounds of our present subject. End of chapter 4, part 7. Recording by Mocha. Chapter 5. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution. A chapter in the history of botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the history of botany, by Agnes Arbor, 1519-1603.
Chapter 5. The Evolution of the Art of Plant Description Probably one of the chief objects which the early herbalists had in view in writing their books was to enable the reader to identify various medicinal plants. Nevertheless, until well into the 16th century, their drawings were so conventional and their descriptions left so much to be desired that it must have been an almost impossible task to arrive at the names of plants by their aid alone. The idea which suggests itself is that a knowledge of the actual plant was, in practice, transmitted by word of mouth, and that the herbals were only used as reference books to ascertain the reputed qualities of herbs, with whose appearance the reader was already quite familiar. If this supposition is correct, it perhaps accounts for the very primitive state in which the art of plant description remained during the earlier period of the botanical renaissance. When we turn to the Aristotelian school, we find that the writings of Theophrastus include certain plant descriptions, which, although they seem somewhat rudimentary when judged by modern standards, are greatly in advance of those contained in the first printed herbals, the medieval philosopher Albertus Magnus, who, as we have already pointed out, was a follower of Aristotle and Theophrastus, also showed marked originality in his description of flowers, and drew attention to a number of points which appear to have escaped the notice of many more recent writers. For instance, in describing the flower of the Borage, he distinguished the green calyx, the corolla with its ligular outgrowths, the five stamens, and the central pistil, though naturally he failed to understand the function of the latter organs. He observed that in the lily the calyx was absent, but that the petals themselves showed transitions from green to white. He noticed the early fall of the calyx in the poppy and its persistence until the ripening of the fruit in the rose. On the subject of floral astivation, his observations were surprisingly advanced. He pointed out that the successive whorls of sepals and petals alternated with one another and concluded that this was a device for the better protection of the flower. Albertus further classified the various forms of flower under three types. 1. Bird form, e.g. aquilegia, viola, and lamium. 2. Pyramid and bell form. 3. Star form. When we leave the early Aristotelian botanists and turn to those who studied the subject primarily from the medical point of view, we find a great falling off in the power of description. The accounts of the plants in the Materia Medica of Dioscorides, for example, are so brief and meager that only those with the most marked characteristics can be identified with certainty. The herbarium of Apuleius Platonicus, the earliest work to which the term herbal is generally applied, scarcely makes any attempt at describing the plants to which it refers. Such a paragraph as the following gives an account of a plant which, compared with most of the other descriptions in the herbal, may fairly be called precise and full. Quote, this wart, which is named radiolus, by another name, everfern, is like fern, and it is produced in stony places and in old house steads, and it has on each leaf two rows of fair spots, and they shine like gold. End quote. The group of late 15th century herbals, which we discussed in chapter 2, the Latin and German herbarius and the Hortus sanitatus, are like in giving very brief and inadequate accounts of the characters of the plants enumerated, although their descriptions often have a certain naive charm. It is scarcely worthwhile to give actual examples of their methods. It will perhaps suffice to quote a few specimens from the English Great Herbal, which is a work of much the same class. The wood sorrel is dealt with as follows, quote, This herb groweth in three places, and specially in hedges, woods, and under walls, sides, and hath leaves like leaved grass, and hath a sour smell as sorrel, and hath a yellow flower. As another example, we may cite the chicory, 
which is described as having, quote, croaked and writhen stalks, and the flower is of a color of the sky, end quote. Of the water lilies, we receive a still more generalized account. Quote, Nenufar is an herb that groweth in water, and hath large leaves, and hath a flower in manner of a rose. The root thereof is called trumien, and is very big. It is of two manners. One is white, and another yellow. Occasionally we meet with a hint of more detailed observation. For instance, the colored central flower in the umbel of the carrot is mentioned, though in terms that sound somewhat strange to the modern botanist. We read that it, quote, hath a large flower, and in the middle thereof a little reed prick, end quote. It is somewhat remarkable that Banks's herbal, though originally published a year earlier than the first edition of The Great Herbal, shows a slight but distinct superiority in the matter of description. See page 38. Perhaps this is to be connected with the fact that Banks's herbal is without illustrations. But even if we allow that the descriptions in Banks's herbal occasionally seize on salient features, it must be admitted that they still leave a great deal to the imagination. As two typical examples, which are perhaps as good as any in the book, we may take those of Tutsun and of Shepherd's Purse. Of the first, the herbalist writes, quote, This herb hath leaves some del reed like unto ye leaves of orange, and this herb hath sinews on his leaves as hath plantain, and it hath yellow flowers, and beareth black berries, and it groweth in dry woods. Of Shepherd's Purse, he says, quote, this herb hath a small stalk and full of branches and ragged leaves and a white flower. The cods thereof be like a purse. End quote. The herbarium vive a conus of Otto Brunfels, 1530, was the first herbal illustrated with drawings, which are throughout both beautiful and true to nature. The descriptions, on the other hand, are quite unworthy of the figures being mostly borrowed from earlier writers. The wonderful excellence of the woodblocks with which the German fathers of botany enriched their books was, in our sense, an actual hindrance to the development of the art of plant description. Since the pencil of the draftsman could represent every subtlety in the characteristic form of a plant, the botanist might well be excused for thinking that to take the trouble to set beside the drawing a precise verbal description of the plant in question was a work of supererogation. However, in another sense, the draftsmen indirectly helped the cause of scientific accuracy in what, for want of a better expression, may be called word painting. There is no doubt that constant critical examination of the artist's work must have tended to educate the eye of the botanist who supervised his efforts, and to increase his perception of delicate shades of difference or similarity of form which he might never have noticed or attempted to express in words if the draftsman had not, as it were, lent him his trained eyesight. The next great worker, Hieronymus Bach, differs from Brunfels in the comparative unimportance of his contributions to plant illustration and the relatively great value of his text. His descriptions of flowers and fruits are excellent, and the way in which he indicates the general habit is often masterly. As an example, we may quote his description of mistletoe plants, which may be translated as follows, quote, They grow almost in the shape of a cluster, with many forks and articulations. The whole plant is light green, the leaves are fleshy, plump, and thick, larger than those of the box. They flower in the beginning of spring. The flowers are, however, very small and yellow in color. From them develop, towards autumn, small, round, white berries, very like those on the wild gooseberry. These berries are full inside of white, tough lime, yet each berry has its small black grain, as if it were the seed, which, however, does not grow when sown, for, as I have said above, the mistletoe only originates and develops on trees. In winter, mistle thrushes seek their food from the mistletoe, but in summer they are caught with it, 
or bird lime, is commonly made from its bark. Thus, the mistletoes are both beneficial and harmful to birds. In De Historia Stirpium, the great Latin work of Leonard Fuchs, the plant descriptions are brief and of little importance, being frequently taken word for word from previous writers. This book, however, is notable in possessing a full glossary of the technical terms used, which is of importance as being the first contribution of the kind to botanical literature. We may translate two examples at random to show the style of Fuchs's definitions. Quote, Stamens are the points, apices, that shoot forth in the middle of the flower cup, calyx, so called because they spring out like threads from the inmost bosom of the flower. Pappus, both to the Greeks and to the Latins, is the fluff which falls from flowers or fruits. So also certain woolly hairs which remain on certain plants when they lose their flowers and afterwards disappear into the air are papi, as happens in Senecio, Sancus, and several others. In the German edition of Fuchs's Herbal, the descriptions are remarkably good for their time, being more methodical than those of Bach though sometimes less lively and picturesque. As an instance of his manner, we may cite his account of the butter burr, of which his woodcut is shown in text figure 58. Quote, the flower of butter burr, he writes, is the first to appear before the plant or leaves. The flower is cluster-shaped with many small, pale, pinkish flowerets, and is like a fine bunch of vine flowers in full bloom to look at. This large cluster-shaped flower has a hollow stalk, at times a span high. It withers and decays without fruit together with the stalk. Then the round, gray, ash-colored leaves appear, which are at first like colt's foot, but afterwards become so large that one leaf will cover a small round table. They are light green on one side and whitish or gray on the other. Each leaf has its own brown, hairy, and hollow stem, on which it sits like a wide hat or a mushroom turned over. The root grows very thick, is white and porous inside, and has a strong, bitter taste. End quote. Our English herbalist, William Turner, is often fresh and effective in his descriptions. He compares the daughter, Cuscuta, to, quote, a great red harp string, end quote, and the seed vessels of shepherds purse to a, quote, Boy's satchel or little bag, end quote. Of the dead nettle, he says, quote, Lamium hath leaves like unto a nettle, but less indented about and whiter. The downy things that are in it like prickles bite not, yet stalk is four square, the flowers are white, and have a strong savor, and are very like unto little coals or hoods that stand over bare heads. The seed is black and groweth about the stalk, certain places going between, as we see in Whorehound, end quote. The three great botanists of the Low Countries, Dodoens, de Lécluse, and de Lobel, were so closely associated that it is hardly necessary to consider their style of plant description individually. Henry Light's well-known herbal of 1578 was a translation of the Histoire des Plantes, which is itself a version by de Lécluse, of the Dutch herbal of Dodoens. We may thus fairly illustrate the style of plant description of this school by a quotation from Light, since it has the advantage of retaining the 16th century flavor, which is so easily lost in a modern translation. As a typical example, we may take a paragraph about the stork's bill, erodium. It will be noticed that it does not represent any great advance upon Fuchs's work. Quote, the kind of geranium or stork's bill, his leaves are cut and jagged in many pieces, like to crowfoot, his stalks be slender and parted into sundry branches, upon which groweth small flowers somewhat like roses, or the flowers of mallows, of a light murray or red color. After them cometh little round heads with small long bills like natals, or like the beaks of cranes and herons, wherein the seed is contained. The root is thick, round, short, and knobby, with certain small strings hanging by it. In his Pemptades of 1583, Dodoens gave a glossary of botanical terms. His definitions suffer, however, 
from vagueness and are not calculated greatly to advance the accurate description of plants. As an example, we may take his account of the flower, which may be translated as follows, quote, The flower we call the joy of trees and plants. It is the hope of fruits to come, for every growing thing, according to its nature, produces offspring and fruit after the flower. But flowers have their own special parts, end quote. The description from the pen of de Lecluse are characterized by a greater fullness and closer attention to flower structure than those of his predecessors. The plant which he calls sedum, or semper vivum magis, of which his woodcut is reproduced in text figure 59, is described as being, quote, a shrub rather than an herb. Occasionally it reaches the height of two cubits, three feet, and is as thick as the human arm with a quantity of twigs as thick as a man's thumb. These spread out into numerous rays of the thickness of a finger. The ends of these terminate in a kind of circle, which is formed by numerous leaves pressing inwards all together and overlapping, just as in sedum vulgare magis. These leaves, however, are fat and full of juice, and shaped like a tongue, and slightly serrated round the edge, with a somewhat astringent flavor. The whole shrub is coated with a thick, fleshy, sappy bark. The outer membrane inclines to a dark color and is speckled, as in Tithalamus caracea. These speckles are simply the remains of leaves which have fallen off. Meanwhile, a thick pedicel, covered with leaves, springs out from the top of the larger branches and bears, so to speak, a thyrsus of many yellow flowers, scattered about like stars, pleasant to behold, and when the flowers begin to ripen and are running to seed, the seed is very small, the pedicel grows slender, but the plant is an evergreen. In Gerard's Herbal of 1597, the descriptions are seldom sufficiently original to be of much interest. We may quote, however, his account of the potato flower, text figure 60, then so great a novelty that in his portrait, plate 12, he is represented holding a spray of it in his hand. It has, he says, quote, very fair and pleasant flowers made of one entire whole leaf, which is folded or plated in such strange sort that it seemeth to be a flower made of six sundry small leaves, which cannot be easily perceived, except the same be pulled open. The color whereof it is hard to express. The whole flower is of a light purple color, stripped down the middle of every fold or welt with a light show of yellowness, as though purple and yellow were mixed together. In the middle of the flower thrustest forth a thick fat pointel, yellow as gold, with a small sharp green prick or point in the midst thereof. The plant descriptions by Valerius Cordus, which were published after his death, are among the best produced in the 16th century, but they are too lengthy for quotation here. So far as the period with which we deal in this book is concerned, the zenith of plant description may be said to be reached in the Prodromos of Gaspar Boin, 1620, in which a high level of terseness and accuracy is attained. As an example, we may translate his description of Beta Cretica Semine Aculeato, of which his drawing is reproduced in text figure 62. Quote, from a short tapering root, by no means fibrous, spring several stalks about 18 inches long. They straggle over the ground and are cylindrical in shape and furrowed, becoming gradually white near the root with a slight coating of down and spreading out into little sprays. The plant has but few leaves, similar to those of Beta nigra, except that they are smaller and supplied with long petioles. The flowers are small and of a greenish yellow. The fruits one can see growing in large numbers close by the root, and from that point they spread along the stalk at almost every leaf. They are rough and tubercled, and separate into three reflexed points. In their cavity one grain of the shape of an Adonis seed is contained. It is slightly rounded and ends in a point, and is covered with a double layer of reddish membrane, the inner one enclosing a white, farinaceous core.
Any great advance on Boant's descriptions could hardly be expected during the period which we are discussing, since it closed before the nature of the essential parts of the flower was really understood. It was not until 1682 that the fact that the stamens are male organs was pointed out in print by Nehemiah Grew, though he himself attributed this discovery to Sir Thomas Millington, a botanist otherwise unknown. Girard's account of the stamens and stigma of the potato as a, quote, pointel, yellow as gold, with a small sharp green prick or point in the middest thereof, end quote, vague as it seems to the 20th century botanist, is by no means to be despised when we remember that the writer was handicapped by complete ignorance of the function of the structures which he saw before him. A further hindrance to improvement in plant description was the lack of a methodical terminology. As we have already shown, both Fuchs and Dodoens attempted glossaries of botanical terms, but these do not seem to have become an integral part of the science. It is a common complaint among non-botanists at the present day that the subject has become incomprehensible to the layman, owing to the excessive use of technical words. There is no doubt some truth in this statement, but on the other hand, a study of the writings of the earlier botanists makes it clear that a description of a plant couched in ordinary language, in which the botanical meaning of the terms employed has been subjected to no rigid definition, often breaks down completely on all critical points. It is to Joachim Young and to Linnaeus that we owe the foundations of an accurate terminology now at the disposal of the botanist when he sets out to describe a new plant. The published work of these two writers belongs, however, to the late 17th and 18th century, and is thus outside the scope of the present volume. End of chapter 5section 12 of herbals their origin and evolution a chapter in the history of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand herbals their origin and evolution a chapter in the history of botany by agnes arbor chapter 6 the evolution of plant classification in the earliest european works on natural history those of the aristotelian school we meet with an attempt to classify the different varieties of plants it was inevitable that the writers of this school should make such an attempt since no mind trained in greek philosophy could be content to leave a science in the condition of a mere chaos of isolated descriptions at first, the most obvious distinction, that of size, was used as the chief criterion whereby to separate the different groups of the vegetable kingdom. In The History of Plants by Theophrastus, we find trees, shrubs, bushes, and herbs treated as definite classes, within which cultivated and wild plants are distinguished. The other distinctions of lower value are made between evergreen and deciduous, fruiting and fruitless, and flowering and flowerless plants. Albertus Magnus, who kept alive in the Middle Ages the spirit of Aristotelian botany, was more advanced than Theophrastus in his method of classification. It is true that he divides the vegetable world into trees, shrubs, undershrubs, bushes, herbs, and fungi, but at the same time he points out that this is an arbitrary scheme, since these groups cannot always be distinguished from one another, and also because the same plant may belong to different classes at different periods of its life. A study of the writings of Albertus reveals the fact that he had in mind, though he did not clearly state it, a much more highly evolved system, which may be diagrammatically represented as follows. The modern equivalents of his different groups are shown in square brackets. 1. Leafless plants, cryptograms in part. 2. Leafy plants, phanerograms and certain cryptograms. Subsection 1. Corticate plants, monocotyledons. Subsection 2. Tunicate plants, dicotyledons. 
A. Herbaceous. B. Wooding. The word tunicate in the above table is used for the plants which Albertus described as growing ex the genius tunicus. It seems clear from this expression that he realized that there was an anatomical distinction between dicotyledons and monocotyledons. Considering how much Albertus had achieved, it is somewhat curious that Cecil Pino, who represented Aristotelian botany in the 16th, as Albertus did in the 13th century, should have produced so inadequate a system as his own contribution to the subject. We owe to him one marked advance, the recognition, namely, of the importance of the seed. On the whole, however, his classification savors too much of having been thought out in the study, and it suffers by comparison with other systems of about the same period, such as those of De Lobel and Bauhin, which were arrived at rather by instinct, acting upon observation, than by a definite and self-conscious intellectual effort. Cecil Pino makes his main distinction on the old Aristotelian plan, between trees and shrubs on the one hand, and under shrubs and herbs on the other. He divides the first of these groups in two, and the second into thirteen classes, depending chiefly on seed and fruit characters. Very few of these classes really represent natural groups, and the chief of all distinctions among flowering plants is that between dicotyledons and monocotyledons, which was foreshadowed by Albertus, is almost lost to sight. When we turn from the botanical philosophers to the herbalists proper, we find an altogether different state of affairs. The Aristotelian botanists were conscious from the beginning of the philosophic necessity for some form of classification. The medical botanists, on the other hand, were only interested in plants as individuals and were driven to classify them merely because some sort of arrangement was necessary for convenience in dealing with a large number of kinds. The first Materia Medica, that of Dioscorides, shows some attempt at order, but the arrangement is seldom at all natural. Occasionally, the author groups together plants which are nearly related, as when he treats of a number of liabates or of umbellifers successively, but this is rare. Pliny was not, strictly speaking, a medical botanist, but at the same time he may be mentioned in this connection, since his interest in plants was essentially utilitarian. Like Theophrastus, he begins his account of plants with the trees, but his reason for so doing is profoundly different from that of the Greek writer, and illustrates the divergence between what we may call the anthropocentric and the scientific outlook upon the plant world. Theophrastus placed trees at the head of the vegetable kingdom because he considered their organization the highest and most completely expressive of plant nature. Pliny, on the other hand, began with trees because of their great value and importance to man. As an example of his ideas of arrangement, we may mention that he places the myrtle and laurel side by side because the laurel takes a corresponding place in triumphs to that accorded to the myrtle in ovations. Turning to the herbals themselves, we find that the earliest show no trace of a natural grouping, the plants being, as a rule, arranged alphabetically. This is the case, for instance, in the Latin and German herbarius, the ortus sanitatis, and their derivatives, and even in the herbals of Brunfels and of Fuchs in the 16th century. In box herbal, on the other hand, the plants are grouped as herbs, shrubs, and trees, according to the classical scheme. The author evidently made some effort within these classes to arrange them according to their relationships. In the preface to the third edition, he writes, quote, I have placed together, yet kept distinct, all plants which are related and connected, or otherwise resemble one another, and are compared, and have given up the former old rule or arrangement according to the ABC, which is seen in the old herbals. For the arrangement of plants by the ABC occasions much disparity and error. End quote. Although the larger classificatory divisions, as now understood, were not recognized by these early workers, they had at least a dim understanding of the distinction between genera and species. This dates back to Theophrastus, who showed, by grouping together different species of oaks, figs, etc., that he had some conception of a genus. We owe to Conrad Gessner the first formulation of the idea that genera should be denoted by substantive names. 
He was probably the earliest botanist who clearly expounded the distinction between a genus and a species. In one of his letters he writes, And we may hold this for certain, that there are scarcely any plants that constitute a genus which may not be divided into two or more species. The ancients describe one species of gentian. I know of ten or more. Very little of Gessner's botanical work was ever published, and it was left to Fabio Colonna to put before the botanical world the true nature of genera. He held the most enlightened views on the subject, and in 1616 clearly stated in his Ecphrasis that genera should not be based on similarities of leaf form, since the affinities of plants are indicated not by the leaf, but by the characteristic of the flower, the receptacle, and especially the seed. He brought forward instances to show that previous authors had sometimes placed a plant in the wrong genus because they only attended to the leaves and ignored the structure of the flower. In the writings of Gaspard Bauhin, at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, the binary system of nomenclature is used with a high degree of consistency, each species bearing a generic and specific name though sometimes a third or even a fourth descriptive word is added. Those extra words are not, however, really essential. In the preface to Phytopinax, 1596, Bauhin states that for the sake of clearness, he has applied one name to each plant and also added some easily recognizable character. The binomial method was foreshadowed at a very early date, for in a 15th century manuscript of the old herbal Circa Instans, to which we have referred on page 24, this system prevails to a remarkable extent. When we turn to those general schemes of classification which were evolved by the herbalists of the 16th century, we are at once struck by the great difference existing between the principles on which these schemes are based and those at which we have arrived at the present day. To classify plants according to their uses and medicinal properties is obviously the first suggestion that arises when the universe is regarded from a simple anthropocentric standpoint. In the Greta Herbal of 1526, we get a ludicrously clear example of this method, applied to the special case of fungi. Fungi ben musherons. There be two manners of them. One manner is deadly and slayeth them that eateth of them, and be called toadstools, and the other doth not. This account of the fungi occurs also in the earlier manuscript herbal Serica instance mentioned in the last paragraph. This theory of classification has been shown in more recent times to contain the germ of something more nearly approaching a natural system than one would imagine at first sight. Both Linnaeus and De Gessu have pointed out that related plants have similar properties, and in 1804, A.P. de Candolle, in his Essay sur la propriété médicale des plants, comparé avec les formes extérieures et leur classification naturelle, carried the argument much further. He showed that in no less than 21 families of flowering plants, the same medicinal properties were found throughout all the members of the order. This is very remarkable when we remember that the state of knowledge at that time was such that de Candolle was obliged to dismiss a large number of orders with the words properties unknown. Quite recently, the subject of the differentiation of groups of plants according to their chemistry has again come to the fore, and in the future, chemical characters will probably be numbered among the recognized criteria for use in elaborating schemes of classification. In the history of botanical classification, the first advance from the purely utilitarian standpoint was marked by the recognition of the fact that the structure and mode of life of the plants themselves are of importance. In the work of writers such as Dodens and De Alechon, to take two typical examples, we find the issues curiously confused by the working of three different principles side by side, that is to say, by the simultaneous insistence, one, on the habitat, two, on the virtues, and three, on the structure, as affording clues to the systematic position of the plant in question. 
the herbalist thus erects his scheme on a basis consisting of a confused medley of ecological, medical, and morphological principles. An enumeration of the 18 headings under which de Alechon in 1586 described the vegetable kingdom, so far as it was then known, will show the perplexities which surrounded the first gropings after a natural system. His headings may be translated as follows. 1. Of trees which grow wild in the woods. 2. Of fruits growing wild in thickets and shrubberies. 3. Of trees which are cultivated in pleasure gardens and orchards. 4. Of cereals and pulse, and the plants which grow in the field with them. 5. Of garden herbs and pot herbs. 6. Of umbelliferous plants. 7. Of plants with beautiful flowers. 8. Of fragrant plants. 9. Of plants growing in marshes. 10. Of plants growing in rough, rocky, sandy, and sunny places. 11. Of plants growing in shady, wet, marshy, and fertile places. 12. Of plants growing by the sea and in the sea itself. 13. Of climbing plants. 14. Of thistles and all spiny and prickly plants. 15. Of plants with bulbs and succulent and knotty roots. 16. Of cathartic plants. 17. Of poisonous plants. 18. Of foreign plants. Among these 18 groups, the only ones which have any pretension to being natural are six umbellifers and fourteen thistles, and these merely approximate roughly to related groups of genera. Among the umbellifers, we meet with Achillea and other genera which do not really belong in the order, whilst with the thistles there are grouped other spiny plants, such as Astragalus tragacantha, which in a natural system would occupy a place remote from the composites. In spite of the fact that improved systems of classification, to which we shall shortly refer, were put forward in the 16th and early 17th centuries, we find that, as late as 1640, John Parkinson, in his well-known herbal, divided all the plants then known into 17 classes or tribes, the sequence in which these classes were placed, having in most cases no meaning at all. A few of his tribes are natural, but many are valueless as an expression of affinities. As an example, we may mention his third class, venomous, sleepy, and hurtful plants and their counterpoisons, and his seventeenth, strange and outlandish plants. In Parkinson's classification, we see botany reverting once more to the position of a mere handmaid to medicine. In the first book of Dodin's Pemptades, 1583, the principles of botany are discussed. The old Aristotelian classification into trees, shrubs, undershrubs, and herbs is accepted, but with some reservations. The author points out that an individual plant may, owing to cultivation or from some other cause, pass from one class into another. He instances Racinus, which is an herbaceous annual with us, but a tree in other countries. The general scheme of classification which Dodens propounded has much in common with that of de Alichon, which we have already outlined. Within the larger groups, he shows a stronger perception of natural grouping than appears in his arrangement of the larger classes themselves. He often grouped together genera which we now regard as members of the same natural order and species which we now look upon as belonging to a single genus. For instance, he brought together genera belonging respectively to the Geranicacea, Hyperanicacea, Plantagenicacea, Cruciferae, Compositae, etc. In some cases, however, he was only partially successful, as in the Umbelliferae, among which he described Nigella, Love in a Mist, and a couple of Saxifrages. This example shows how little stress was laid on the flowers and fruit at this time from the point of view of classification. The general habit and the shape of the leaves were the features that received the most attention. Resemblances and differences between the forms of the leaves alone must naturally appear to the botanist of the present day to be a very inadequate basis for a general system of classification. 
Nevertheless, Matthias de Lobel worked out a scheme on these lines which had great merit and was a considerable advance on previous efforts. He put forward his system in his Sterpium Adversaria, 1570-71, to and used it also in his later work. It was thus published much earlier than the very primitive schemes of de Alechon and Dodens to which we have just referred. The best point of his system is that, by reason of their characteristic differences of leaf structure, he distinguishes the classes now known to us as monocotyledons and dicotyledons. He introduces a useful feature in the shape of a synoptic table of species which precedes each more or less natural group of plants. The superiority of his classification to the other arrangements in the field at the time was immediately realized. We have evidence of this in the fact that after his Crudit Bach was published, Plantin brought out an album of the wood engravings used in the book, which, although they had also appeared as illustrations to the works of Dodens and de la Cluse, were now arranged as in the scheme put forward by de Lobel, according to their genus and mutual relationship. There seems little doubt that de Lobel made a more conscious effort than any of his predecessors to arrive at a natural classification, and that he realized that such a classification would reveal a unity in all living beings. In his preface to Sterpium Adversaria Nova of 1570, he writes, For thus, in an order than which nothing more beautiful exists in the heavens or in the mind of a wise man, things which are far and widely different become, as it were, one thing. De Lobel's scheme is not expressed in the clear manner to which we have become accustomed in more modern systems, because, in common with other botanists of his time, he did not, as a rule, give names to the groups which we now call orders, or draw any sharp line of distinction between them. De Lobel's arrangement, in spite of its good features, had serious drawbacks. The anomalous monocotyledons, such as Arum, Tamus, Aloe, and Ruscus, are scattered among the dicotyledons, while Drosera, the sundew, appears among the ferns, and so on. Similarities of leaf form, which are now regarded merely as instances of homoplastic convergence, are responsible for many curious groupings. For instance, in the Crudebach we find the Tway Blade, Listera, the May Lily, Myanthium, and the Plantain, Plantago, described in succession while in another part of the book various clovers, trifolium, wood sorrel, oxalis, and anemone hepatica are grouped together. It is also not surprising that the marsh marigold, cultha, the water lilies, nymphaea and nufar, the manthium and frogbit, hydrocharis, should follow one another, or that de lobel should have brought together the broom rape, orobanchi, the toothwort, lathrora, the bird's nest orchid, neotia, and a large number of fungi. In this latter instance, the author has really arrived at genuine biological, though not morphological, groups. He has recognized, on the one hand, the marked uniformity of the type of leaf characteristic of swimming water plants, and on the other hand, he has observed the leaflessness and absence of green color, which are negative features common to so many saprophytes and parasites. The perception of natural affinities among plants, which in the 16th and 17th centuries was gradually, in a dim, instinctive fashion, arising in men's minds, is perhaps best expressed in the work of Gaspar Bauhin, especially in his Pinox Theatri Botanici, 1623. This work is divided into twelve books, each book being further subdivided into sections, comprehending a variable number of genera. Neither the books nor the sections have, as a rule, any general heading, but there are certain exceptions. For instance, Book 2 is called De Bulbosis, and a section of Book 4, including 18 genera, is headed Umbilifere. Some of the sections represent truly natural groups. Book 3, Section 6, for example, consists of 10 genera of Compositae, while Book 3, Section 2, includes 6 crucifers. Other sections contain plants of more than one family, yet show a distinct feeling for relationship. For instance, Book 5, Section 1 includes Solanum, Mandragora, Hyoscymus, Nicotiana, Papaver, Hypecum, 
and Argemon. That is to say, four genera from the Solanchia, followed by three from Papaverica. The common character which brings them together here is no doubt their narcotic property. But although no definite line was drawn between the plants belonging to these two widely sundered families, the order in which they are described shows that their distinctness was recognized. Some of Bauhin's other groups, however, which, like that just discussed, are distinguished by their properties, or in other words, by their chemical features, have no pretension to naturalness from a morphological standpoint. This is the case with the group described in Book 11, Section 3, under the name of Aromata, which consists of a heterogeneous assemblage of genera belonging to different orders, which are only connected by the fact that they all yield spices useful to man. There is no doubt that on the whole, Bauhin was markedly successful in recognizing affinities within small cycles, but he broke down on the broader question of the relationships between the groups of genera so constituted. This is, however, hardly surprising when we remember how much difference of opinion exists among systematic botanists, even today, upon the subject of the relations of the orders to one another. Like de Lobel, Bauhin seems to have believed in the general principle of a progression from the simpler to the more highly developed forms. His application of this principle led him to begin with the grasses and to conclude with the trees. The question as to which groups among the flowering plants, angiosperms, are to be considered as relatively primitive is still, at the present day, an open one, but it would be generally conceded that Bauhin's arrangement cannot be accepted. There is little doubt from the standpoint of modern botany that the grasses are a highly specialized group while the tree habit has been adopted independently by many plants belonging to entirely different cycles of affinity, and thus, except in rare cases, it cannot be used as a criterion of relationship. On the subject of the relations of the cryptogams, flowerless plants, to the phanerogams, flowering plants, Bauhin had evidently no clear ideas, but such could hardly be hoped for in the state of knowledge of that time. We find, for instance, the ferns, mosses, corals, fungi, algae, the sundew, etc., sandwiched between some leguminosae and a section consisting chiefly of thistles. The classification put forward by the Bohemian botanist Zaluzianski in 1592, although in its general features no better than that of Dodens or of de Alechon, and certainly less satisfactory than that of de Lobel or the later scheme of Bauhin, is an improvement on all of these in one particular namely that he begins with the fungi and deals next with the mosses. After the mosses, he describes the grasses, and his classification concludes with the trees. He was thus evidently attempting to pass from the simpler to the more complex, and his arrangement indicates that, unlike certain other botanists of his time, he looked upon the lower cryptogams as comparatively simple and primitive plants. He was not so clear-sighted, however, on the subject of the ferns, for he placed them with the umbilifere and some compositae, no doubt because he was influenced by the form of the leaf. It is curious that Cecil Pino, who, as we have pointed out, had arrived at the very important principle that the seed and fruit characters were of major value in classification, yet put forward a system which was distinctly inferior to that of Gaspard Bauhin although the latter appears to have been guided by no such general principles. Probably the reason for this is to be sought in the fact that no system of classification can represent natural affinities unless it takes into account the nature of the plant as a whole. It is true that, compared with the characters of the reproductive organs, the leaf, form, and habit, owing to their plasticity, have to be used with great discretion as systematic criteria, but nevertheless no system of classification can afford to ignore them entirely. Cesalpino based his scheme too exclusively upon seed characters, to the neglect even of the structure of the flower, and curiously enough, although he laid so much stress upon the nature of the seed, he did not grasp the fundamental distinction between the embryos of the monocotyledons and the dicotyledons due to the possession of one and two seed leaves, respectively. The chief drawback of his scheme, however, was his failure to realize that living organisms are too complex to fall into a classification based on any one feature, important as that feature may prove to be when used in conjunction with other characters. Those herbalists, on the other hand, who attacked the problem of classification of plants without any preconceived academic theory, 
depended, one might almost say, on the glimmerings of common sense for the recognition of affinities. This was no doubt a dim and fitful illumination, but it was at least less partial than the narrow limelight beam of a rigid theory. End of chapter 6「Section 13 of Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, A Chapter in the History of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, A Chapter in the History of Botany by Agnes Arbor. 7. The Evolution of the Art of Botanical Illustration. In the art of botanical illustration, evolution was by no means a simple and straightforward process. We do not find in Europe a steady advance from early illustrations of poor quality to later ones of a finer character. On the contrary, among the earliest extant drawings of a definitely botanical intention, we meet with wonderfully good figures, free from such features as would be now generally regarded as archaic. The famous Vienna manuscript of Dioscorides, see pages 8 and 85, is a remarkable example of the excellence of some of the very early work. It dates back to the end of the 5th or the beginning of the 6th century of the Christian era. It is illustrated with brush drawings on a large scale, which in many cases are notably naturalistic and quite often modern in appearance. The general habit of the plant is admirably expressed, and occasionally, as in the case of the bean, the characters of the flowers and seed vessels are well indicated. In this drawing also, the leaves are effectively foreshortened. There are a number of other manuscript herbals in existence illustrated with interesting figures. The Library of the University of Leiden possesses a particularly fine example, which is ascribed to the 7th century A.D., this work contains colored drawings of exceptional beauty, which are smaller than those in the Vienna manuscript, but quite equally realistic. It is, however, with the history of botanical figures since the invention of the printing press that we are here more especially concerned. From this epoch onward, the history of botanical illustration is intimately bound up with the history of a wood engraving, until at the extreme end of the 16th century, engraving on metal first came into use to illustrate herbals. During the 17th century, metal engravings and wood cuts existed side by side, but wood engraving gradually declined and was in great measure superseded by engraving on metal. The finest period of plant illustration was during the 16th century when wood engraving was at its zenith. Botanical wood engravings may be regarded as belonging to two schools, but it should be understood that the distinction between them is somewhat arbitrary and must not be pressed very far. One of these may perhaps be regarded as representing the last decadent expression of that school of late classical art which, a thousand years earlier, had given rise to the drawings in the Vienna manuscript. Probably no original woodcuts of this school were produced after the close of the 15th century. In the second phase, on the other hand, which culminated artistically, if not scientifically, in the 16th century, we find a renaissance of the art due to a more direct study of nature. The first school of which we may take the cuts in the Roman edition of the Herbarium of Apelius Platonicus, 1484, as typical examples, has, as Dr. Payne has pointed out, certain very well-marked characteristics. The figures of the plants, which occupy square or oblong spaces, are very formal and are often represented with complete bilateral symmetry. They show no sign of having been drawn directly from nature, but look as if they were founded on previous work. They have a decorative rather than a naturalistic appearance. It seems indeed as if the principle of decorative symmetry controlled the artist almost against his will. These drawings are somewhat of the nature of diagrams by a draftsman who generalized his knowledge of the object. In Dr. Payne's own words, such figures passing through the hands of a hundred copyists became more and more conventional until they reached their last and most degraded form in the rude cuts of the Roman herbarium which represent not the infancy, but the old age of art. Uncouth as they are, we may regard them with some respect, both as being the images of flowers that bloomed many centuries ago, and also as the last ripple of the receding tide of classical art. 
The illustrations of the herbarium of Apollius were copied from pre-existing manuscripts, and the age of the originals is no doubt much greater than that of the printed work. Those here reproduced are taken from a copy in the British Museum in which the pictures were colored, probably at the time when the book was published. Coloring of the figures was characteristic of many of the earliest works in which wood engraving was employed. In cases where uncolored copies of such books exist, there are often blank spaces in the woodcuts which were left in order that certain details might afterwards be added in color. The origin of wood engraving is closely connected with the earlier history of playing card manufacture. Playing cards were at first colored by means of stencil plates, and the same method, very naturally, came to be employed in connection with the wood blocks used for book illustration. The engravings in the herbarium of Apuleius are executed in black in very crude outline. At least two colors, now much faded, were also employed by means of stenciling. The work was coarsely done, and the colors only register very roughly. Brown appears to have been used for the animals, roots, and flowers, and green for the leaves. The drawings show some rather curious mannerisms. For instance, in the first cut labeled Vitonia, each of the lanceolate leaves is outlined continuously on the one side, but with a broken line on the other. It has been suggested that the illustrations in the herbarium are possibly not wood engravings, but rude cuts in metal, excavated after the manner of a wood block. We have already referred to the imaginative portrait of the mandrake. Figures of the animals whose bites or stings were supposed to be cured by the use of a particular herb were often introduced into the drawing, as in the case of the plantain, which is accompanied by a serpent and a scorpion. In this figure, the cross-hatching of white lines on black, the simplest possible device from the point of view of the wood engraver, is employed with good effect. Sometimes the essential character of the plant is seized, but the way in which it is expressed is curiously lacking in a sense of proportion, as in the case of Draconte one of the Aram family. The figures in the herbarium are characterized by an excellent trait which is common to most of the older herbals, namely the habit of portraying the plant as a whole, including its roots. This came about naturally because the root was often of special value from the druggist's point of view. It is to be regretted that in modern botanical drawings, the recognition of the paramount importance of the flower and fruit in classification has led to a comparative neglect of the organs of vegetation, especially those which exist underground. We now come to a series of illustrations which may be regarded as occupying an intermediate position between the classical tradition of the herbarium of Apuleius and the Renaissance of botanical drawing, which took place early in the 16th century. These include the illustrations to the Book of Nature and to the Latin and German herbarius, the Ortus Sanitatis, and their derivatives, which were discussed in chapters 2 and 3. Das Puch der Natur of Conrad von Megenberg occupies a unique position in the history of botany, for it is the first work in which a woodcut representing plants was used with the definite intention of illustrating the text, and not merely for a decorative purpose. It was first printed in Augsburg in 1475 and is thus several years older than the earliest printed edition of the Herbarium of Apelius Platonicus, which we have just discussed. The single plant drawing which illustrates it is probably not of such great antiquity, however, as those of the herbarium, for its appearance suggests that it was probably executed from nature for this book and not copied and recopied from one manuscript to another before it was engraved. The illustration in question is a full-page wood cut showing a number of plants growing in situ. Several species, example, Ranunculus acris, the meadow buttercup, Viola odorata, the sweet violet, and Convalaria majalis, the lily of the valley, are distinctly recognizable. It is noticeable that, in two cases in which a rosette of radical leaves is represented, the center of the rosette is filled in in black, upon which the leaf stalks appear in white. This use of the black background, which gives a rich and solid effect, was carried much further in later books, such as the Ortus sanitatis. A woodcut, somewhat similar in style to that just described, but more primitive, occurs in Trevisa's version of the medieval encyclopedia of Bartolomeus Angelicus, which was printed by Winken de Vord before the end of the 15th century. It is probably the first botanical figure illustrating an English book. The illustrations to the Latin Herbarius or Herbarius Maguntinus, published at Mainz in 1484, 
form the next group of botanical woodcuts. The figures are much better than those of the herbarium of Apuleius, but at the same time they are, as a rule, formal and conventional, and often quite unrecognizable. The want of realism is very conspicuous in such a drawing as that of the lily, in which the leaves are represented as if they had no organic continuity with the stem. Some of the figures are wonderfully charming, and in their decorative effect recall the plant designs so often used in the Middle Ages to enrich the borders of illuminated manuscripts. This is particularly noticeable in the case of the Briony. The conventional form of tendril here employed is also seen in other early work, such as the roof painting of a vine in the Chapel of St. Andrew, Canterbury Cathedral, and some decorated stained glass at Wells, both of which are considerably earlier in date than the Herbarius Maguntinus. A more interesting series of figures, also illustrating the text of the Latin Herbarius, was published in Italy a little later. The woodcuts are believed to be mostly derived from German originals. Text figures 6, 57, 65, 74, 75, and 76 are taken from a Venetian edition of 1499. These drawings are more ambitious than those in the original Greek issue, and on the whole, the results are more naturalistic. The fern called Capillus Veneris, which is probably intended for the maiden hair, is represented hanging from rocks over water just as it does in Devonshire caves today. Another delightful woodcut, almost in the Japanese style, is that of an iris growing in the margin of a stream from which a graceful bird is drinking. In the very symmetrical drawing of the peony, there is an attempt to represent the tuberous roots, which are indicated in solid black. The no less symmetrical water lily is remarkable for its rhizome, on which the scars of the leaf bases are faithfully represented. This drawing is of interest also on account of its frank disregard of proportion. The flower stalks are drawn not more than twice as long as the breadth of the leaf. We may, I think, safely conclude that the draftsman knew quite well that he was not representing the plant as it was, and that he intentionally gave a conventional rendering, which did not profess to be more than an indication of certain distinctive features of the plant. This attitude of the artist to his work, which is so different from that of the scientific draftsmen of the present day, is seen with great clearness in many of the drawings in medieval manuscripts. For instance, a plant such as the house leek may be represented growing on the roof of a house, the plant being about three times the size of the building. No one would imagine that the artist was under the delusion that these proportions held a good in nature. The little house was merely introduced in order to convey graphic information as to the habitat of the plant concerned, and the scale on which it was depicted was simply a matter of convenience. Before an art can be appreciated, its conventions must be accepted. It would be as absurd to quarrel with the illustrations we have just described on account of their lack of proportion as to condemn grand opera because in real life men and women do not converse in song. The idea of naturalistic drawings in which the size of the parts should be shown in their true relations was of comparatively late growth. In 1485, the year following the first appearance of the Latin Herbarius, the very important work known as the German Herbarius, or Herbarius zu Teutsch, made its appearance at Mainz. As we pointed out in Chapter 2, its illustrations, which are executed on a large scale, are often of remarkable beauty. Dr. Payne considered some of them comparable to those of Brunfels in fidelity of drawing, though very inferior in wood cutting. They are distinctly more realistic than even those of the Venetian edition of the Latin Herbarius, to which we have just referred. It is interesting, for instance, to compare the drawings of the daughter in the two works. Other excellent drawings are those of the winter cherry, iris, lily, chicory, comfy, and peony. A pirated second edition of the Arbarius zu Tuich appeared at Oxford only a few months after the publication of the first at Mainz. The figures, which are roughly copied from those of the original edition, are very inferior to them. In fact, the Mainz woodcuts of 1485 excel those of all subsequent issues. In the Ortus Sanitatis of 1491, about two-thirds of the drawings of plants are copied from the Arbarius zu Tuich. They are often much spoiled in the process, and it is evident that the copyist frequently failed to grasp the intention of the original artist. The woodcut of the daughter, for instance, is lamentably inferior to that in the Herbarius zu Teutsch, 
There is often a tendency in the later work to make the figures occupy the space in a more decorative fashion. For instance, where the stalk in the original drawing is simply cut across obliquely at the base, we find in the Ortus Sanitatis that its pointed end is continued into a conventional flourish. Among the original figures, many, as we have already indicated, represent purely mythical subjects. The use of a black background against which the stalks and leaves form a contrast in white, which we noticed in the Book of Nature, is carried further in the Ortus Sanitatis. This is shown particularly well in the Tree of Paradise, and also in text figures 10 and 81. No consistent method is followed in the coarse shading which is employed. In some cases, there seems to have been an attempt at the convention, used so successfully by the Japanese, of darkening the underside of the leaf, but sometimes in the same figure, certain leaves are treated in this way and others not. In some of the genres pictures, Noah's Ark trees are introduced, with crowns consisting entirely of parallel horizontal lines, decreasing in length from below upwards so as to give a triangular form. An edition of the Ortus Sanitatis, which was published in Venice in 1511, is illustrated in great part with woodcuts based on the original figures. They have, however, a very different appearance since a great deal of shading is introduced and in some cases parallel lines are laid with considerable dexterity. The Greta Erbal and a number of works of the early 16th century derived from the Barius zu Teutsch, the Ortus Sanitatis, and similar sources are of no importance in the history of botanical illustration, since scarcely any of their figures are original. The oft-repeated set of woodcuts, ultimately derived from the Herbarius zu Teutsch, were also used to illustrate Hieronymus Braunschweig's distillation book, Liber de Art Distillante de Simplicibus, 1500. That the conventional figures of the period did not satisfy the botanist is shown by some interesting remarks by Hieronymus at the conclusion of his work. He tells the reader that he must attend to the text rather than the figures, quote, for the figures are nothing more than a feast for the eyes and for the information of those who cannot read or write, end quote. During the first three decades of the 16th century, the art of botanical illustration was practically in abeyance in Europe. Such books as were published were chiefly supplied with mere copies of older woodcuts. But in 1530, an entirely new era was inaugurated with the appearance of Brunfell's great work, the Herbarum Vivae Icones, in which a number of plants native to Germany or commonly cultivated there were drawn with a beauty and fidelity which have rarely been surpassed. It is interesting to recall that the date 1530 is often taken in the study of other arts, for example, stained glass, as the limit of the Gothic period and the beginning of the Renaissance. Brunfell's illustrations represent a notable advance on any previous botanical woodcuts, so much so indeed that the suddenness of the improvement seems to call for some special explanation. On taking a broader view of the subject, we find that at the beginning of the 16th century there was a marked advance in all the branches of book illustration and not merely in the botanical side with which we are here concerned. This impetus seems to have been due to the fact that many of the best artists, above all Albrecht Durer, began at that period to draw for wood engraving, whereas in the 15th century the ablest men had shown a tendency to despise the craft and to hold aloof from it. The engravings in Brunfell's herbal and the fine books which succeeded it should not be considered as if they were an isolated manifestation but should be viewed in relation to other contemporary and even earlier plant drawings, which were not intended for book illustrations. Some of the most remarkable are those by Albrecht Durer, which were produced before the appearance of Brunfell's herbal during the first thirty years of the 16th century. In each of his colored drawings of sods of turf, known as Das Gross Rassenstuck and Das Kleine Rassenstuck, a tangled group of growing plants is portrayed exactly as it occurred in nature, with a marvelous combination of artistic charm and scientific accuracy. Professor Killerman has been at pains to identify the genus and species of almost every plant represented, and has described the drawings as Das Erst Dunkmal der Pflanzenkology. In 1526, Durer carried out a beautiful series of plant drawings, 
among the most famous of which are those of the Columbine and the Greater Celandine. The former is reproduced on a small scale in Plate 17. It is scarcely possible to imagine a more perfect habit drawing of a plant. In Italy, Leonardo da Vinci's exquisite study of plants, of which Plate 18 is an example, must also have pointed the way to a better era of herbal illustration. In his work, the artistic interest predominates over the botanical to a greater extent than is the case with Durer's drawing. It is strange to think that numerous editions of the Ortus Sanitatis and similar books, with their crude and primitive woodcuts, should have been published while such an artist as Leonardo da Vinci was at the zenith of his powers. If internal evidence alone were available, it might plausibly be maintained that the engravings in the Ortus Sanitatis and the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci were centuries apart. We are thus led to the conclusion that though the engravings in Brunfell's herbal are separated from previous botanical figures by an almost impassable gulf, they should not be regarded as a sudden and inexplicable development. The art of naturalistic plant drawing had arrived independently at what was perhaps its high-water mark of excellence, but it is in Brunfell's great work that we find it, for the first time, applied to the illustration of a botanical book. The illustrations in Brunfell's herbal were engraved and probably drawn also by Hans Weiditz, or Guditus, some of whose work has been ascribed to Albrecht Durer. The title Herbarum Vive Icones, Living Pictures of Plants, indicates the most distinctive feature of the book, namely that the artist went direct to nature instead of regarding the plant world through the eyes of the previous draftsman. This characteristic is best appreciated on comparing Brunfell's figures with those of his predecessors. His picture of the water lily, for example, contrasts notably with that of the same subject from the Venetian Herbarius. In the former, the artist has caught the exact look of the leaves and stalks buoyed up by the water. Throughout the work, the drawing seems to be of a slightly higher quality than the actual engraving. The lines are, to use the technical term, occasionally somewhat rotten or even broken. In one respect, the welcome reaction from the conventional and generalized early drawings went almost too far. Many of Brunsfeld's woodcuts were done from imperfect specimens in which, for example, the leaves had withered or had been damaged by insects. This is clearly shown in text figure 84. The artist's ambition was evidently limited to representing the specimen he had before him, whether it was typical or not. The notion had not then been grasped that the ideal botanical drawing avoids the peculiarities of any individual specimen and seeks to portray the characters really typical of the species. These characters can sometimes only be arrived at by comparison of numerous specimens. From the figures here reproduced, a good idea of the style of Vidits can be obtained. His line is usually firm and broad, and but little shading is employed. The chief merit of the drawings lies in their crisp and virile outlines. Regarded from the point of view of decorative book illustration, the beautiful drawings of the period under construction sometimes failed to reach the standard set by earlier work. The very strong black velvety line of many of the 15th century wood engravings and the occasional use of solid black backgrounds give a great sense of richness, especially in combination with the black letter type with which they harmonize so admirably. A page bearing such illustrations is often more satisfying to the eye than one in which the desire to express the subtleties of plant form in realistic fashion has led to the use of a more delicate line. However, the primary object of the herbal illustrations was, after all, a scientific and not a decorative one, and from this point of view, the gain in realism more than compensates for the loss in the harmonious balance of black and white. Our chronological survey of the chief botanical woodcuts brings us next to those published by Egenolf in 1533 to illustrate Rodion's Kruderbach. These have sometimes been regarded as of considerable importance, almost comparable in fact with those of Brunfels. A careful examination of these wood engravings leads, however, to the conclusion that practically all the chief figures in Engelolf's book have been copied from those of Brunfels but on a smaller scale, and reversed. It is true that the style of engraving is different, and that, as Hatton has pointed out, Egenolf's flowing, easy, almost brush-like line is very distinct from that of Vidit's, but the fact of the plagiarism remains. The two figures here reproduced, the Lesser Selendine and the Hart's Tongue Fern, are reduced copies from Brunfels. It is interesting to notice that as the third part of Brunfell's great work had not appeared when Egenolf's book was published, 
The latter must have been at a loss for figures of the plants which Brunsfeld had reserved for his third volume. We find that, in the case of one such plant, the asparagus, he solved the problem by going back to the old familiar woodcut which had done duty in the Ortus sanitatis and the Herbarius zutoich. In the third volume of Brunfell's Herbal, which appeared after his death, there is a small figure, that of Auricula Murus, which differs conspicuously in style from the other engravings, and which appears to represent a case in which the tables were turned and a figure was borrowed from Egonol. In his later books, Egonolf used woodcuts pirated from those of Fuchs and Bach, which we must now consider. In the work of Leonhard Fuchs, Front's piece, plant drawing as an art may be said to have reached its culminating point. It is true that, at a later period, when the botanical importance of the detailed structure of the flower and fruit was recognized, figures were produced which conveyed exacter and more copious information on these points than did those of Fuchs. Nevertheless, at least in opinion of the present writer, the illustration to Fuchs' herbals, De Historia Stirpium, 1542, and New Crater Book, 1543, represent the high watermark of that type of botanical drawing which seeks to express the individual character and habit of each species, treating the plant broadly as a whole, and not laying more stress upon the reproductive than the vegetative organs. Fuchs figures are on so large a scale that the plant frequently had to be represented as curved in order to fit it into the folio page. The illustrations here reproduced do not give an entirely just idea of their beauty, since the line employed in the original is so thin that it is ill-adapted to the reduction necessary here. If the drawings have any fault, it is perhaps to be found in the somewhat blank and unfinished look occasionally produced when unshaded outline drawings are used on so large a scale. This is the case, for instance, in the figure of the aloe. It may be that Fuchs had in mind the possibility that the purchaser might wish to color the work and to fill in a certain amount of detail for himself. The existing copies of this and other old herbals often have the figures painted, generally in a distressingly crude and heavy fashion. The coloring in many cases appears to have been done at a very early date. In the octavo edition of Fuchs' herbal, published in 1545, small versions of the large woodcuts appeared. It is perhaps invidious to draw distinctions between the work of Fuchs and that of Brunfels, since they are both of such exquisite quality. However, merely as an expression of personal opinion, the present writer must confess to feeling that there is a finer sense of power and freedom of handling about the illustrations in Fuchs' herbal than those of Brunfels. Sometimes in Fuchs' figures, a wonderfully decorative spirit is shown as in the case of the earthnut pea, which fills the rectangular space almost in the manner of an all-over wallpaper pattern. It must not be forgotten, when discussing woodcuts, that the artist who drew upon the block for the engraver was working under peculiar conditions. It was impossible for him to be unmindful of the boundaries of the block when these took form, as it were, of miniature precipices under his hand. These boundaries marked out the exact limit of space which the figure could occupy. It is not surprising, under these circumstances, that the artist who drew upon the block should often seem to have been obsessed by its rectangularity, and should have accommodated his drawing to its form in a way that was unnecessary and far from realistic, though sometimes very decorative. This is exemplified in the figure of the earth nut pea, to which we have just referred to, and also in text figures 41, 44, 62, 92, 95, 101, etc., the writer has been told by an artist accustomed in former years to draw upon the wood for the engraver that to avoid a rectangular effect required a distinct effort of will. At the present day, when photographic methods of reproduction are almost exclusively used, the artist is no longer oppressively conscious of the exact outline of the space which his figure will occupy. The figures here reproduced show how great a variety of subjects were successfully dealt with in Fuchs' work. The cabbage is realized in a way that brings home to us the intrinsic beauty of this somewhat prosaic subject. In the wild arum, the fruit and a dissection of the inflorescence are represented, so that botanically the drawing reaches a high level. Fuchs' woodcuts are nearly all original, but that of the white water lily appears to have been founded upon Brunfell's figure. We have so far spoken, for the sake of brevity, as if Fuchs actually executed the figures himself. This, however, was not the case. He employed two draftsmen, Heinrich Fulmorer, who drew the plants from nature, and Albrecht Meyer, who copied the drawings onto the wood, 
and also an engraver, Viet Rudolf Speckel, who actually cut the blocks. Fuchs evidently delighted to honor his colleagues, for at the end of the book there are portraits of all three at work. The artist is drawing a plant with a brush fixed in a quill. The drawing and painting of flowers is sometimes dismissed almost contemptuously, as though it were a humble art in which an inferior artist, incapable of the more exacting work of drawing from the life, might be able to excel. The falsity of this view is shown by the fact that the greatest of flower painters have generally been men who also did admirable figure work. Fantine Latour is a striking modern instance, and one has but to glance at the studies of Leonardo da Vinci and Albrecht Durer to feel that the finest plant drawings can only be produced by a master hand, capable of achieving success on more ambitious lines. The wood engravings in Fuchs Herbal are a case in point. The portraits which also illustrate the book show that the talents of the artists whom he employed were not confined to plant drawing, but were also strong in the direction of vigorous and able portraiture. Fuchs' gratitude to his assistants is expressed in the preface to De Historia Stirpium, where he makes some remarks upon the illustrations, which may be translated as follows. As far as concerns the pictures themselves, each of which is positively delineated according to the features and likeness of the living plants, we have taken peculiar care that they should be most perfect, and moreover, we have devoted the greatest diligence to secure that every plant should be depicted with its own roots, stalks, leaves, flowers, seeds, and fruits. Furthermore, we have purposely and deliberately avoided the obliteration of the natural form of a plant by shadows and other less necessary things, by which the delineators sometimes try to win artistic glory. And we have not allowed the craftsmen so to indulge their whims as to cause the drawings not to correspond accurately to the truth. Vitus Rodufol's Specklin, by far the best engraver of Strasbourg, has admirably copied the wonderful industry of the draftsman, and has with such excellent craft expressed in his engraving the features of each drawing, that he seems to have contended with the draftsman for glory and victory. How dull and colorless the phrases of modern scientific writers appear beside the hot-blooded, arrogant enthusiasm of the 16th century. Fuchs' woodcuts were extensively pirated, especially those on a reduced scale, which were published in his edition of 1545. As we have mentioned on page 55, Hieronymus Bach, or Trajus, undoubtedly made use of them in the second edition of his Cruder book, which was the next important illustrated botanical work to appear after Fuchs's herbal. An examination of the woodcuts in Bach's herbal scenes, however, to show that his illustrations have more claim to originality than is often supposed. The figures of wintergreen, moonwort, and strawberry here reproduced are markedly different from those of Fuchs, although in the case of the first, Fuchs' woodcut may have been used to some extent. The artist employed by Bach, as he himself tells us, was David Kandel, a young lad, the son of a burgher of Strasbourg. His drawings are often of interest apart from their botanical aspect. For instance, the picture of an oak tree includes, appropriately enough, a swineherd with his swine, the chestnut tree gives occasion for a hedgehog, and in another case, a monkey and several rabbits are introduced, one of the latter holding a shield bearing the artist's initials. The woodcut of Trapa, the bull nut, is a highly imaginative production which clearly shows that neither the artist nor the author had ever seen the plant in question. In general character, box illustrations are neater and more conventional than those of Brunfels or Fuchs. The crowns of the trees are often made practically square so as to fit the block. The figures in earlier works, such as the Ortus Sanitatis, are recalled in Candle's disregard of the proportion between the size of the tree and that of the leaves and fruits. In point of time, the illustrations to the early editions of Mattioli's commentaries on the six books of Dioscorides follow fairly closely on those of Fuchs, but they are extremely different in style. Details such as the veins and hairs of the leaves are often elaborately worked out while shading is much used, a considerable mastery of parallel lines being shown. The general effect is occasionally somewhat flat and dull. Some of the drawings suggest that they may have been done from dry plants, and in others the treatment is overcrowded. But in spite of these defects, they form a markedly individual contribution which is of great importance in the history of botanical illustration. Numerous editions of Mattioli's work appeared in various languages. 
In its earlier form, the book had only small figures, but in some later editions, notably that which appeared in Venice in 1565, there are large illustrations which are reproduced on a reduced scale in text figures 43, 44, and 95. These woodcuts resemble the smaller ones in character, but are more decorative in effect and often remarkably fine. Whereas in the work of Brunfeld and Fuchs, the beautiful line of a single stalk is often the keynote of the whole drawing, in the work of Mattioli, the eye most frequently finds its satisfaction in the rich massing of foliage, fruit, and flowers, suggestive of southern luxuriance. Many of his figures would require literal modification to form the basis of a tapestry pattern. Another remarkable group of wood engravings consists of those published by Plantin in connection with the work of the three low country herbalists, Dodens, De La Clue, and De Lobel. In the original edition of Dodens Herbal, Kruyebach, published by Vanderloe in 1554, more than half the illustrations were taken from Fuchs' Octavo edition of 1545. But eventually, as we have pointed out in Chapter 4, Vanderloe parted with Fuchs' blocks. After this, Plantin took over the publication of Dodin's books, and in his final collected works, Sturpium Historiae Pemtades Sex, 1583, the majority of the illustrations were original and were carried out under the author's eye. A few, namely those marked in the Pemtades ex codice Cesario, are copied from Juliana Anicia's manuscript of Dioscorides, to which we have more than once referred. Some are also borrowed from the works of De La Clouse and De La Belle, since Plantin was publisher to all three botanists, and the woodblocks engraved for them were regarded as, to some extent, forming a common stock. In fact, it is often difficult to decide to which author any given figure originally belonged. This difficulty is enhanced by the fact that some were actually made for one and then used for another before the work for which they had been originally destined was published. There is little to be said about De Lobel's figures which partook of the character of the rest of the woodcuts for which Plantin made himself responsible. The yellow water lily is given here as an example. The woodcuts illustrating the comparatively small books of De La Clus are perhaps the most interesting of the figures associated with this trio of botanists. The dragon tree, Sedum Majus, and Job's Tears are examples from his books on the plants of Spain, which appeared in 1576. The popularity of a large collection of blocks got together by the publishing house of Plantin is shown by the frequency with which they were copied. Dr. B. Dayton Jackson has pointed out that the woodcut of the clematis which first appeared in Dodens Pemtades of 1583, reappears either in identical form or more or less accurately copied in works by De Lobel, De La Clus, Gerard, Parkinson, Jean Balkin, Chabreos, and Petiver. The actual blocks themselves appear to have been used for the last time when Johnson's edition of Gerard's Herbal made its final appearance in London, 1636. Another school of plant illustration is represented in the work of Gessner and Camerarius. As we mentioned on page 92, Gessner's drawings were not published during his lifetime, but some of them were eventually produced by Camerarius with the addition of figures of his own to illustrate his Epitome Mafioli of 1586, and also his later work. In 1751, C.J. True published a collection of Gessner's drawings, many of which had never been seen before. But even then, it proved impossible to separate the work of the two botanists with any completeness, since Gessner's drawings and blocks had passed through the hands of Camerarius, who had incorporated his own with them. A few woodcuts, however, which appeared as an appendix to Simler's Life of Gessner, are undoubtedly Gessner's own work. One of them is reproduced in text figure 48. Professor Trevoranus, whose work on the use of wood engravings as botanical illustrations is so well known, considered that some of the drawings published by Camerarius in connection with his last work, Portus Medicus et Philosophicus, 1588, were among the best ever produced. Examples are shown in text figures 34, 35, 71, 100. Treveranus pointed out that one of their great merits lay in the selection of good, typical specimens as models. These figures are very much more botanical than those of any previous author. In fact, as Hatton has pointed out in the Craftsman's Plant book, they are beginning to become too botanical for the artist. Camerarius often gives detailed analyses of the flowers and fruit on an enlarged scale. Among the illustrations here reproduced will be seen one in which the seedling of the Rose of Jericho is drawn side by side with the mature plant, 
and another in which the structure of a germinating date is shown with great clearness. This interest in seedlings gives a modern touch to the work of Camerarius. A number of wood blocks were cut at Lyon to illustrate de Alechon's work, the Historia Generalis Planetarum, 1586 to 87. Many of these figures were taken from the herbals of Fuchs, Mattioli, and Dodens, but they were often embellished with representations of insects, detached leaves, and flowers scattered over the block with no apparent object except to fill the space. This peculiarity, which is shown in the engraving of Ornithogalum, reproduced in text figure 51, appears also in the illustrations of a book on simples by Johannes Mesua, published in Venice in 1581. In certain other woodcuts in De Alichon's herbal, solid black is used in an effective fashion. This is the case, for instance, in text figure 101, which is also interesting since two of the leaves bear the initials M and H, which were possibly those of the artist. Among less important botanical wood engravings of the 16th century, we may mention those in the works of Pierre Bellon, such as De Arboribus, 1553. In this book, there are some graceful woodcuts of trees, one of which is reproduced in text figure 102. The initial letters used in the present volume are taken from another of Bellon's books. Some specimens of the quaint little illustrations to Castor Durante's Urbario Nuovo of 1585 are shown in text figures 45, 68, and 103. It is interesting to compare his drawing of the water lily with those of the Venetian edition of the Latin Herbarius of 1499, the Greta Erbal, Brunfels Herbarium Vive Icones of 1530, and De Labelle's Cruyetbock of 1581. The engravings in Porta's Phytonomonica, 1588, and in Prospero Alpino's Little Book on Egyptian Plants, 1592, are of good quality. Some curious examples of the former, which will be discussed at greater length in the next chapter, are shown in text figures 109 and 110, and the glasswort, one of the best woodcuts among the latter, is reproduced in text figure 47. Passing on to the 17th century, we find the Prodromos of Gaspard Bauhin, 1620, contains a number of original illustrations, but they are not very remarkable, and often have rather the appearance of having been drawn from pressed specimens. Two examples of these woodcuts will be found in text figures 49 and 62. The former is interesting as being an early representation of the potato. Parkinson's Paradisus Terrestris of 1629 contains a considerable proportion of original figures, besides others borrowed from previous writers. The engravings were made in England by Switzer. They are poor in quality, and the innovation of representing a number of species in one large woodcut is not very successful. Text figure 55 shows a twig of Barbary, which is but a single item in one of these large illustrations. Among still later wood engravings, we may mention the large, rather coarse cuts in Aldrovandi's Dendrologia of 1667, one of which, the figure of the orange, or Mala Arantia Chinisnia, is reproduced in text figure 104 on a greatly reduced scale. In the present chapter, no attempt has been made to discuss the illustrations of those herbals, for example, the works of Turner, Tabernemontanus, Girard, etc., in which most of the woodcuts are copied from previous books. In the majority of such cases, the source of the figures has already been indicated in Chapter 4. This brief review of the history of botanical woodcuts leads us to the conclusion that between 1530 and 1630, that is to say during the hundred years when the herbal was at its zenith, the number of sets of wood engravings which were preeminent, either on account of their intrinsic qualities or because they were repeatedly copied from book to book, was strictly limited. We might almost say that there were only five collections of woodcuts of plants of really first-rate importance, those namely of Brunfels, Fuchs, Mattioli, and Plantin, with those of Gessner, Camerarius, all of which were published in the sixty years between 1530 and 1590. The wood blocks of the two botanists last mentioned cannot be considered apart from one another. From the scientific point of view, they show a marked advance in the introduction of enlarged sketches of the flowers and fruit, in addition to the habit drawings. Plantain's set included those blocks which were engraved for the herbals of De Lobel, De La Cruz, and the later works of Dodens. At the close of the 16th century, wood cutting on the continent was distinctly on the wane, 
and had begun to be superseded by engraving on metal. The earliest botanical work, in which copper plate etchings were used as illustrations, is said to be Fabio Colonna's Phytobasanos of 1592. These etchings, two of which are shown in text figures 46 and 105, are on a small scale, but are extremely beautiful and accurate. The details of the flowers and fruit are often shown separately, the figures, in this respect, being comparable with those of Gessner and Camerarius, though, owing to their small size, they do not convey so much botanical information. In a later book of Colonna's, the Ekphrasis, analyses of the floral parts are given in even greater detail than in the Phytobasanos. Colonna expressly mentions that he used wild plants as models wherever possible because cultivation is apt to produce alterations in the form. The decorative border surrounding each of the figures reproduced was not printed from the copper. In the 17th century, a large number of botanical books illustrated by means of copper plates were produced. The majority of these were published late in the century and thus scarcely come within our purview. A few of the earlier ones may, however, be referred to at this point. In 1611, Paul Reynolme's Specimen Historiae Planetarum was published in Paris, but though this work was illustrated with good copper plates, the effect was somewhat spoilt by the transparency of the paper. Two years later appeared the Hortus Aestatensis by Basil Bessler, an apothecary of Nuremberg. It is a large work with enormous illustrations, mostly of mediocre quality. In the succeeding year, 1614, a book was published which has been described, probably with justice, as containing some of the best copper plate figures of plants ever produced. This was the Hortus Floridius of Crispian de Passe, a member of a famous family of engravers. Like Parkinson's Paradisus Terrestris, into which some of the figures are copied, it is more of the nature of a garden book than an herbal. In 1615, an English edition of Crispian de Passe's work was published at Utrecht under the title of A Garden of Flowers. The plates are the same as those in the original work. The artist is particularly successful with the bulbous and tuberous plants, the cultivation of which has long been such a specialty of Holland. Plate 19 is a characteristic example, but only part of the original picture is here reproduced. The soil on which the plants grow is often shown, and the horizon is placed very low so that they stand up against the sky. This convention seems to have been characteristic not only of the plant drawings of the Dutch artists, but also of their landscapes. In the paintings of Kuyup and Paul Potter, the skyline is sometimes so low that it is seen between the legs of the cows and horses. This treatment was no doubt suggested by life in a flat country, but was carried to such an extreme that the artist's eye level must have been almost on the ground. The purchaser of the Garden of Flowers receives detailed directions for the painting of the figures, which he is expected to carry out himself. The book is divided into four parts appropriate to the four seasons, and each part is preceded by an encouraging verse intended to keep alive the owner's enthusiasm for his task. The stanza at the beginning of the last section seems to show some anxiety on the part of the author, lest the reader should have begun to weary over the lengthy occupation of coloring the plates. It reads as follows. If hitherto, my friend, you have performed the task in hand, with joy proceed, this last will be the best when all is scanned. As we have already mentioned, it is not our intention to deal with the books published in the latter part of the 17th century. We may, however, for the sake of completeness, mention two or three examples in order to show the kind of work that was then being done. Paolo Bocconi's Icones et Descriptiones of 1647 was illustrated with copper plates, some of which were remarkably subtle and delicate, while others were rather carelessly executed. Among slightly later works, we may refer to a quaint little Dutch herbal by Stephen Blankart and to the Paradisus Batavus of Paul Hermann, both of which belong to the last decade of the century. The latter, which is an Elsevier with very good copper plates, was published after the author's death and dedicated by his widow to Henry Compton, Bishop of London. On the plates which illustrate Blankhart's herbal, a landscape and figures are often introduced to form a background, and the low horizon, to which we referred in speaking of the Hortus floridus, is a very conspicuous feature. The picture of the winter cherry is here reproduced as an example. As showing the complete revolution in the style of plant illustration in 200 years, 
It is interesting to compare this drawing with that of the same subject in the German Herbarius of 1485. It must be confessed that the 15th century woodcut, though far less detailed and painstaking, seizes the general character of the plant in a way that the 17th century copper plate somewhat misses. Etching and engraving on metal are well adapted to very delicate and detailed work, but from the point of view of book illustration, wood engraving is generally more effective. In the latter, the lines are raised and the method of printing is thus exactly the same as in the case of type, while in the former, the process is reversed and the lines are incised. As a result, there is a harmony about a book illustrated with woodcuts which cannot, in the nature of things, be attained when such different processes as printing from raised type and from incised metal are brought together in the same volume. End of chapter 7、Section、fourteen of Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, A Chapter in the History of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution A Chapter in the History of Botany by Agnes Arbor. 8. The Doctrine of Signatures and Astrological Botany. During the preceding chapters, we have restricted our discussion to those writings which may be credited with having taken some part, however slight, in advancing the knowledge of plants. We have, as it were, confined our attention to the main stream of botanical progress and its tributaries. But before concluding, it may be well to call to mind the existence of more than one backwater, connected indeed with the main channel, but leading nowhere. The subject of the superstitions with which herb collecting has been hedged about at different periods is far too wide to be dealt with in detail in the present book. We have referred in earlier chapters to the observances with which the Greek herb gatherers surrounded their calling, page 7, and to the mysterious dangers which are described in the herbarium of Apuleius as attending to the uprooting of the mandrake, page 36. There is comparatively little reference to such matters in the works of the German fathers of botany or those of the greatest of their successors. Indeed, as we have previously mentioned, pages 55 to 58, 103 and 104, Bach's famous Kruderbuch and William Turner's Herbal contain definite refutations of various superstitions. Contemporaneously, however, with the fine series of herbals of the 16th and 17th centuries, there appeared a succession of books about plants, which had as their subjects one or both of two topics, the doctrine of signatures and astrological botany. These works cannot be said to have furthered the science to any appreciable text, but they have considerable interests, rather on account of the curious light which they throw upon the attitude of mind of their writers, and presumably their readers also, than from any intrinsic merit. One of these authors, in his preface, speaks of the notions and observations contained in his work, most of which I am confident are true, and if there be any that are not so, yet they are pleasant. The excuse that the notions cherished by the botanical mystics of the 16th and 17th centuries were pleasant, even if untrue, may perhaps be offered in extenuation of the very brief discussion of their salient points, which we propose to undertake in the present chapter. The most famous of those mystical writers who turned their attention to botany was undoubtedly Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus of Hohenheim, better known by the name of Paracelsus. 1493 to 1541. His portrait is shown in text figure 108. He was a doctor as his father had been before him, and in 1527 he became professor at Basel. Here he gave great offense by lecturing in the vulgar tongue, burning the writings of Aficina and Galen, and interpreting his own works instead of those of the ancients. His disregard of cherished traditions and his personal peculiarities led to difficulties with his colleagues and he only held his post for a very short time. For the rest of his life, he was a wanderer on the face of the earth, and he died in comparative poverty at Salzburg in 1541. The character and writings of Paracelsus are full of the strangest contradictions. Browning's poem perhaps gives a better idea of his career than any prose account aiming at historical accuracy. His life was so strange that the imagination of a poet is needed to revitalize it for us today. His almost incredible boastfulness is the main characteristic that everyone remembers, the word bombast being, in all probability, coined from his name. 
In one of his works, after contemptuously dismissing all the great physicians who had preceded him, Galen, Avicenna, and others, he remarks, I shall be the monarch, and mine shall the monarchy be. The conclusion that he was something of a quack can hardly be avoided, but at the same time it must be confessed that his writings were occasionally illumined with real scientific insight, and that he infused new life into chemistry and medicine. Paracelsus's actual knowledge of botany appears to have been meager, for not more than a couple of dozen plant names are found in his works. To understand his views on the property of plants, it is necessary to turn for a moment to his chemical theories. He regarded sulfur, salt, and mercury as the three fundamental principles of all bodies. The sense in which he uses these terms is symbolic and thus differs entirely from that in which they are employed today. Sulfur appears to embody the ideas of change, combustibility, volatilization, and growth. Salt to those of stability and non-inflammability. Mercury to that of fluidity. The virtues of plants depend, according to Paracelsus, upon the proportions in which they contain these three principles. The medicinal properties of plants are thus the outcome of qualities that are not obvious at sight. How, then, is the physician to be guided in selecting herbal remedies to cure the several ailments of his patients? The answer to this question, given by Paracelsus, is summed up in what is known as the doctrine of signatures. According to this doctrine, many medicinal herbs are stamped, as it were, with some clear indication of their uses. This may perhaps be best understood by means of a quotation from Paracelsus himself, in the words of a 17th century English translation, quote, I have oft times declared how by the outward shapes and qualities of things we may know their inward virtues, which God hath put in them for the good of man. So in St. John's Wards, we may take notice of the form of the leaves and flowers, the porosity of the leaves and veins. 1. The porosity or holes in the leaves signify to us that this herb helps both inward and outward holes or cuts in the skin. 2. The flowers of St. John's wort, when they are putrefied, they are like blood, which teacheth us that this herb is good for wounds to close them and fill them up, end quote, etc. It is sometimes held that the real originator of the theory of signatures in any approximation to a scientific form was Giambattista Porta, who was probably born at Naples shortly before the death of Paracelsus. He wrote a book about human physiognomy in which he endeavored to find, in the bodily form of man, indications as to his character and spiritual qualities. This study suggested to him the idea that the inner qualities— and the healing powers of the herbs might also be revealed by external signs, and thus led to his famous work, the Phytonomicanonica, which was first published at Naples in 1588. Porta developed his theory in detail and pushed it to great lengths. He supposed, for example, that long-lived plants would lengthen a man's life, while short-lived plants would abbreviate it. He held that herbs with a yellow sap would cure jaundice, while those whose surface was rough to the touch would heal those diseases that destroy the natural smoothness of the skin. The resemblance of certain plants to certain animals opened to Porta a vast field of dogmatism on a basis of conjecture. Plants with flowers shaped like butterflies would, he supposed, cure the bites of insects, while those whose roots or fruits had a jointed appearance and thus remotely suggested a scorpion must necessarily be sovereign remedies for the sting of that creature. Porta also detected many obscure points of resemblance between the flowers and fruits of certain plants and the limbs and organs of certain animals. In such cases of resemblance, he held that an investigation of the temperament of the animal in question would determine what kind of disease the plant was intended to cure. It will be recognized from these examples that the doctrine of signatures was remarkably elastic and was not fettered by any rigid consistency. The illustrations of the phytonomonica are of great interest as interpreting Porta's point of view. The part of a man's body which is healed by a particular herb, or the animal whose bites or stings can be cured by it, are represented in the same woodcut as the herb. For example, the back view of a human head with a thick crop of hair is introduced into the block with the maidenhair fern, which is an ancient specific for baldness. A pomegranate with its seed exposed and a plant of toothwort with its hard white scale leaves are represented in the same figure as a set of human teeth. A drawing of a scorpion accompanies some pictures of plants with articulated seed vessels. And an adder's head is introduced below the drawing of the plant known as the adder's tongue. It would serve little purpose to deal in detail with the various exponents of the doctrine of signatures, such, for example, as Johann Popp, 
who in 1625 published a herbal written from this standpoint and containing also some astrological botany. We will only now refer to one of the later champions of the signature of plants, an English herbalist of the 17th century, who made the subject peculiarly his own. This was William Cole, a fellow of New College, Oxford, who lived and botanized at Putney in Surrey. He seems to have been a person of much character, and his vigorous arguments would often be very telling, were it possible to admit the soundness of his premises. William Cole carried the doctrine of signatures to as extreme a point as can well be imagined. His account of the walnut, from his work Adam in Eden, 1657, may be quoted as an illustration. Quote, Walnuts have the perfect signature of the head. The outer husk or green covering represent the pericranium or outward skin of the skull, whereon the hair growth and therefore salt made of those husks or barks are exceeding good for wounds in the head. The inner woody shell hath the signature of the skull that covereth the kernel of the hard meninge and pia mater, which are the thin scarfs that envelop the brain. The kernel hath the very figure of the brain, and therefore it is very profitable for the brain, and resists poisons. For if the kernel be bruised and moistened with the quintessence of wine, and laid upon the crown of the head, it comforts the brain and head mightily. End quote. In Cole's writings, we meet with the instances of a curious confusion of thought, which characterized the doctrine of signatures. The signature, in some cases, represents an animal injurious to man and is taken to denote that the plant in question will cure its bites or stings. For instance, that plant that is called adder's tongue because the stalk of it represents one is a sovereign wound herb to cure the biting of an adder. In other cases, the signature represents one of the organs of the human body and indicates that the plant will cure diseases of that organ. For example, heart trefoil is so called not only because the leaf is triangular like the heart of a man, but also because each leaf contains the perfect icon of a heart, and that in its proper color, viz. a flesh color. It defendeth the heart against the noisome vapor of the spleen. Cole seems to have possessed a philosophic mind and to have endeavored to follow his theories to their logical conclusion. He was much exercised because a large proportion of the plants with undoubted medicinal virtues have no obvious signatures. He concluded that a certain number were endowed with signatures in order to set man on the right track in his search for herbal remedies. The remainder were purposefully left blank in order to encourage his skill and resource in discovering their properties for himself. A further ingenious argument is that a number of plants are left without signatures because if all were signed, the rarity of it, which is the delight, would be taken away by too much harping upon one string. Our author was evidently a keen and enthusiastic collector of herbs. In his book, The Art of Simpling, 1656, he complains bitterly that physicians leave the gathering of herbs to the apothecaries, and the latter rely commonly upon the words of the silly herb women, who many times bring them quid for quo, than which nothing can be more sad. Another strong supporter in this country of the doctrine of signatures was the astrological botanist Robert Turner. He definitely states that God hath imprinted upon the plants, herbs, and flowers, as it were in hieroglyphics, the very signature of their virtues. It is interesting to find that the doctrine of signatures was repudiated by the best of the 16th century herbalists. Dodens, for instance, wrote in 1583 that, The doctrine of the signatures of plants has received the authority of no ancient writer who is held in any esteem. Moreover, it is so changeable and uncertain that, as far as science or learning is concerned, it seems absolutely unworthy of acceptance. A later writer, Guy de la Brosse, criticized the theory very acutely, pointing out that it was quite easy to imagine any resemblance between a plant and animal that happened to be convenient. C'est comme des nuées, he writes, qui l'ont fait ressembler à tout ce que la fantasie s'est représenté à un grou. I un grunui, I un homme, I un armé, et auch semblables visions. Both Paracelsus and Porta deprecate the use of foreign drugs on the ground that in the country where a disease arises, their nature produces means to overcome it. This idea is one which constantly recurs in the herbals. In 1664, Robert Turner wrote, for what climate soever is subject to any particular disease, in the same place there grows a cure. 
There is ample evidence of the survival of this theory even in the 19th century. For instance, in the preface to Thomas Green's Universal Herbal of 1816, we find the remark, Nature has in this country, as well as in all others, provided in the herbs of its own growth the remedies for the several diseases to which it is most subject. The notion persists indeed to the present day. There is a widespread belief among children, for example, that docks always grow in the neighborhood of stinging nettles in order to provide a cure in situ. Whether this view contains any grain of truth or not, it certainly deserves our gratitude, since it led to Dr. McLaughlin's discovery of salicin as a cure for rheumatic fever. On the ground that in the case of malarial diseases, the poisons which cause them and the remedy which cures them are naturally produced under similar climactic conditions, McLaughlin sought and found in the bark of the willow, which inhabits low-lying damp situations, this drug, which has proved so valuable in the treatment of rheumatism. The doctrine of signatures is not the only piece of botanical mysticism associated with the name of Paracelsius. He is also a firm believer in the influence of the heavenly bodies upon the vegetable world, or in other words, in botanical astrology. He considered that each plant was under the influence of some particular star, and that it was this influence which drew the plant out of the earth when the seed germinated. He held each plant to be a terrestrial star, and each star a spiritualized plant. Giambattista Porta also believed in a relation between certain plants and corresponding stars or planets. A figure in his Phytonomonica, here reproduced, shows a number of lunar plants. In order to appreciate the attitude in which Paracelsus and his followers approached the subject of the relation between plants and stars, it is necessary to realize the position which astrology had come to occupy in the Middle Ages. It was in ancient Babylon that this pseudoscience mainly took its rise. Here, the five planets, which we now call Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Mars, and Mercury, and also the Sun and Moon, were identified in certain senses with seven great gods. The movements of these heavenly bodies were supposed to represent, in symbolic fashion, the deeds of these gods. It was thought possible to interpret the movements and relative positions of the planets and the sun and moon in a way that threw light upon the fate of mankind insofar as it depended upon the gods in question. Some centuries before the Christian era, Babylonian astrology began to influence the nations farther to the west. In Greece, the subject took a more personal turn, and it was believed that the fate, not only of nations but of individuals, was determined in the skies and could be foretold from the position of the planets at the time of a man's birth. At a later period, speculation on the subject was carried further and further, until finally not only men, but all animals, vegetables, and minerals were associated, either with particular planets or with the constellations of the zodiac. That a belief in the influence of the moon upon plants dates back to very early times in Western Europe, as shown by the statement in Pliny's Natural History, that the Druids in Britain gathered the mistletoe for medical purposes, with many rites and ceremonies, when the moon was six days old. To trace the history of astrology in detail is altogether beyond our province, but as an example of its universal acceptance, we may recall the reference to the supreme influence of the stars in the preface of the Arbarius zu Teutsch of 1485. See page 19. Astrological ideas were familiar in Elizabethan England and are reflected in many passages in Shakespeare's plays, never perhaps more charmingly than in Beatrice's laughing words, there was a star danced, and under that I was born. Paracelsus, though his name is so well known in this connection, was by no means the first writer on botanical astrology. A book called De Virtutibus Herbarum, erroneously attributed to Albertus Magnus, had a wide circulation from early times, being first printed in the 15th century. It was translated into many languages, one English version appearing about 1560 under the title The Book of Secrets of Albertus Magnus, of the Virtues of Herbs, Stones, and Certain Beasts. It does not contain very much information about plants, being mostly occupied with animals and minerals, but there are very definite references to astrology. For instance, we are told that if the marigold be gathered, the sun begin in the sign Leo in August, and be wrapped in the leaf of a laurel or bay tree, and a wolf's tooth be added thereto, no man shall be able to have a word to speak against the bearer thereof, but words of peace. Concerning the plantain, we read, 
The root of this herb is marvelous good against the pain of the head because the sign of the ram is supposed to be the house of the planet Mars, which is the head of the whole world. The herbal of Bartholomaeus Charicter, 1575, in which the plants are arranged according to the signs of the zodiac, is considerably more complete and elaborate than the book to which we have just referred. It seems, however, impossible to discover the principle, if any, which guided the author in connecting any given herb with one sign of the zodiac rather than another. Much stress is laid in this herbal on the hour at which the herbs ought to be gathered, great importance being ascribed to the state of the moon at the time. We are reminded of a passage in The Merchant of Venice, where Jessica says of a bright moonlit evening, In such a night Medea gathered the enchanted herbs that did renew old Aeson. This aspect of the subject is emphasized in a curious little book published in 1571, Nicholas Winkler's Chronica Herbarum, which is an astrological calendar giving information as to the appropriate times for gathering different roots and herbs. Almost contemporaneously with Charakter's Critterbuch, the first part of a work on astrological botany was published by Lionheart Ternesier Zum Thurn. This writer, who was possessed of undoubted talent, was also an adventurer and charlatan of the First Order. He was born at Basel in 1530. He learned his father's craft, that of a goldsmith, and is said to have also helped a local doctor to collect and prepare herbs, and to have been employed to read aloud to him from the works of Paracelsus. His career in Basel came to an untimely end, for he seems to have tried to retaliate on some customers who treated him very badly by selling them gilded lead as a substitute for gold, and consequently had to flee the country when the fraud was discovered. He traveled widely, making an especial study of mining. He had an adventurous and varied life, sometimes in poverty and obscurity, sometimes in wealth and renown. During Thernessier's most influential period, he lived in Berlin, practicing medicine, making amulets, talismans, and secret remedies which yielded large profits. He also published astrological calendars, cast nativities, and supplemented his income by the practice of usury. At this time, he owned a printing press and employed a large staff which included artists and engravers. Later on, he was pursued by a succession of misfortunes, including accusations of magic and witchcraft, which compelled him to leave Germany. Little is known of the latter part of his life. He died in the last decade of the 16th century. Leon Hard Thernessier projected a great botanical work in ten books. The first was published in Berlin in 1578, but the others never appeared. The title was Historia und Beschreibung in Fluencier, Elementensier and Naturlicher Wirkungen aller Fremden und Heimschein Erdeschwischassen. A Latin version of this book under the name Historia Sive Descriptio Plantarum was published in the same year. This first installment deals only with umbellifers, which were regarded as under the dominion of the sun and Mars. The nomenclature and the figures are not clear enough to allow individual species to be recognized. Each is drawn in an ellipse surrounded by an ornamental border, which contains mystical inscriptions denoting the properties of the plant. In some cases, diagrams are given showing the conjunction of the stars under which the herb should be gathered. After the manner of the ancients, Thernessier describes plants according to their qualities as either male or female. He also adds a third class, typified by a child, to symbolize those whose qualities are feeble. It may perhaps be worthwhile to translate here a few sentences of the first chapter of the Historia to show how far such writers as Leonhardt Thernessier had departed from the pursuit of the subject upon legitimate lines. When discussing the planting of roots and herbs and the gathering of seeds, he declares that, it is absolutely essential that these operations should be performed so as to correspond with the stations and positions of the planets and heavenly bodies to whose control diseases are properly subject. And against disease, we have to employ herbs with the due regard, of course, to the sex, whichever it be, of human beings. And so herbs intended to benefit the male sex should be procured when the sun or moon is in some male sign of the zodiac, for example, Sagittarius or Aquarius, or if this is impossible, at least when they are in Leo. Similarly, herbs intended to benefit women should be gathered under some female sign, Virgo, of course, or if that is impossible, in Taurus or Cancer. 
In the 17th century, England became strongly infected with astrological botany. The most notorious exponent of the subject was Nicholas Culpepper, 1616-1654, who, about 1640, set up as an astrologer and a physician in Spitalfields. His portrait is reproduced in Plate 21. He created great indignation among the medical profession by publishing, under the name of a physical directory, an unauthorized English translation of the Pharmacopoeia, which had been issued by the College of Physicians. That Culpepper was unpopular with orthodox medical practitioners is hardly surprising when we consider the way in which he speaks of them in this book as a company of proud, insulting, domineering doctors whose wits were born above 500 years before themselves. He goes on to ask, Is it handsome and well-beseeming a commonwealth to say a doctor ride in state, in plush with a foot cloth and not a grain of wit, but what was in print before he was born? Many editions of the physical directory were issued under different names. As the English physician enlarged, it enjoyed great popularity and was reprinted as late as the 19th century. The edition of 1653 is described on the title page as being an astrologio physical discourse of the vulgar herbs of this nation, containing a complete method of physic whereby a man may preserve his body in health or cure himself being sick for three pence charge with such things only as grow in England, they being most fit for English bodies. Culpepper describes certain herbs as being under the dominion of the sun, the moon, or a planet, and others as under a planet and also one of the constellations of the zodiac. His reasons for connecting a particular herb with a particular heavenly body are curiously inconsequent. He states, for example, that wormwood is an herb of Mars, I prove it thus, what delights in martial places is a martial herb, but wormwood delights in martial places, for about forges and ironworks you may gather a cartload of it. Ergo, it is a martial herb. The author explains that each disease is caused by a planet. One way of curing the ailment is by the use of herbs belonging to an opposing planet. Example, diseases produced by Jupiter are healed by the herbs of Mercury. On the other hand, the illness may be cured by sympathy. That is, by the use of herbs belonging to the planet which is responsible for the disease. Culpepper indulges in a strange maze of similar reasons to justify the use of wormwood for affections of the eyes. The eyes are under the luminaries, the right eye of a man and the left eye of a woman the sun claims dominion over. The left eye of a man and the right eye of a woman are the privilege of the moon. Wormwood, an herb of Mars, cures both. What belongs to the sun by sympathy, because he is an exalted in his house, but what belongs to the moon by antipathy, because he hath his fall in hers. It is somewhat surprising to find that in his preface, Culpepper claims that he surpasses all his predecessors in being alone guided by reason, whereas all previous writers are as full of nonsense and contradictions as an egg is full of meat. Culpepper met with considerable opposition and criticism from his contemporaries. Shortly after his death, William Cole, in his Art of Simpling, wrote scornfully of astrological botanists, amongst which Master Culpepper, a man now dead, and therefore I shall speak of him as modestly as I can, for were he alive I should be more plain with him, was a great stickler. And he, forsooth, judges all men unfit to be physicians, who are not artists in astrology, as if he and some other figure-flingers, his companions, had been the only physicians in England, whereas, for aught I can gather, either by his books or learn from the report of others, he was a man very ignorant in the form of simples. It is interesting to notice that Cole, though he seems to the modern reader very credulous on the subject of the signatures of plants, was completely skeptical as to the association of astrology and botany. The main argument by which he tries to discredit it is an ingenious one. The knowledge of herbs is, he says, a subject as ancient as the creation, as the scriptures witness, yea, more ancient than the sun or moon or stars, they being created on the fourth day, whereas plants were the third. Thus did God even at first confute the folly of those astrologers who go about to maintain that all vegetables in their growth are enslaved to a necessary and unavoidable dependence on the influence of the stars, whereas plants were, even when planets were not. End of chapter 8「Section 15 of Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, a Chapter in the History of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, a Chapter in the History of Botany, by Agnes Arbor. Chapter 9. Conclusions. A general review of the subjects discussed in the foregoing chapters brings home to us several results of some interest. Perhaps the most obvious of these is the incalculable debt which botany owes to medicine. An overwhelming majority of the herbalists were physicians who were led to the study of botany on account of his connection with the arts of healing. As we have already pointed out, medicine gave the original impulse not only to systematic botany, but also to the study of the anatomy of plants. However, as the evolution of the herbal proceeded, we have shown that botany rose from being a mere handmaid of medicine to a position of comparative independence. This is well exemplified in the history of plant classification. When the early medical botanists attempted any arrangement of their material, it was on a purely utilitarian basis. The herbs were merely classified according to the qualities which made them of value to man. But as the science grew, the need of a more systematic classification began to make itself felt, and in some of the works published in the latter half of the period we are considering, there is a distinct, if only partially successful, attempt to group the plants according to the affinities which they present when considered in themselves, and not in relation to man. The idea of a natural system in the vegetable kingdom in which each plant should find its inevitable place must have been clear, for instance, to De La Belle, when he wrote in the Adversaria of an order than which nothing more beautiful exists in the heavens or in the mind of a wise man. Second only to the debt of botany to medicine is its debt to certain branches of the fine arts, more especially wood engraving. The draftsman and engraver not only disseminated the knowledge of plants, but their work must often have revealed to the botanist features which had escaped his less highly educated and subtle eye. As we have already pointed out, the art of plant description lagged conspicuously behind that of plant illustration. The vague and crude but often picturesque accounts given by the early herbalists of the plants which they observed contrast curiously with the technically accurate but colorless and impersonal descriptions from the pens of modern botanists. The rapid rise of botany in the two centuries which we have reviewed must have been greatly stimulated by the cosmopolitanism of the savants of the Renaissance. Periods of study at a succession of different universities and wide European travel, including visits to scientific men of various countries, seem to have formed part of the recognized equipment of the botanical student. Possibly the zeal for travel was not altogether spontaneous, but was artificially stimulated by the religious disturbances so common at the period of the Reformation and later, which often drove into exile the adherents of the Reformed faith, among whom many botanists were numbered. This is exemplified in the cases of William Turner, Charles de la Clouse, and the Bauhines. It is interesting to notice that in the work of the best herbalists of the 16th and 17th centuries, such, for instance, as Bach, Turner, Dodens, and Gaspard Bauhin, we find, comparatively speaking, little belief in any kind of superstition connected with plants, such as the doctrine of signatures or astrology. A number of books dealing with such topics appeared during the period we have considered, but their writers form a class apart and must not be confused with the herbalists proper, whose attitude was, on the whole, marked by a healthy skepticism which was in advance of their time. It would naturally be far from true to say that they were all quite free from superstition, but considering the intellectual atmosphere of the period, their enlightenment was quite remarkable. When we come to consider the origin of the herbal, we find that it is impossible to assign any date for its beginning. In manuscript form, herbals have existed from very early times, but in the present book, those prior to the invention of printing have been scarcely touched upon. Our subject has been limited to the most active life period of the printed herbal, which may be reckoned as beginning in the last quarter of the 15th century, with the Book of Nature, the Herbarium of Apelius, and the Latin and German Herbarius. When this active period ended is less easily decided, but in some senses it may fairly be taken as covering only the comparatively short space of 200 years. There are, of course, a very large number of later herbals belonging to the end of the 17th, the 18th, and even the 19th and 20th centuries, but their importance in the history of botany appears to the present writer to be relatively small, and hence in this volume attention has been almost entirely confined to works which appeared before 1670. After this period, botany rapidly became more scientific. The discovery of the function of the stamens, which was first announced in 1682, 
making a very definite step in advance. As time went on, the herbal, with its characteristic mixture of medical and botanical lore, gave way before the exclusively medical pharmacopoeia on the one hand and the exclusively botanical flora on the other. As the use of homemade remedies declined and the chemist's shop took the place of the housewife's herb garden and still room, the practical value of the herbal diminished almost to vanishing point. The best epoch in the history of the herbal, from the point of view of book illustration, is confined within much narrower limits than the two centuries we have been considering. The suggestion has been made and seems thoroughly justified that the finest period should be reckoned as falling between 1530 and 1614, that is, between the woodcuts of Hans Weiditz in Brunfels' Herbarium Vive Icones and the copper plates of Crispian de Passe in the Hortus Floridus. This good period thus lasted less than 100 years and belongs chiefly to the 16th century. From the artistic point of view, its zenith is perhaps reached in the wood engravings which illustrate Fuchs' great work, De Historia Stirpium, 1542. Though, from a more strictly scientific standpoint, the drawings by Camerarius and Gessner, which appeared in 1586 and 1588, may be said to bear the palm. As far as the text is concerned, the culmination of the botanical works of the period under consideration may be regarded as foreshadowed in the Sturpium Adversaria Nova of Pena and de Lobel, 1570-71, and attained in the Padromus, 1620, and the Pinax, 1623, of Gaspard Balhin. In the works of the latter author, classification, nomenclature, and description reach their high watermark, though it is to Lobel and his precursor Bach, one of the German fathers of botany, that we owe the first definite efforts after a natural system. It is pleasant to remember that Jean Bauhin, to whom his younger brother Gaspard probably owed his first botanical inspiration, was a pupil of Leonard Fuchs at Tübingen, so that the latter has a double claim to be associated with the results of the herbal period at its best. We began this book with a portrait of Leonard Fuchs, and we may well conclude with his name, that of the greatest and most typical of 16th century herbalists. End of chapter 9 End of Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution, a chapter in the history of botany, by Agnes Arbor.